evening and recovered uh, from your jet lag and uh, digestive experiences and <laughs> auditory experiences of last night. I mean, those uh, tunes were echoing in my mind uh, as I was trying to sleep uh, yesterday. But once again, thank you all for being here. And most of all, I, I want to express my deepest gratitude to the speakers who came from so many different places, distant places. Uh, I know that it's very difficult. And uh, after COVID, nobody wants to travel. <laughs> but it is deeply appreciated. Your presence here is uh, a priceless uh, gift for us. So with that, I'm going to actually turn into our rising stars. So today I have no more duty, <laughs> just to enjoy the science. And we'll start with a terrific session, and we have a, a whole day of a truly uh, feast uh, of science, of uh, unmatched quality. So uh, with that, I want to uh, turn the podium to Elvan. Good morning, everyone. And today, uh, in the first session, we are going to have two speakers. And our first speaker is Daniel Drucker. He's from University of Toronto, and he also is a fellow of Royal, uh, Royal Society. And his research has been focused on glucagon and glucagon metabolism, and also led to the development of uh, very popular, very commonly used drugs in diabetes these days. So I would like to give the stage to Daniel. Okay, good morning. Let's see, I might benefit from uh, remote control or something to uh, advance the slides, or I can do that mind trick thing where I just... Uh... So uh, let me echo um, the first of many thanks to the Sabri Ulker Center and the organizing committee in Goken for what is really, a, I think, a special uh, meeting um, not only post-COVID when many of us haven't had the chance to, but the, the thought and care and attention um, that goes into a meeting like this is, uh, is, is noted and appreciated. So thank you, Gokan, to you uh, for allowing us to participate. So I do work with a number of companies that are shown here. It used to be a much larger number of companies in the early days, but as they get to know my personality and my lack of uh, ability to restrain my opinion on what they're doing, the list you know, becomes uh, smaller every, uh, every year. So I won't go over you know, where GLP-1 is made in the gut and what it does to insulin secretion. I think now after more than 35 years, there's a reasonable appreciation and we have multiple medications based on GLP-1 action that are approved in many countries. And, um, for the most part, this is what they look like across the world. The interest in GLP-1, though, is now expanded well beyond the stimulation of insulin inhibition of glucagon story, because as you can see here in the summary, there are many actions of GLP-1 that simply have nothing to do with the control of glucose and metabolism, but might have some clinical relevance depending on the individual that's being treated. And what I'll go through with you today is how we understand or actually don't understand the exact mechanisms of action, which is fun in science to try and pursue. So the first GLP-1 receptor agonist, this is uh, interactive, so I'll ask Gokan what was the date of the approval of the first GLP-1. That's right, April 28, 2005. And so that was exactly just before the FDA got very nervous about the safety of rosiglitazone and pioglitazone and said, we now have to do cardiovascular outcome trials for all of these new drugs, and if they are not safe, they are not going to be approved. And so we all began to say, well, what is going to happen to GLP-1? And, and these are the directions in the biomarkers of risk for cardiovascular disease, which all seem to be favorable except for an increase in heart rate. And almost uniformly in cardiovascular outcome trials, an increase in heart rate is associated with higher mortality and an adverse outcome. So as a, as a nervous, anxious person, 
the increase in heart rate did not help me as we waited for the outcome trial results. But I'm now showing you the results of eight cardiovascular outcome trials. There are two of them done with uh, shorter acting drugs, which either show a modest benefit or no benefit, but the six long acting drugs that activate the receptor 24 hours a day all show a significant reduction in heart attacks and strokes and cardiovascular death. And this is important because you'll often see in the, in the media today when they're talking about some of the, the newer drugs, they'll say, these are new drugs and we have no idea what they do. But if you remember that even though these trials were in people with type 2 diabetes, the average uh, BMI of the people in these outcome trials is 32. So yes, they don't have obesity alone, but they're living with both type 2 diabetes and obesity. We also have SGLT2 inhibitors, which I won't discuss today, but which are also fantastic medications. And one important point of differentiation between those medicines and the GLP-1 receptor agonists is that the SGLT2 inhibitors are spectacular for reducing heart failure events, whereas the GLP-1 drugs preferentially reduce the rates of stroke. So many people will benefit from having both of these agents, depending on their risk factor profile. But if you're having a discussion and you want to personalize the choices, these are some of the points of differentiation. So some people say, well, it's obvious why these medicines are cardioprotective, because they reduce glucose and they reduce body weight. Yet we've had many drugs that are more effective in reducing glucose and obesity drugs that lose body weight, and they were not associated with a reduction in cardiovascular events. In fact, this drug, albiglutide, was originally developed by Human Genome Sciences, marketed by GSK, and was pulled from the market because it was not commercially sex successful, because the A1C reduction and the body weight reduction were not competitive with the other GLP-1 drugs. Yet the cardiovascular outcome trial was continued, and there was more than a 20% reduction in rates of myocardial infarction. So can you imagine in 2005, as Steve Nissen is warning everyone about the safety of glucose-lowering medicines, if you had said, well, there's never been a drug that's shown to reduce heart attack, strokes, and death for type 2 diabetes, but there will be one in a few years, but we're going to pull it from the market because it's just not going to be amazing enough. People would have said, you're not talking rationally. So it can't simply be reduction of glucose and body weight because the reduction in A1C with albiglutide is like 0.6%. The reduction in body weight in this trial is about a kilogram. And so you have these mechanisms independent of these metabolic parameters. So maybe it's modification of risk factors. And you all have had some breakfast right now. You all have an increase in triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, chylomicrons, apoB48 containing atherogenic particles. Except those of you who took semaglutide this morning, you'll have a profound suppression of chylomicron secretion. And this is an essential action of GLP-1. If you block GLP-1 receptor signaling, either with an antagonist or genetically, as you can see here, you have an increase in chylomicron secretion. But how does this occur? Because if you look at the enterocyte, which is the cell that takes up the lipid substrate from the gut and packages these lipids into chylomicrons, there are no GLP-1 receptors. And this is a very common theme for understanding GLP-1 action, that there must be indirect mechanisms that allow the GLP-1 receptor positive cells to relay signals to sites that don't always express GLP-1 receptors. Now, some people say, very legitimately, um, Drucker, the reason you can't figure out how GLP-1 works is that you're just not smart enough. That's usually my mother, my son, and other people in my family, and there's probably an element of truth to that. The other possibility, there are many possibilities, is that there is more than one GLP-1 receptor, and you hear this all the time. Maybe there are other receptors beyond the canonical GPCR that's been isolated, which is also a possibility, except I'm showing you a prototype experiment here 
In this case, hypertension induced in mice with angiotensin infusion, wild-type mice on the left. You give a, a drug like liraglutide, you lower the blood pressure. If you knock out the one GLP-1 receptor, you no longer, on the right, lower blood pressure. And we see the same type of uh, phenomenon with every classic action for GLP-1. So whether it's an increase in heart rate, a reduction in glucose, an increase in insulin, a decrease in glucagon, a reduction in gastric emptying, all of the typical actions for GLP-1 are eliminated in the GLP-1 receptor knockout mice. So if there is a second receptor, and you know there are always proteins on membranes that can transduce signals, it's, it's certainly not important for the, the major actions of GLP-1. So, GLP-1, as I showed you, reduces the rates of myocardial infarction, and in animals, it reduces infarct size and activates a cardioprotective gene expression program, and when we do the same experiments in the knockout mice, there's no communication to the heart. So how does this work? Most of the GLP-1 receptors in the mouse heart are in endothelial cells, predominantly in endocardial endothelial cells, we can knock out those receptors with Ti2 Cre. When we then induce a heart attack in mice that's missing those cardiac GLP-1 receptors, the mice no longer responds to semaglutide with a reduction in infarct size. So you say, fantastic, we know how this works, until you ask, well, is the mouse useful for predicting what happens in humans? And the answer is, and this is sort of a trigger warning for a lot of us who are doing mouse experiments, I'm sorry to tell you this, that sometimes human biology is different than the mouse. So in the human heart, there are no receptors on endothelial endocardial cells. The receptors are in cardiomyocytes. And so translating the mouse data to the human data for cardioprotection is not as simple as we would like it to be. The other interesting thing about the human heart GLP-1 receptor is shown here. So these are biopsies taken from all four chambers of the heart, from the human heart, and the levels of GLP-1 receptor expression are shown. And you can see the dispersion. There's, there's sometimes a 10 to 50-fold difference. It's a logarithmic scale between one person's left ventricular GLP-1 receptor expression and the other. So is this biology? Does that mean some people have a higher level of GLP-1 receptor expression in their left ventricle? Are they super responders and will get better cardioprotection? Or is this just sampling error? Because the heart is a big, bulky organ and you can't possibly do precisely the biopsy in the same place. And we don't know the answer to this question, but it's kind of interesting to think about it. So it takes about 12 to 18 months in the cardiovascular outcome trials to see a reduction in heart attacks, strokes, and death. And because of that time period, many people have said, well, this must be consistent with a chronic process like atherosclerosis. And in fact, in mouse studies, if one does the experiments in APOE knockouts or LDL receptor knockouts or mice treated with a PCSK9, uh, adenovirus, and treat with GLP-1, you do see a reduction in atherosclerosis. So how does that happen? Well, we can say, where are the GLP-1 receptors in the aorta? And that's not difficult to, to answer. In, in mice, we can take out the normal aorta or the atherosclerotic aorta, do cell sorting, and we localize the GLP-1 receptors to endothelial cells in the aorta. There are a few smooth muscle GLP-1Rs, but mainly endothelial. So again, we can knock these out with Ti2 Cre, induce atherosclerosis, treat the mice with semaglutide, and even though we have completely removed 99% of all the GLP-1 receptors from the aorta, we still see a reduction in atherosclerosis, telling us again that this is unlikely to be a direct effect of GLP-1 on those aortic cell types. So what about the kidney? It's a very important organ. It is uh, 
known to be affected in people with long-standing diabetes. It's the number one cause now of dialysis and renal transplantation in most countries. And again, if you would look what activating GLP-1 does, it's favorable, changes in the parameters in the right direction, less kidney injury, less fibrosis, less inflammation. And if you knock out the GLP-1 receptor, things get worse. So that makes sense. We don't quite have the same robust data set in humans, but we're getting there. And if we say, well, how does that work? Where are the GLP-1 receptors in the kidney? They're not in the glomerular epithelial cells. They're not in the tubular epithelium. They're in some vascular smooth muscle cells in some afferent arterioles. And we've knocked this smooth muscle receptor out, and it is important for some, but not all, of the actions of GLP-1 in the kidney. Again, suggesting that they're going to be both direct and indirect inter-organ communication that impinge on how GLP-1 talks to the kidney. And this clinical trial is underway and may report out in 2024, which is a longer, uh, larger trial looking at people who are at high risk for developing diabetic kidney disease. They are starting in the trial with a reduced EGFR, with increased albumin excretion. Many of them will go on to chronic renal failure and diabetic kidney disease. And they're randomized to treatment with or without semaglutide. And although SGLT2 inhibitors today are the drug of choice for rapidly attenuating the risk of uh, renal failure in people with or without diabetes, let's see what happens with the, the flow trial. So one of the themes that we've begun to appreciate now in trying to say, well, how can GLP-1 be you know, good for the heart and, and good for the kidney and good for the aorta and maybe good for the brain? What is a common pathophysiology that underlies many of these uh, chronic organ dysfunctions and metabolic disease? And since Gokan is sitting in front of me here, I have to say it could be inflammation. And if you say, you know, why would GLP-1 be involved in inflammation? Remember where the L cells that make GLP-1 are situated. In a very odd position if one considers that this is an incretin hormone. That location should be in the stomach or in the proximal uh, small bowel where we find GIP, but most of the GLP-1 is found in the terminal ileum and colon. And what else is there? That's where the microbes are, which have powerful pro-inflammatory effects. These bugs and viruses and fungi and their metabolites stimulate GLP-1 secretion, which in turn talks to the major immune cell in the body that expresses the GLP-1 receptor. It's the intestinal intraepithelial lymphocyte. And so locally in the gut, that makes sense. That's actually the primary physiological action of GLP-1. The rest of the biology for diabetes and obesity and everything else for the last 35 years, sort of an accident, but it's been fun. So what we don't understand is how GLP-1 reduces inflammation in many other organs in the body, which it does, but where we cannot find immune cells that express the GLP-1 receptor. And it's not just us. If you go to ImGen or any of the immunological consortium databases and look for where the receptor is, it's really only in those IELs in the gut. And so again, we have to think that in the gut, we have this local cell that expresses the receptor that's important for gut inflammation. And when we knock out this gut lymphocyte GLP-1 receptor, we lose the control for inflammation in the gut. But what we don't lose is the systemic anti-inflammatory actions of GLP-1. So here we've induced inflammation with lipopolysaccharide. The mice are treated with or without Exendin-4. Even though we have now knocked out the major immune GLP-1 receptor in the body, that T-cell GLP-1 receptor, we still reduce cytokine expression systemically. So that gut lymphocyte receptor is not 
necessary for the systemic anti-inflammatory actions of GLP-1. So how can this be if we think we understand the gut, what are the other mechanisms controlling the systemic anti-inflammatory actions of GLP-1? And C.K. Wong and his colleagues in the lab have recently said, well, it's actually the brain. And you know, there is a gut-brain axis, and there are many GLP-1 receptor positive neurons that communicate with the brain. And when we knock out the brain GLP-1 receptor, we lose the systemic anti-inflammatory actions of GLP-1 in response to multiple TLR ligands that we would see with sepsis or bacterial infection, fungal infection, et cetera. So this, again, is another layer of inter-organ communication that allows us how we can explain effects of GLP-1 where we don't directly see receptors. So where is inflammation important? It's, it's important in many organs in people with metabolic disease. One of the really interesting actions of GLP-1 is in people with metabolic liver disease. And we heard a, a nice talk yesterday from one of our rising stars about this. There have been two uh, phase two trials with GLP-1 receptor agonists in people with NASH. Here are the results of one of these trials, biopsies done before and after treatment with semaglutide. And the results are promising enough that uh, these drugs are now in phase three trials for people with NASH. But if you say, well, how does this work? There are no GLP-1 receptors on hepatocytes. And so for a while, I envisioned that most of the beneficial effects of GLP-1 on the liver are indirect and mediated through weight loss, which we know is very beneficial for these people. However, you know, Brent McLean and, and C.K. Wong and others did identify a very small subset of lymphocytes in the liver, as well as a small subset of endothelial cells in the liver that express the GLP-1 receptor. So it's not hepatocytes, it's these other non-parenchymal cells. And when we knock out this receptor on these T cells and we treat the animals with liraglutide or semaglutide, we lose some of the anti-inflammatory effects of GLP-1 in the liver. So I sort of didn't believe this in its entirety, even though it's data from my lab. I, I get very suspicious if it's one mouse model giving one result. So we did the experiment another way. We said, let's take the mice that have a brain knockout of the GLP-1 receptor. So they can get no weight loss whatsoever, but we'll treat them with semaglutide and induce metabolic liver disease. And when we do that, they actually show a benefit. So they still have reduced inflammation and reduced fibrosis, even though they haven't lost any weight whatsoever. So I think the story is ultimately going to be that it is the secondary effects from weight loss combined with some direct effects, likely from those intrahepatic GLP-1 receptors, which we're now knocking out in the brain GLP-1 receptor knockouts. And this trial is also a phase three trial underway with GLP-1 in NASH. It's the ESSENCE trial. It has an initial 72-week look with biopsies done before and after semaglutide, and then the trial is extended for four years to look at safety uh, endpoints. Probably another two years, I'd say, before we find out whether semaglutide will be useful for people with NASH. So there are two things wrong with this picture. This is from the New York Post, by the way. I didn't just make this up. And the first thing wrong is that you'll see the person on the left probably does not look like they qualify for uh, using GLP-1 receptor agonists. And so we started to see a lot of off-label use of these drugs. Somebody's cousin is getting married in four weeks and they want to go from a size 12 to a size 10. For the guys here who don't understand dress sizes, if you work in metabolic disease, you need to have a refresher course. And the other thing that's a problem on the right, you see that you can now buy semaglutide, not from Novo Nordisk, but from your local compounding pharmacy 
and it's a sodium salt that hasn't been tested and it hasn't gone through the same uh, sterile, good manufacturing practice production. So we're starting to see these problems, and, and why is this? It really derives from the results that we have seen recently using higher doses of semaglutide for treatment of people with obesity. We're now seeing 15, 16% placebo subtracted weight loss, and even more recently, a GLP-1 GIP receptor coagonist called terzepatide is now producing 20% placebo subtracted weight loss. So there's a, a song for some of you who like country music, which starts off with mama, don't let your children grow up to be cowboys. And I'm now thinking that for those of you who have children who wanna be bariatric surgeons, there might be slightly less demand because in the future we're going to see I think four or five drugs in the next five years that are going to give you between 20 to 25 percent weight loss. And certainly terzepatide will be one of them. And when we say, how does this work, you know, Rola Hamoud made this uh, cartoon review article. And you could look at this and say, well, GIP reduces food intake, GLP-1 reduces food intake. Maybe if you put them together, you just get the additive benefits. Except if you treat people with GIP and semaglutide together, you don't reproduce the benefits of terzepatide, and several other GIP, GLP-1 receptor coagonists did not reproduce the benefits. In fact, there have been uh, attempts to block GIP action or inactivate the GIP receptor, which also produced benefits, not just in animals, but here's human data from Amgen, and they've made an antibody that blocks the GIP receptor and activates the GLP-1 receptor. So 50% of it is like terzepatide, 50% of it does the exact opposite that terzepatide does. One injection of this antibody once a month for three injections in phase one produces 14.5% weight loss, and you can see the slope of that green line, it's still going down nicely. And so this antibody is easily going to produce 20% plus weight loss with a month, once a month regimen. And so for those of you who really understand how terzepatide works, congratulations, because the rest of us are still trying to reconcile all of this data. And here's another combination that's in phase three. It's a long-acting amylin analog plus semaglutide, look at the slope of that line after four months. This is easily going to produce 23, 24% uh, weight loss, and we'll see next year what the results are. Now, a big question mark in the field is the safety of these new, more powerful drugs in people with obesity, not with type 2 diabetes. The uh, Agency Bloomberg did a, a, an article on the expense and cost and reimbursement of these drugs two weeks ago, and they interviewed, quoted the CEO of United Health, which in, in the United States is one of the largest payers, and the CEO of United Health says, until we have definitive proof that these drugs reduce heart attacks, strokes, cardiovascular morbidity, and death, we are not going to reimburse weight loss drugs. And so we will get the results of the first of these outcome studies in people with obesity probably in August or September, and then we will argue about the number needed to treat and the relative reduction in, in uh, MACE events and, and the cost effectiveness, et cetera. They probably still won't be cost effective until the companies lower the price. So that's the end of the, the update that I'd like to tell you. This is sort of a 35 plus year story in evolution. And at the bottom, you'll see that there are multiple phase three trials underway, whether it's for heart failure, peripheral artery disease, diabetic kidney disease, NASH, and perhaps the most exciting for me personally that I didn't share with you today is two phase three trials underway for Alzheimer's disease. So I think even though it's been a 35 year story that started with type two diabetes, and moved on to people with obesity, there's still some really intriguing indications where the basic science suggests the possibility of feasibility in humans. So fingers crossed we'll see how that turns out. So I'd like to stop there and 
I don't know if we have time for questions now or later, but it's up to our moderator. Thanks very much. So we do have time for one or two questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, so the question I'll repeat is, is stellate cells in the GLP-1 receptor. So we can't find the GLP-1 receptor in stellate cells. Um, Regeneron and other people who have looked carefully can't find the receptor in stellate cells. The GLP-2 receptor is in stellate cells and does modulate stellate cell activity. And actually, stellate cells express a large number of G protein coupled receptors. So they are very responsive to endocrine type signals and neurotransmitters, but not the GLP-1 receptor. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm uh, wondering about whether there could be adverse effects of the GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, in particular related to cancer. Um, you would uh, expect that if inflammation is decreased, as well as uh, improvement in metabolic state, uh, this should have improvements also for cancer. Yet uh, there is some new data suggesting that in some types of cancer, there may be some adverse effects, uh, in such as in pancreatic cancer and uh, uh, I believe thyroid cancer. Would you like to comment on that? What sure. would be the mechanism? Yeah. So I would push back. I, I would say there is no rigorous data for pancreatic cancer. As a reminder, these drugs were approved April 28, 2005. So there are 18 years in the clinic with hundreds of millions of uh, lives treated with GLP-1. And in real world studies, so when you go into countries where they record what drugs people are on and what other diagnosis they have, if you look at someone taking GLP-1 versus insulin for type 2 diabetes, there's zero imbalance of pancreatic cancer. If you look at the cardiovascular outcome trials, there are eight of them where people are followed for up to six years, there's zero imbalance of pancreatic cancer. So I'm not sure this is talked about, but it's actually not borne out scientifically. There are one or two real-world studies for thyroid cancer where there is an imbalance, and I would refer you to, uh, and it's well-differentiated thyroid cancer, not medullary thyroid cancer, and I would refer you to the accompanying editorial in Diabetes Care, which strongly suggests that this is an ascertainment bias. So because people are known to scrutinize uh, the thyroids more because of medullary thyroid cancer, my guess, and, and the writers of the editorial suggest that if you could normalize the incidence of thyroid cancer per surveillance ultrasound done, and we don't have that data, you probably wouldn't see any imbalance. So thyroid follicular cells do not express the GLP-1 receptor. Normal C cells in the thyroid do not express the GLP-1 receptor in humans. So it's not clear to me that there's really a, a true difference in thyroid cancer, but if you don't adjust for surveillance, you will see it. So I, I think we were all very worried in uh, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, about pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer and thyroid cancer. I think after almost 20 years in the clinic, it's been very difficult to have rigorous data that, that supports those concerns. Okay, one last question from the Especially in terms of inflammation, is there yeah. a separate mechanism? Yeah, so the question is, is DP4 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists and inflammation? So there, there are profound differences. So DP4 is widely expressed in the immune system. Almost every single lymphocyte expresses lots of DPP4. Um, yet when you inhibit the catalytic activity with the DP4 inhibitors that are used for the treatment of type 2 diabetes, and in animals, you see profound anti-inflammatory effects. But again, we looked in humans. So we looked at the Merck cardiovascular outcome trial 
which was the TCOS trial. So here you had thousands of people either randomized to citagliptin or another standard of care for glucose control. These people had type 2 diabetes and obesity and heart disease. So their levels of endogenous meta-inflammation were high. And in the TCOS trial, if you were on metformin, you had a reduction in inflammation. If you were on citagliptin, when we measured six classic cytokines in the circulation of these people, there was zero reduction of inflammation with a DP4 inhibitor. So I think high pharmacological levels of GLP-1 are anti-inflammatory, which you don't get with DP4 inhibitors, but modulating the catalytic activity itself is not sufficient to reduce inflammation in humans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker and last speaker of the session is Mitch Lazar. And he is a member of National Academy and is very well known for his work on nuclear receptors. And I heard he started his lab years ago also working on circadian rhythms. And I think uh, he had a recent interest back to circadian rhythms that he's going to talk about today. So. Well, thanks, Emma. And I want to add my thanks to Gokhan and uh, the Sabri Ulker Center and uh, all the co-organizers who made uh, the logistics of this meeting possible and put together a great lineup. I'm looking forward to the whole, the whole day of, of uh, talks. So um, Dr. Drucker just uh, told us about one GPCR, cell surface receptor. I'm going to focus on what my lab has been studying for, for several decades now, which are the nuclear hormone uh, receptors. These are a family of uh, 48 um, transcription factors that, unlike GPCRs and other cell surface receptors that have a complicated uh, signaling cascade of, from the uh, outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, the nuclear receptors, um, although quite complicated as well in their mechanism, in a sense are simpler because the small lipophilic ligands that bind to these receptors uh, diff diffuse into the cell or get into the cell through uh, channels uh, and transporters and then um, interact with their nuclear, with the receptor that's already bound to chromatin in most cases and regulate gene expression by acting at these sequences known as enhancers. The, uh, the entree to this field came from hormone receptors, uh, thyroid hormone, steroid hormones, and so on. Now there are uh, many more, uh, as I mentioned, 48. Some are responsive to some of the metabolites we'll hear about at, at the meeting today, I'm sure. And it's interesting to, to take a step back and realize that uh, in the U.S., about 13% of all prescription, prescriptions for, for, for drugs are for molecules that act at nuclear receptors when you consider thyroid replacement, glucocorticoids, uh, contraceptives, um, postmenopausal estrogens, so on and so forth. Um, this is a, from a review that was recently uh, put out by Vincent Chiguerre and his colleagues in Montreal. It's probably an oversimplification that just reminds us of how important the nuclear receptors are in regulating many, many metabolic pathways at the transcriptional level. I'm going to focus on one particular nuclear receptor, actually two, known as the reverbs. There's alpha and beta. Alpha is the main, um, most active form. This beta is more of a backup system. If you take out beta from most cell types, you don't see much of a change. But if you were to remove both, and I'll show you examples of that today, you get more dramatic effects. This is the structure of essentially all nuclear receptors. They have a central DNA binding domain and a C-terminal domain that's important for ligand binding as well as for um, interaction with co-regulatory molecules, co-activators, co-oppressors, and so on. Um, reverb lacks a critical feature of almost all the other nuclear receptors, which is called helix 12. It's the 12th uh, alpha helix in the ligand binding domain of the receptors. And this helix 12 is responsible for interaction with co-activators in the presence of a ligand. So for example, in the glucocorticoid receptor, binds its ligand, helix 12 shifts its position, and coactivators can bind, and you get the activation of gene expression 
by glucocorticoids that we've known about for, for, for 50 years. But in the case of reverb, reverb alpha and beta, they are genetically lacking the C terminus. And as a result, they cannot activate transcription. And actually, they're potent repressors of G transcription. We learned about nuclear receptor repression as a mechanism from reverb in particular and from thyroid hormone work in our lab and others. The way it represses transcription is by recruiting a co-repressor co complex that's uh, uh, nucleated by this very large protein called nucle nuclear receptor co-repressor, or NCOR. It's about 270 kilodalton molecule that brings to the receptor and chromatin multiple other factors, but I'll draw your attention to histone deacetylase 3, which is a specific class 1 uh, histone deacetylase, which is uh, intimately related to NCOR. In fact, it's a stoichiometric relationship, and the catalytic of activity of HDAC3 actually requires interaction with NCOR. Uh, our lab is quite interested in this, but I'm not going to discuss um, much about this other than to show you a couple of uh, examples of where it plays a role in reverb's action. Um, as Emma mentioned, I'm going to really focus uh, my entire talk today on the role of reverb in circadian biology. And this is the uh, depiction of the mammalian circadian clock, which is a transcriptional, translational feed-forward loop. At the very center, you can see BMOL clock. That's a BHLH uh, heterodimer, which um, binds E-boxes. That is an activator of transcription. It activates uh, so-called core clock genes, but also activates repressors that are going to ultimately repress uh, BMOL in particular, or, or both at the transcriptional level or at the functional level. And the process of BMOL uh, clock activating these repressors, then being translated, tr you know, transcribed, translated, feeding back, et cetera, et cetera, that's where the magic happens. That takes about 24 hours. Um, the exact mechanism of the timing you can imagine, but we don't really understand very well. The first uh, re realization that we had uh, an inherent uh, genetic biological clock was the work of initially by Seymour Benzer uh, and his colleagues, but the cloning of PER, the period gene from flies, by Ross Bash, Hall, and Young um, what earned them the 2017 Nobel Prize in, in Physiology and Medicine. Uh, that was from flies, and PER was recognized to be, again, a negative loop, but it turns out in flies there's only one negative loop. Mammals are a little bit more complicated. We have a second negative loop, and that's mediated by the star of the show I'm telling you to, about today, and that's the reverbs. Unlike purr and cry, which have a still not completely well understood mechanism whereby they um, prevent, by interacting with BMOL clock, they prevent it from interacting with the chromatin, reverb uh, directly binds to a response element, an enhancer or a silencer element, if you will, in the BMOL gene, many other genes as well, but in the BMOL gene, uh, and repress it, turning it off, and that's its mechanism of being the negative loop in the clock. I want to put this in the perspective of, of uh, how people are thinking about this in human biology and make one other uh, point before I get into some, uh, some, some data from our lab. Um, I want to point out that uh, for many, many years, it was thought that there was one master clock in the body that was present in the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus, uh, the, the head of this photo. I can't point to it, but you can see it there. Um, but in 1998, Uli Schibler discovered, um, amazingly, and most people didn't believe it, but it turns out to be completely true, that is to say that every cell of the body, with very few exceptions, actually has the same clock mechanism. And what the SCN does is really to uh, keep these, these, you know, billions of, of clocks um, in sync. I'm showing you the molecular circuitry here as well. And the way we think about this in terms of human health is that we recognize that there is a strong epidemiological uh, relationship between uh, night shift work and metabolic disease. And there's hundreds of these correlative studies. I'm going to just show you a couple here to uh, give you references for folks who want to look this up. But again, you could just Google it or, or do PubMed searches, literally hundreds of papers. Here's obesity, diabetes, uh, fatty liver disease we just heard about from, uh, 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 at, at, from Dan Drucker. Um, 
And the notion here uh, is that this is resulting from a desynchrony between central and peripheral clocks. The idea is that when all is going right in normal physiology, everything is we're eating um, at the right time of day that we've been programmed for by uh, you know, uh, many, many years of uh, waking up when the, uh, when the sun rises and so forth. But when there's a discrepancy, when there's an imbalance, this, this desynchrony manifests itself, at least in this uh, model, as impaired organismal metabolism, including all of the metabolic problems I just told you about. So we're going to turn to reverb. And I want to show you, this is um, descriptive, you could say, and it's really physiology. There's no uh, tricks here. This is just, uh, and no uh, molecular um, uh, uh, changes are imparted on, the, on mice. These are free-living mice in a vivarium where the lights go on at 7 a.m. That's called Zeitgeber time zero. When the lights go on, I may sometimes use that term. Lights uh, go off at 7 p.m. And you can see this is uh, the reverb protein levels in a normal mouse in one day, but this is every single day. It's very high um, toward the end of the relatively inactive period and goes down to essentially a knockout, every single physiological knockout every single day. So the peak to trough ratio, if not infinity, is hundreds. What the approach we began to take about um, 12 years or so ago now, really when the genome was sequenced and we had the uh, uh, opportunity to, um, this is actually an older version of the slide that I loaded, but I think we can live with it. We had the opportunity to do um, uh, both RNA-seq and chip-seq for factors such as reverb, for example, and to perform functional genomics on these data. And our original um, foray into this identified uh, reverb as driving not only a circadian um, uh, systrome, that is to say, when reverb was present, like in the uh, bottom left, uh, it's also, it's binding to DNA, but it's recruiting its co-repressor complex, which itself, unlike reverb, doesn't have a circadian uh, rhythm at the protein or gene expression level. But at the level of interaction with chromatin, it gets co-opted into becoming a circadian factor, at least on these reverb sites. And by bringing HDAC3 there, it deacetylates histone uh, and represses genes which, when one looks at this bioinformatically, uh, are enriched for uh, genes involved in lipid metabolism. But of course, a lot of this is correlation and um, uh, implication and prediction. And um, what we uh, take advantage of in the mice that we obviously cannot do in a human study is genetics. And we're able to show over the years that the loss of reverbs or NCOR or HDEC3 in the liver results in a fatty liver consistent with this model that this is a major physiological circadian regulator of lipid metabolism in the liver. Um, we wondered about the effect of uh, high fat diet on the circadian rhythms and Dung Yin Guan, when he was a postdoc in my uh, laboratory, he now, Dung Yin now has his, uh, began his own lab at Baylor College of Medicine. And what Dung Yin uh, observed is that when mice are put on um, a, a high fat, high sugar diet that leads to uh, insulin resistance and weight gain, you can see that there's a gain of circadian rhythmicity of, um, of hundreds if not thousands of, of genes. We assumed initially that this would be an effect on the clock in the liver, but when he looked at the classic liver um, clock uh, gene expression, it was surprisingly um, virtually unaltered, certainly not enough to explain these large changes. Uh, and so what Dong Yin did to address this further was to use techniques of mapping enhancers in an unbiased way throughout the genome uh, in a circadian manner. And what he discovered was that there were peaks in enhancer activity uh, at sites that were predicted to be bound by PPR alpha and by SREBP, two master regulators of lipid metabolism, but not classic components of the circadian clock. Again, that was a prediction, but then when we measure, um, I'm not going to show you the DNA binding by SREBP, but this is the 
or PPR, but this is the uh, expression. You can see that there's a gained rhythm in the red in the diet-induced obesity model of both SREVP and PPR alpha. This corresponded to a gained rhythm as well as a, of a, a marked increase in mean expression of their target gene expressions involved in novo lipogenesis in the case of SREVP or fatty acid oxidation in the case of PPR alpha. And then in collaboration with Cholsun Zhang, uh, who at the time was in Josh Rabinowitz's lab at Princeton, now Cholsun has his own uh, uh, group in UC Irvine, we were able to demonstrate that actually this, these gene expression changes actually did translate into changes in metabolism that were circadian uh, in uh, both de novo lipogenesis and fatty acid oxidation. And frankly, I, I still don't really understand the biology behind or the, if you will, the adaptive nature of having a feudal cycle that was that simultaneous of fatty acid oxidation and uh, de novo lipogenesis. One can imagine that early on, uh, having de novo lipogenesis makes sense because the body is confronted with so much uh, carbon that exceeds the capacity of fat cells, insulin is high. We do understand that physiology, but why this would occur, I think is something we're still quite interested in, happy to discuss in the course of the meeting. But this begged the question, since I showed you that the liver clocks weren't changing on a high fat diet, and you've got these major circadian changes, what about the, the, the main question of what the liver clocks regulate? And to get at this, uh, again, uh, Dong Yin uh, performed liver-specific, actually hepatocyte-specific knockout of reverb alpha and beta. And you, he did this with an AEV uh, 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 vector that drives expression of either control, GFP, or CRE from a hepatocyte-specific promoter, the human thyroxin binding globulin gene. And I'll show you in, in a subsequent slide proof that this is truly hepatocyte-specific. This is something developed at our diabetes, Penn Diabetes Center uh, vector core, and very useful. Many, many labs have taken advantage of it now. Um, this is the mRNA for reverb. Again, if you look at the, the, the red that just shows we have the knockout, the blue, I showed you the protein before, again, is, um, to me, although it's descriptive and it's not telling us what it's doing, is still a very remarkable daily excursion of reverb alpha and beta. One thing we found when we did this is when we looked at BMOL, for example, NPAS2 is another clock gene that uh, works in, in concert with BMOL, but just focus on BMOL for, for, for now. What you can see is if you just look at the blue, again, normal physiology, you can see that reverb and BMOL are completely antiphase with each other. That's what led our group, Uli Schubler's group, and others to predict that reverb was the main regulator at an oppressive level of BMOL. But look what happens in the knockout, the red curve for BMOL. A couple of interesting things I want to point out. One is that um, it's essentially constitutively high. You could argue, and there is maybe a residual 1.5-fold uh, peak to trough ratio, nothing like the near infinity physiological ratio. The other thing I want to point out is that at the normal peak of BMOL, which is the trough of reverb, when you take away reverbs, there's no further increase in BMOL. And at the trough of uh, BMOL, which is the peak of reverb expression, when you take away reverbs, BMOL comes up pretty much to the level of its peak, which is a strong argument for both reverb being the main regulator, uh, for reverbs being the main regulator of BMOL, both circadian rhythm as well as magnitude of expression. Um, but of course, we were interested in knowing more globally, so Dong Yin performed RNA-seq at multiple times of day, and he discovered um, that there were a number of genes, as we expected, including BMOL shown uh, and, and then pass shown in the picture, and many of the classic clock genes that had disrupted rhythms when we knocked out reverbs. That kind of is what we expected, so we're happy to see that some of the predictions we and others had made had come true. But in some ways, what was more interesting and still not completely understood is that there were um, even more genes that didn't change their rhythm despite the removal of this major physiological regulator of the clock and the output of that, which included the lack of rhythm of, of BMOL. Um, so these were circadian despite loss of uh, rhythmicity of the cl canonical clock genes. And we think these are probably regulated by what we're calling non cell autonomous site gabers. There are three main categories of. Uh, candidates for this. One would be endocrine hormones like glucocorticoids. 
which have a strong rhythm that's determined by the SCN. Remember, the SCN is not touched in these experiments. Uh, it could also be a nervous system, peripheral nervous system, a vagus nerve, for example, connection uh, uh, to the liver. And also the SCN controls feeding behavior. We know that feeding behavior and food itself is a major entrainer of the circadian rhythm. And again, in normal physiology, the eating is happening when the activity is happening. So it's very difficult to parse this out. Although I'm going to show you an example of that as I close in a minute. Um, what about the effect on metabolism, specifically liver metabolism? Well, SREBP and fatty acid synthase, and in fact, all of the SREBP downstream targets also were these were, were, were gain rhythms. They didn't lose rhythms in, this, in these circumstances. And indeed, uh, there was an increase in hepatic triglycerides as well as, cir as circulating triglycerides, showing that unlike the, the uh, previous studies where we done this in a total body reverb knockout, this is saying that it's actually the reverbs and hepatocytes that are playing an important role in normal liver metabolism, that when you remove them, you exacerbate hepatosteatosis. Diane was also interested in, as so many people are today, uh, about cell-cell communication. Some of what we just heard from, from Dan Drucker was also about non-cell autonomous effects, in that case of uh, GLP-1 and so on. Um, so what Dong Yin did was both single uh, nucleus sequencing as well as isolation of cells in, in concert looked at them. I'm just going to show you because it, it shows more easily, I think, some of the, sing the isolated cell data. These are hepatocytes isolated from the mice in which we believe we've knocked out reverbs in hepatocytes. And what you can see, I think, is that the... Um, it's not really labeled here, so yeah, sorry. I'll show you the punchline here. but. Uh, the top line is reverbs, and you can see they, they have lost, the, the blue again is the control, that's this remarkable um, amplitude rhythm, uh, but you can see that the red dots on the left, upper, and uh, uh, are, it, reverbs are gone. If you look at BMOL, very similar to what I showed you in the whole liver. Uh, uh, when reverbs are gone, BMOL is, is flat and at the maximum level of, of its peak. But Dong Yin also, uh, looked at isolated endothelial cells and cupfer cells from these mice, and what I hope you can see is that there's no change in reverb alpha and beta. If you look at the central or, or uh, 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 column, uh, first two lines, there's no change. So reverbs have not been um, changed by knocking them out. It is hepatocyte specific, not in the endothelial cells, not in the cupfer cells. Cupfer cells, interesting, like non-SCN parts of the brain, actually have um, more like a 20, uh, it doesn't look so high there, but the peak to trough ratio is 20 rather than uh, nearly, uh, than hundreds. But when Dong Yin then performed RNA-seq on, uh, as well as ATAC-seq on the Kupfer cells, he was able to find lots of examples of transcripts that either gained rhythmicity, lost rhythmicity, gained open chromatin, lost open chromatin, by knocking out reverbs in hepatocytes, but without affecting the Kupfer cells, and very similar data in endothelial cells. Now, what is the signal from the hepatocyte that's driving this? This is something we're quite interested in. When you do single cell sequencing, as I'm sure many people know, you get all sorts of candidates, uh, receptor, um, ligand interactions, and so on, and we've been in the process of checking many of those out, but one thing that uh, struck Dong Yin was that, uh, again, we keep seeing this signal for SREBP when we knock out reverbs. And once again in this model, we see a signal for SREBP signaling. So he wondered if hepatocyte SREBP could be upstream of a hepatocyte derived signal communicating clock information to Kupfer cells. And so he performed double knockout, the same experiment again, or a triple knockout, in which case. He had both reverb alpha and beta knockout, but on top of that, scap knockout, which leads to the destabilization and loss of SREBPs. And when he did this, you can see that in the, in the middle section where it says DKO, that's the gain rhythms in um, Kupfer cells in the reverb knockout, in the hepatocyte reverb knockout livers. And a lot of these lose this gain rhythm if SREBP is not there. So they were dependent upon SREBP. 
With Cholsun, we've performed lots of metabolomics that have some candidate lipids that could be uh, involved in this, but quite frankly, um, it's, the problem is not that we have one obvious candidate or couldn't find anything, it's that there are way too many lipids that in macrophages, as well as in hepatocytes, are changing their circadian rhythmicity. Super complicated, and we're just uh, figuring that out now. So in the, uh, this part of the talk, I've uh, showed you that the molecular clock in hepatocytes controls some, but not all, circadian gene expression in the liver. The hepatocyte clock also controls circadian rhythms in non-hepatocytic cells, such as endothelial cells and comfort cells, in part via SREBP in the hepatocyte. And it's required for the normal regulation of lipid metabolism. But if that is not complicated enough, what we really need to understand is the relationship between clocks. And in particular, uh, the relationship between the SCN and the liver, and as a first step in that direction, Marina Elman Marini, who was a postdoc on my lab and now has begun her own group at the University of Toulouse in France, asked the question of what, reverb, what role reverbs play in the SCN. To do this, she also used a mouse genetic approach using a reporter that knocks out uh, reverbs in the SCN but leaves it alone in the lateral hypothalamus, which is super important because that's where the feeding uh, uh, behavior is emanating from, uh, ingestive behavior. There's, it's not a, like all creases, it's not perfect, and I'd be happy to discuss some of the uh, cautions, some of the other controls we did to convince ourselves that what I'm going to show you are the result of knocking it out in the SCN. But here's what we find uh, behaviorally. I don't know how many people have seen diagrams like this. These are actograms. And what you're looking at, and try to just look at the control for the moment, what you're looking at in every line are uh, one day, and you're looking at activity on a running wheel. So if the mouse is running quite a bit on the running wheel, this is one mouse, you have to do multiple, obviously. If the mouse is acting on the running wheel, you see a tick. And right away you can see that when, and the yellow is the light and the other is the dark, and you can see in the light mice are hardly running around at all. This is obviously well known, they're nocturnal. But when the lights go on, they, if you give them a running wheel, they like that and they run around like all day, all in the light. If you then turn off the lights, go into constant darkness, what happens is that's called free running. And essentially the definition of, the circad of having an active circadian clock in a, in a mouse model, which flies a slightly different uh, assay, is what happens to their, uh, do they have a 24-hour rhythm? And the answer is they pretty much do. You can see on the left that there's a, a drift in the, where, the, where the black is starting every day. That's because the free running period of mice is around 23.6 hours. Circadian means about a day, and sure enough, 23.6 is not exactly 24, but obviously close enough that it can be entrained by the light. That's a whole uh, separate aspect I'd be happy to discuss in a moment. But look what happens in the SCN knockout. We actually expected arrhythmia for a variety of reasons that I won't go into, but instead what Marine found was, look at the slope of the lines of when the black ticks start after they're taken out of the light dark. By the way, every clock chain is trumped by uh, light and by, by the, the Zeitgeber of light, whether it's BMOL, CRY, et cetera. So that's uh, expected that they're entrained to the light even with the knockout. But in the absence of light in the dark, where circadian behavior and rhythmicity is defined, um, you can see that they've started uh, much earlier every day, and it turns out when you do the calculation, they're starting three hours earlier every day, if, every clock day for us. And so you might think of this as a 21-hour uh, free-running period. Um, Michael Tackenberg, another postdoc in the lab who is interested in looking ex vivo at some of these things, took out uh, SCNs with mice that were the same mice except same, same model, except they also had, uh, they were transgenic for a reporter, a circadian reporter per two Luke, which allows you to look in a, a, a luminometer at, um, uh, at, at the signal. What you can see, in, if you compare the blue, which is control SCN, and the SCN knockout in orange, I hope you can see that there's a shorter period. In fact, there's one more, if you count the peaks there, in the same period of time, there's one more peak in the SCN double knockout. So, these are taken from the mice where the knockout is happening in vivo, even in vitro. If we, take, if we just take SCNs that have um, the flox genes and add the Cree in vivo, 
uh, with, a, with, a, with a virus, uh, it's, it's an AV uh, syncree, we, you can see that the, um, uh, there's again about a two to three hour reduction or, or, or shortening of their period. So in the absence of reverbs, the master clock still runs, but it's damaged with an intrinsic period of 21 hours. The, um, this, I want to point out this, uh, I mentioned earlier that we think about desynchrony uh, as uh, a, a discord between normal endogenous clocks and abnormal like dark cycles. This is really a hypothesis developed by Colin uh, Pittenrig in 1959 called the uh, circadian resonance hypothesis. And we thought that the 21 hour free running period actually provided us a model to test this model that there's a disconnect uh, between um, the abnormal endogenous clock in relation to a 24 hour day. And so the hypothesis was that these mice would have abnormal metabolism because of this desynchrony. And sure enough, what uh, Marine found it, on, on, a, 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 in a, in a, on a high fat, high sugar diet, which is often uh, many in the audience know, necessary as a stressor to bring out metabolic phenotypes, you can see that there is increased body weight, increased blood sugar, and increased liver fat. But what if the light cycle were matched? In other words, could we fix this problem by sort of two wrongs make a right? They have this broken clock with a 21-hour free-running uh, period, but what if we made them, put them in 10.5-hour light, 10.5-hour dark day uh, cycles? So we did, we moved them into rooms with that lighting period. And in this case, we're able to mitigate most of the metabolic abnormalities, body weight, blood sugar, and fatty liver. So uh, this was a prospective experimental confirmation of the circadian resonance hypothesis to explain metabolic disorders or the desynchrony hypothesis. Everything else is correlative. But we think this actually means that things that we and others have been writing speculatively in reviews for such a long time to explain um, why there's better, or at least the mechanism of metabolic dysfunction, at least can now be um, uh, predictively and longitudinally tested in an experimental paradigm that I've shown you here. And this is um, easy to say, hard to do, but suggests that metabolic problems in shift workers would be ameliorated by matching their environment to their internal clocks. The problem there is they have a normal clock and abnormal environment. Our mice had an abnormal clock. We made their environment abnormal. You'd have to make their eating schedule not normal for normal people, but hopefully fix some of their metabolic problems. So I'm going to stop there and uh, thank again the people who did the work. I think I mentioned the main stars, Dong Yin and uh, Marine, and showed you their photos. Uh, other postdocs in the lab that have done the work are listed there. Great collaborations with Joshua Bunowitz and Shul Soon at Princeton and UC Irvine. And some of our behavioral studies, we've had great help from Matt Hayes and his lab at Penn. So thank you again for your time and attention. Happy to take questions. Okay, maybe for the sake of time, uh, we can have one question and we can have the rest of the questions in the coffee break. Do we have any questions? One there from us, yeah. It's interesting to see that you can, with you know, DC, fix this synchrony by changing the clock um, or the daylight. Uh, but in night shift workers, why do we not see that impact? Because I assume that they also adjust their eating schedules and light exposure accordingly. Why is not? Why are we having trouble to fix that for people that work at night or irregular hours? Well, it's a good question, and. In fact, I'm not sure if it's been done. I don't know about it, actual you know, testing exactly when they're eating. But I think the way that one would do this experimentally would be you could tell where people's clocks are by measuring either their melatonin level or their cortisol level. That tells you where they are relative to what would be normal physiology. Normally, for example, cortisol is high in the morning. So you'd want to time the meals relative to an individual, a personalized type of strategy where you time the meals relative to the individual's own rhythm on the night shift or jet lag or whatever it is, um, maybe with a, you know, a quick test for their cortisol. Okay, good. Yeah, there's one more. This, this is a, this is a fascinating show. Thank you. And I'm also really fascinated by the, the huge impact of making abnormal time matching the abnormal rhythm. 
And what, what actually is the mechanism leading to, do you know, this metabolic correction or abnormality in the first place? Yeah, great, great questions, uh, Gokhan. The one where we think we have a better shot at is even just trying to figure out what was it about the clock yeah. mechanism that reduced it by three hours. We have some ideas. For example, we've discovered that reverb is regulating a kinase that's important for the stabilization or destabilization of uh, the cry protein, another cog in the wheel of the, of the clock. And so we've hypothesized that that is what is the mechanism. We can sort of model it, but now we're actually trying to test it experimentally. Yeah, really fascinating. Thank you. So before we close the session, I also would like to say that uh, one of the uh, speakers, Barbara Khan, couldn't make it here to Turkey because unfortunately her mom died the day before the symposium, so uh, she, she couldn't be here. So now it is a coffee break and uh, yep, see you in a few minutes again. Thank you.
thesis on cancer, and she's currently a professor in the Department of Cancer Biology in uh, UPenn as well. We're very happy to see you, Catherine. Please. Thank you so much for the kind uh, introduction, and thank you so much to Gokhan and to the Sabri Okor Foundation for the invitation. It's really an honor to be a part of this really special symposium. Um, I'm really learning a lot and, and enjoying this very much. Um, and for me, this is very special to be here. <laughs> this is my second time to come to Istanbul, and the first time was 20 years ago when I was an early PhD student, so you can see us both looking a little bit younger there. <laughs> um, so it's great to, great to be back. So my lab has been broadly interested in understanding how shifts in metabolism are detected and interpreted by the cell, how adaptive me mechanisms are put into place and implications for physiological regulation and also in the context of cancer biology. And one of the major pathways that my lab has focused on in this regard over the years is acetyl-CoA metabolism, which I think is very interesting as a signaling metabolite in that it really sits at this unique crossroads of metabolism being generated through nutrient catabolism in mitochondria, being used as a critical precursor for biosynthesis of fatty acids, sterols, and isoprenoids in the cytosol, and then also um, serving as a critical signaling metabolite by virtue of its use as the acetyl donor for acetylation of histones uh, and many other proteins and metabolites in the cell. Um, and this, this interplay between acetyl CoA metabolism and histone acetylation has been one of the major focuses of my lab over the years although it will actually not be the aspect that I'll be focusing on, on today. I'll be talking about some, some new work that'll be more focused on lipid metabolism. But I wanna highlight for you that there are two canonical enzymes that produce acetyl-CoA outside of the mitochondria, and these are ATP citrate lyase, which cleaves citrate to produce acetyl-CoA, uh, thereby linking mitochondrial metabolism to the nuclear and cytosolic processes that depend on acetyl-CoA. And then ACSS2, which produces acetyl-CoA from acetate. And acetate can be uptaken from the environment, or it can be produced intracellularly through a few uh, pathways, including uh, from the deacetylation of histones, and thus it serves in sort of an acetate recycling mechanism, regenerating, um, converting that acetate from deacetylation back into acetyl-CoA. Um, now, we recently have found that in addition to these two canonical routes for generating nucleocytosolic acetyl-CoA, cells can also, uh, in some contexts, engage a third pathway, uh, and this involves acetylcarnitine shuttling. Uh, so this represents a second mechanism through which two carbon units can be exported from mitochondria via acetylcarnitine, uh, which can then uh, be used to regenerate acetyl-CoA in the cytosol for use in lipid synthesis and histone acetylation. Um, this is a route that, that is not necessarily accessible in all contexts, um, but we have seen in cancer cells that this can be engaged. Um, I won't talk in depth about these results today, but this paper just came out uh, last week, so you can check that out if you're interested. So there's been substantial interest in targeting acetyl-CoA metabolism over the years, both ACLY and ACSS2. Interest in targeting ACLY actually goes all the way back to the 1960s when hydroxycitrate was isolated from extracts of uh, the tropical fruit, Garcinia gumigata, and uh, hydroxycitrate was found to inhibit ACLY and has been touted over the years uh, as a weight loss agent, although a large clinical trial failed to find any benefit uh, in terms of weight loss or fat loss of hydroxycitrate. There have been a number of other inhibitors that have been developed over the years, and there is now actually one uh, ACLY inhibitor that is in clinical use. It is FDA approved. Um, this is bempidoic acid, and bempidoic acid is, is interesting in that it is a pro-drug, uh, and it requires activation by an enzyme called acsv one which is relatively hepatocyte-specific. Um, and so this is now FDA-approved for 
treating hypercholesterolemia and is uh, recent studies uh, generating a bit of a splash in the cardiovascular field as this is a statin alternative and can be taken by individuals who are statin intolerant. Uh, and this study that, that just came out um, fairly recently demonstrated efficacy in lowering LDL cholesterol and in reducing the incidence of major adverse cardiovascular events in statin intolerant patients. But in addition, and, and I should mention that it does appear to be relatively safe, and, and this is thought to be in large part because it is relatively liver specific and doesn't have um, activity in, in muscle, for example, and doesn't have the muscular side effects that some individuals experience with statins. Okay. So there's also been interest in targeting ACLY um, in oncology as well. Uh, there's substantial evidence, preclinical evidence, uh, that targeting ACLY might hold potential for treating cancer. These are just a couple of studies from over the years, one from uh, 2005 from uh, the, the Thompson lab, demonstrating that uh, an ACLY inhibitor uh, or silencing of ACLY will suppress cancer cell proliferation as well as the growth of xenograft tumors. Um, and this is a study from our lab where we use a, a, a genetic, uh, the aggressive genetic KPC model of pancreatic cancer, and here we've deleted ACLY from pancreas, and uh, this results in a delay in tumor formation uh, and a, an extension of survival um, in the animals lacking ACLY in the pancreas. But if we hope ultimately to be able to target ACLY systemically, there are a number of gaps in knowledge, one of which is that actually the essential functions of ACLY in the adult organism remain poorly understood. Um, and this is in part because the whole body knockout mo model of ACLY is early embryonic lethal. Um, we and others have made different tissue-specific knockouts of ACLY. Um, our lab has made liver, pancreas, adipocyte knockouts of ACLY, and these all have relatively mild phenotypes and less uh, metabolically challenged or challenged with uh, uh, oncogene, with, with, a, with a cancer model. Um, and so we haven't really understood where the toxicities might lie if ACLY were to be targeted and what those essential functions in the adult animal might be. And so we wanted to try to investigate this. And so to this end, uh, a graduate student in the lab, Feng Wen, decided to generate a whole body inducible knockout model of ACLY. This is a tamoxifen inducible model. Uh, and we can delete ACLY you know, systemically throughout the whole mouse. Uh, and so we're doing this in adult mice between the ages of 8 and 12 weeks of age. We were a bit nervous, actually, in generating this model because we didn't know whether it would be absolutely you know, terrible to delete this really central metabolic enzyme. Um, but actually, the animals do pretty well. We do see that there is a pretty rapid loss of weight loss, but then this stabilizes. Uh, and the animals do maintain a lower fat mass without really an impact on lean body mass. And as we've characterized these animals metabolically, they do not seem to exhibit really terribly overt metabolic abnormalities, which was a bit of a surprise to us. Again, no real uh, obvious changes in glucose or insul insulin tolerance on a chow diet. Uh, we've put them into Promethean metabolic cages and don't really see major changes in uh, RER, looking at uh, uh, substrate preference, uh, carbohydrate versus fat, uh, no major differences between genotypes, also no real differences in food intake that might explain um, the, the loss of body weight. But there was one um, kind of really striking phenotype in these animals that we decided to follow up on this, and, and this was that these animals actually develop some striking skin abnormalities. Um, and this was most immediately apparent because of the hair loss that was seen in these animals. Um, and this is clear here right around kind of the facial area and on the ventral side. And if we shave these animals, you can see that the skin actually becomes quite dry and scaly. And histologically, this is characterized by a thickened epidermis as well as enlargement of the sebaceous glands. And so if we look a little bit deeper into this phenotype, uh, you can see ACLY here is expressed really throughout the epidermis as well as in the sebaceous glands. 
we get a nice deletion of ACLY in the skin. And then uh, ACLY and ACSS2 are known to have compensatory interplay between one another. And we see uh, kind of a striking upregulation of ACSS2. This is most notable in the sebaceous glands, but also apparent here in um, in, the, in the epidermis, as well as in the subcutaneous dermal white adipose tissue. And we also found, consistent with the thickened epidermis, that there's a, a hyperproliferative phenotype. So this uh, sort of first layer here in the epidermis um, is the basal layer. This contains the epidermal stem cells, and uh, these cells can proliferate. You can see sort of the occasional K67 positive cell within this interfollicular epidermis in the wild type animals, but this is greatly enhanced in the knockout animals with uh, nearly all of these cells within this basal uh, epidermal stem cell layer uh, showing K67 positivity. We also see an increase in uh, K67 staining also within the hair follicle and sebaceous gland as well. So looking into this a little bit further, we carried out RNA sequencing to try to understand what might be happening here, what might be perturbed. Um, what really popped out here was alterations in differentiation. And indeed, if we stain for markers of differentiation within the epidermis, K14 here uh, stains that, uh, stem, that basal stem cell layer, and we see um, you know, a really distinct separation of K K14 staining here, and then uh, K10 as a marker of the differentiated keratinocytes here in the wild type cell. Uh, these are normally very discrete. And here in uh, the knockout animals, you can see that as these cells begin to differentiate and, and begin to express K10, they actually are continuing to retain K14 expression, indicating uh, some different, uh, some aberrations and differentiation in this model. Okay, so this was all new to us. We had never worked on the skin before. Um, we hadn't really thought much about skin as a metabolic organ uh, much in the past, although of course it is very important and very interesting as a metabolic organ. I'll remind you that the skin is quite remarkable. It is a you know very thin layer, uh, but it, it serves really critical functions in thermal regulation and protecting uh, the organism from the environment, protecting against infection, uh, preventing water loss, and lipid metabolism plays a really essential role in this. And I want to point out that there are two major cell types within the skin that are producing lipids, and, and these are uh, the sebocytes within the sebaceous glands, which produce characteristic lipids such as wax esters that are secreted out onto the skin surface and are critical for moisturizing the skin, for repelling water, and also uh, the sebum can, uh, serves important antimicrobial roles as well. And then the keratinocytes are also critical uh, in terms of lipid metabolism in terms of producing uh, lipids that are necessary for the skin barrier, and these are comprised largely of ceramides. And I wanna point out a couple of things about skin ceramides. Uh, the skin ceramides actually contain uh, typically these very long chain fatty acids, and so fatty acid elongation becomes very important within the skin. Uh, and some of these uh, ceramides also contain an additional um, linoleic acid moiety attached via an ester bond uh, here. So you have these uh, ceramides and acyl ceramides that are critical for forming the skin barrier. And um, we've carried out some D2O labeling of mice, uh, and you can see that if we look at labeling with, within serum fatty acids versus epidermal fatty acids, what's really notable is that if you look at labeling in the serum fatty acids of palmitic acid here, that's similar, uh, a similar amount of labeling or a bit less within the epidermis, uh, consistent with the idea that palmitate may be uptaken into the epidermis. Um, but if we look at these very long chain fatty acids, we see much more extensive labeling consistent with this known role of the skin in doing extensive fatty acid elongation. Okay. so. Of course, we have generated a whole body knockout, and so we want to understand whether the phenotypes that we're seeing really are 
intrinsic to the skin. And so we also generated skin-specific ACL1 knockout mice. This is also a tamoxifen-inducible model. And this uh, largely recapitulates the effect seen with the whole body ACL1 knockout, which I think is fairly remarkable, actually. Um, we're seeing, again, a recapitulation of the epidermal thickening phenotype. It is not quite as severe as what we see with the whole body knockout. Um, but it is, it is clear, and um, we also see that enlargement of the sebaceous gland size as well, uh, along with the upregulation of ACSS2. Now, since we had seen this upregulation of ACSS2, we decided to go ahead and try to make the skin double ACLY ACSS2 knockout to really try to hone in on what is the essential role for acetyl-CoA synthesis in the skin. Um, and so these animals actually have a, a quite severe phenotype. Uh, most of the experiments that I've shown you in the past, we've done about five weeks post-tamoxifen uh, administration, but the animals that lack both ACLY and ACSS2 in the skin, we can only keep around for about two and a half weeks because they're losing so much of their body weight. Again, this is a skin-specific knockout, but they're losing body weight extremely rapidly, and this is associated with a dramatic thickening of the epidermis. Uh, as well as enlargement of the sebaceous glands. So what's going on here and how do we explain these phenotypes? Are there specific lipids that are dependent on uh, skin intrinsic acetyl CoA synthesis? And so we initially explored this using uh, thin layer chromatography. Um, and what you can kind of appreciate here is that sebaceous gland lipids like wax esters are actually largely able to be maintained in these animals. But What's strikingly depleted from the skin is the triglyceride pool. This initially confused us because the triglycerides are not really thought of as a major component of uh, the barrier lipids, but it turns out that triglycerides are important for synthesizing these acyl ceramides that are critical for the barrier. Um, and evidence uh, from both mouse models as well as uh, from human data indicate that the triglyceride pool within keratinocytes actually is really critical for synthesizing uh, these, these acyl ceramides. And, and this is just um, some information about a rare autosomal uh, genetic syndrome called Shannon Dorfman syndrome um, that is uh, due to a mutation in the CGI58, uh, which is important, an activator of ATGL, and, and so it results in a neutral lipid storage disorder. And one of the major phenotypes observed in these individuals is ichthyosis, which is a dry, scaly, um, thickened epidermis. So we then went on to carry out lipidomics uh, in uh, this uh, epidermis from these mice, and we found, one, that we did recapitulate the phenotype uh, that we saw by, by TLC, that triglycerides are depleted in the double knockout mice. Um, and then we also saw a significant perturbation in the ceramide pool. And in particular, uh, we found that the double knockouts exhibited an accumulation of, of ceramides that had a, a long chain fatty acid in place of that very long chain fatty acid and a, a strong depletion of um, ceramides that had a very long chain or ultra long chain fatty acid. Um, with some ex examples shown here. So this makes sense with the necessity of acetyl-CoA for generating melanol-CoA for fatty acid elongation. So with this perturbation in what uh, seem to be these critical lipids for barrier formation, we hypothesized that if we actually provided an artificial barrier to these mice, that they might, we might be able to rescue these phenotypes. And so we did um, an experiment that was kind of a, a, a simple experiment. Basically, we induced deletion of ACLY, and then we shaved the mice, and then every day we either left them untreated or we put Vaseline, basically an inert hydrocarbon, onto the backs of these mice, and then at the end we would reshave and look at how the skin was impacted. Um, and actually, the results of this were quite dramatic. Um, you can see that in five weeks after shaving in the knockout animals that were left untreated, the hair did not grow back, and you can see that the skin looks very dry and scaly. The animals that received the uh, Vaseline actually grew their hair back, and when we reshaved these animals, you can see 
that the skin looks greatly improved in terms of its appearance and it's no longer dry and scaly. So it really supports the idea that, that this is a defect in um, the skin barrier. But one of the points here that we were really interested in was the fact that we were deleting uh, these acetylcholine metabolic enzymes in the skin, and this was resulting in a really rapid depletion of adipose tissue. Um, really almost no adipose tissue left in these mice uh, within a couple of weeks after deleting ACL1 and ACSS2 in the skin. Now, of course, um, there are a number of mouse models that have looked at lipid metabolism in the skin, including the pioneering work, of course, of James Natambi on uh, SCD1 uh, in the skin, which results in uh, sebaceous gland atrophy, as well as a resistance to diet-induced obesity. Um, and, and similar phenotypes have been seen with some other models, including uh, a level three of fatty acid elongase, also resulting in a decreased adiposity and resistant to diet-induced obesity. Um, and so, so lipid metabolism has been found in a number of different models over the years um, to be playing a key role in systemic metabolism. But one of the, the ra really rapid weight loss uh, that we were observing in this model also called to mind another study that had uh, recently come out that demonstrated that um, a cytokine called TSLP, uh, which is produced within the epidermis normally when administered pharmacologically, actually induces a very rapid weight loss, kind of reminiscent of what we were seeing. And in, in this study, the investigators pointed out that sebum secretion actually can account for quite uh, a large uh, amount of calories. So, they point out in the discussion of their paper that at baseline, humans secrete about 130 kilocalories of sebum each day, which is pretty remarkable. And so um, if you're uh, amplifying that as they were in this particular context, um, it could result in quite a bit of, of weight loss. And so we wondered uh, whether this axis might be perturbed in our model, particularly considering that we were seeing sebaceous gland uh, enlargement in our model, as well as um, a maintenance of the ability to sustain uh, production of wax esters, even in the face of a loss of acetylcholine synthesis. Um, and indeed, in, at least at the gene expression level, we are seeing an increase in TSLP expression in the epidermis of these mice, as well as an increase in uh, skin uh, antimicrobial peptides that are produced in the sebum and are, are regulated downstream of TSLP. Uh, so this is at least, we haven't causatively determined a role of TSLP in this model, but it's at least consistent with this being a key regulator of that interplay uh, between uh, skin lipid metabolism and adipose. But given that we were seeing a substantial contribution from systemic metabolism, we hypothesized that if we were to provide excess dietary lipid, that we might be able to mitigate some of the phenotypes that we're seeing in our skin-specific ACLY knockout mice. And so the experiment that we did was to gavage olive oil into our uh, double knockout animals after tamoxifen uh, induction of deletion. And Pretty remarkably, you can see that administering uh, tamoxifen, we just did three gavages over the course of this experiment, we're able to largely stabilize the body weight of these double knockout mice. Um, and you can see that the histology of adipose tissue is greatly normalized as well. And importantly, this results in uh, not a complete rescue of the phenotype in the epidermis, but a substantial improvement in the epidermal thickening phenotype, um, and at least a partial rescue of that triglyceride pool uh, within the epidermis. You can see that, that with the olive oil administration, we actually increase that triglyceride pool in both the wild type and the knockout animals, and, and we're seeing that come back close to what we're seeing in the wild type. Interestingly, there is no rescue of the ceramide chain links. Um, by olive oil, that makes sense because we're still not providing um, acetyl-CoA uh, directly, and, and it typically think that if you were to catabolize that, that uh, those fatty acids 
that would generate a mitochondrial pool of acetyl-CoA and would still require ACLY in order to uh, generate that acetyl-CoA and malonyl-CoA that would then would be used for fatty acid elongation. So uh, I think it's interesting that despite the fact that we're not rescuing uh, the very long chain fatty acid ceramides, we're able to in produce a significant rescue of uh, the epidermal thickness. Okay, but can we take this to a context um, in which we're manipulating only ACLY, and what is the interplay then with dietary lipids? Because probably in a, in a context in which we would be targeting ACLY therapeutically, ACSS2 would be intact. And so we've done this in our skin-specific ACLY knockouts. Um, these animals actually do not lose weight in contrast to the double knockouts, but if we now put them on a zero-fat diet, you can see that now uh, they do show reduced body weight as compared to the wild-type animals, and the epidermal thickening phenotype is exacerbated. And reciprocally, we can go the other way uh, with our whole body knockout. Uh, now, if we put these animals on a high-fat diet, you can see that uh, the knockout animals on a high-fat diet, although they do not gain as much weight as a wild-type animals do on a high-fat diet, they are resist they are, um, their weight is stable as compared to that seen on a low-fat diet. And the appearance of the epidermis is greatly, um, greatly improved and almost normalized. Uh, and I think this is, this is noteworthy uh, in terms of thinking about how a lipid metabolic inhibitor might be used in conjunction with diet, potentially to minimize toxicity. And so, to summarize, what we find is that acetyl-CoA metabolism is critical in the skin, uh, critical for generating um, very long-chain fatty acids that are needed for synthesis of ceramides that are critical for the skin barrier, and that in the absence of uh, ACLY and ACSS2, when acetyl-CoA levels uh, fall, this results in a depletion of the triglyceride pool within the epidermis, and a skewing of the ceramide pool uh, towards ceramides that now can contain long chain as opposed to very long chain fatty acids. This then triggers both cell intrinsic and systemic compensatory mechanisms. We're seeing uh, within uh, the keratinocytes an increase in proliferation, changes in differentiation, uh, and also systemic compensatory mechanisms promoting the mobilization of adipose tissue to help um, to help uh, compensate. Uh, and we also find that diet is playing a role as well uh, and can modulate these phenotypes. And so, you know, moving forward from this, we're very interested in a number of questions, including really defining the mechanisms through which acetyl-CoA synthesis, uh, loss of acetyl-CoA synthesis in the skin is triggering adipose tissue depletion, whether the fatty acids are, in addition to, you know, just rescuing specific lipid pools, are they also serving in a signaling capacity to regulate epidermal differentiation and homeostasis, um, and in their absence to trigger adaptation? We're interested in whether the types of fats will impact rescue. We've really only tried um, olive oil in terms of the specific gavage experiments, um, but I think this could be very interesting to consider in the future. And, uh, you know, ideally, this, this is, I think, very interesting to think about in terms of how to combine diet with lipid metabolic inhibitors to minimize toxicity. And it's worth pointing out that fat, fatty acid synthase inhibitors are in clinical trials now for treating cancer. Um, and one of the major side effects that are being seen there uh, are skin uh, disorders, including skin dryness and alopecia. So. Um, dietary manipulations might be of interest to, to look at in that setting. And so I just want to thank the people that have been involved with this work, and in particular Fung, uh, shown right here, who has really led up this project. Um, and thank you to our collaborators uh, as well, Clementina in particular for the lipidomics, and Brian Capel, who's a dermatologist and physician scientist at Penn, who's been really helpful in teaching me a lot about the skin. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Talk. Any questions? Any quick questions for Catherine? We have one in the very back. <laughs> While the microphone is going there, I can quickly yes. maybe ask something. Yeah, the, the, oh, very, yeah nice, uh, very nice, very uh, nice yes. talk, and thank you very much for oh, yeah. 
highlighting the, the importance of skin in, uh, and methylene in addition to protecting us. So uh, the question I have, there are actually two simple ones. Uh, the, low, the decrease in triglyceride levels was very, very clear. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to know what happened to this enzyme DGAT, which is really involved in triglyceride biosynthesis, and also whether there were changes uh, in cholesterol levels. In, in the yes, so um, there were not major changes in cholesterol levels. Um, and in terms of DGAT, I'd have to look back at our RNA-seq to see if we saw changes in DGAT. We definitely saw a perturbation of a number of different metabolic enzymes. I can't remember specifically about DGAT, um, but I can share with you, uh, you know, in more detail if you'd like uh, some of our uh, gene expression data from those models. There's a lot of lipid metabolism changes taking place there. Thank you. There are a lot of questions, but we only have time for one more, maybe from where close by. So. <laughs> There's one there, um, but then for everyone else, please find Catherine later on. I also have a lot of questions, too. <laughs> Hi, uh, great talk. Um, I really appreciate that you're looking at the different types of fats in the diet. As somebody with a nutrition background, and I love looking at diet, have you considered um, the role of uh, the disruptions in acetyl-CoA uh, how it may affect B vitamins and uh, methyl vitamin uh, metabolism as it's quite directly tied and it's known to be shown with functional B vitamin deficiency can actually lead to skin uh, disorders very similar to what you've seen, mm. which you're seeing. Um, have you just looked into that a little bit? We haven't looked into that at all. That's a, a really great point and uh, we'd love to chat with you about it some more. Yeah. It was also great to see how Vaseline and olive oil can change your, you know, appearance quite a bit, potentially. Um, so next, uh, we have uh, Brendan Manning from Harvard, where he's a professor and acting chair of um, Molecular Metabolism Department at Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Uh, Brandon's research is focusing currently on PI3K and mTOR signaling network and how it controls cell growth of metabolism. And for this work, he has recently been awarded also an Outstanding Investigator Award from Na National Cancer Institute. We're very interested in seeing uh, all about mTOR and PI3K signaling and role in metabolism and cancer. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so I want to start by uh, thanking the uh, Uker family and the Uker Foundation and uh, my longtime colleague uh, from Harvard, uh, Gokhan, for this wonderful invitation. Um, I was here seven years ago and uh, really great memories and uh, just, uh, you know, resurrecting a lot of those memories now. So. Um, <clears throat> So uh, today, I, my, my interest is really in uh, um, understanding the interface of cellular signaling networks and the control of metabolism. And in particular, we're very interested in understanding the role, uh, the regulation and function of mTOR complex one and its control of biomass production. So uh, mTOR is really key for controlling the balance between anabolic and catabolic metabolism. So in the presence of uh, sufficient nutrients and energy, mTOR drives anabolic processes to produce macromolecules while at the same time suppressing the turnover of those macromolecules in, into their nutrient and energy components. And in, in doing so, it controls uh, uh, biomass production, which uh, most historically 
uh, controls cell growth, but also plays very uh, interesting uh, tissue-specific functions, which we're trying to understand now. Um, so a, a lot of what our lab has done is to really understand what underlies these arrows and blocks for control of metabolism. And what I want to really focus on today is what controls mTOR complex 1 and how this impacts both cellular and systemic metabolism. And our, our interest there is really focused on uh, an upstream break on uh, mTOR complex 1 that needs to be relieved in order to activate mTORC1. And most signals that regulate uh, mTORC1, either turn it on or turn it off, um, either apply or relieve this break on the system. And this, this complex, this protein complex, referred to as the TSC complex, is comprised of these three components here, TSC2, TSC1, and TBC1D7. And the, the key functional domain on this complex is a gap domain at the C-terminus of TSC2, which serves as a gap for a small RAS-related small, small G protein called REB, which is an essential upstream activator of mTOR complex 1. So the way that the TSC complex inhibits mTOR1 is by acting as a gap for REB. Uh, my interest in this, uh, this uh, complex, in, this, in mTOR complex 1 in general, really came from uh, my postdoctoral work in the discovery of AKT phosphorylating TSC2. Um, this was before we even knew that the TSC complex was regulating TOR. Um, and so what I really want to focus on today is the regulation and function of these phosphorylation sites and how these manifest themselves um, in, in vivo, uh, especially, and how mTOR complex 1 is playing a role in vivo. Um, and so this is the primary mechanism by which insulin, IGF-1, and many other growth signals um, activate mTOR complex 1, and it's, th it's through uh, phosphorylation and inhibition of the TSC complex, thereby relieving that break on mTOR complex 1 and allowing its activation. <clears throat> so this is really the, the mechanism by which exogenous signals regulate uh, mTOR complex 1. Uh, there are, is another system of small G proteins uh, that, that merge on the, the RAG proteins in which uh, uh, the mTOR complex 1 is sensitive to changes in the local environment, the local nutrient environment, um, really with one of the most important signals being um, amino acid availability since mTOR complex 1 is a major uh, promoter of protein synthesis, so it, it's very sensitive to to depletion of amino acids. And that pathway really goes through, through the RAG uh, GDPases, uh, through, a, through a rather complex pathway that has largely been worked out from the, the work of David Sabatini's lab. Um, and so I want to just start by talking a little bit about how these two systems are integrated. So in, by, by integrating both extracellular uh, signals and intracellular signals, TOR has the ability to sense both the local nutrient environment and uh, signals that often reflect the nutrient status of the organism. Um, the classic example being, being insulin, which increases in response to, uh, to blood glucose levels. And so the, the primary place where mTOR complex 1 is activated, and the, really the only established place where mTOR complex 1 is activated, is on the surface of the lysosome. Um, and so I'm not showing how uh, the amino acid sensing branch works. This does not work from our lab, except to say that when amino acids are, are abundant in the cell, um, these RAG proteins take on a uh, nucleotide binding state where the RAG A subunit is GTP bound, and its heterodimer partner, RAG C or D, is GDP bound, and, and what this does is create a docking site for mTOR complex 1 at the lysosomal surface. Uh, and there's other uh, proteins and protein complexes involved, which, which I won't get into. However, engagement of mTOR complex 1 with the RAG proteins on the surface of the lysosome is not sufficient to activate mTOR complex 1. You need REB, and you need REB to be in its GTP bound form to, to activate mTOR complex 1. And as I said, this is controlled by insulin and other growth factors. And so what we found a number of years ago is that the TSC complex also resides at the lysosomal surface where and you can see this by co-localization with lysosomal markers or co-localization with REB itself. And if you acutely stimulate cells with, uh, with nutrients, uh, with, I should say with growth factors uh, as well as insulin, you acutely stimulate a loss of this localization uh, to, to the lysosomal surface. 
and this is just scored with a time course here. Uh, and this really happens within the first few minutes. You get um, a dissociation of the TSC complex from uh, REB at the lysosomal surface. We believe this allows REB to become GTP loaded and, and therefore bind to and directly activate mTOR complex one. So this regulation requires PI3 kinase activation and AKT activation, and it requires the five phosphorylation sites on TSC2. So uh, if we reconstitute TSC2 deficient cells with either wild type TSC2 or a mutant that lacks the five phosphorylation sites on AKT, you can really, really see uh, the effects of this phosphorylation on localization. Um, if you stimulate the, the wild type reconstituted cells with insulin, you stimulate release of the TSC complex from the lysosomal surface. This promotes TOR activation as scored by a number of different downstream markers. However, uh, the ability of insulin to remove the TSC complex from the lysosomal surface is blocked when you reconstitute the cells with tsc 2 5 a mutant. And again, the ability of insulin to activate TOR signaling is defective. Um, so this is all in cell culture, and I should say that almost everything we know about, uh, about TOR signaling by both the amino acid sensing branch and growth factor signaling and insulin signaling is really comes from mechanistic studies in cell culture. Uh, and so where we're, where we're moving towards is trying to understand what the physiological importance of this, uh, of this regulation is and how this regulation plays out um, in vivo. And so um, what I want to talk about today are, are really two uh, pieces of unpublished work. One that is a bit theoretical in talking about uh, uh, the molecular regulation of, of this complex, and we're really trying to understand how phosphorylation of the TSC complex uh, triggers this, uh, mechanistically triggers this release from the lysosomal surface. I should say that we believe this is the primary way in which mTOR complex one becomes activated in human cancers. Uh, so mTOR complex one uh, is genetically activated in most human cancers due to, uh, due to promotion of upstream oncogenic signaling pathways, such as the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. And we think the primary way in which mTOR complex one becomes activated in cancer is through chronic dissociation of the TSC complex from, from the lysosomal surface. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the TSC complex and its molecular regulation and then move on to some uh, physiological and pathological consequences where we've tried to understand the role of this regulation in vivo. <clears throat> and so uh, a few years back uh, in, in 2021, uh, we, were, we were actually working on the cryo-EM structure of the TSC complex when this paper came out um, that really showed quite a remarkable uh, structure for, for the TSC protein complex. Um, this is a partial structure, and it really indicated that this, the, the stoichiometry of the complex are two TSC2 molecules which come together on a head-to-head -head basis. So the N terminus of one TSC, TSC2 molecule is here, and the C terminus is here, and the, the N terminus of the other one is here, and the C terminus is here. So these are really coming together in a head-to-head -head, uh, fashion where the gap domain, uh, one gap domain is kind of facing out towards the audience, and is in red, and the other gap domain is in green and is facing into the screen. So these are on opposite sides of, of the complex. And this is really all scaffolded together by a coil-coil domain on TSC1. And then there's a single TBC1D7 molecule that also engages the coil-coil on TSC1. Uh, what's remarkable about this, this structure um, is that it's a, it's a very, very much a partial structure of the complex. So, um, a lot of TSC2 has been resolved, but there's a lot of, of regions that are unresolved, and only the coil-coil domain of, of TSC1 was resolved, um, and only a partial part of the coil-coil domain. But regardless of that, uh, the structure, even in its partial state, is very long. It's 40 nanometers in length. This is uh, kind of approaching the size of some kinesins. Um, so it's, it's quite large, uh, and again, most of TSC1 is unresolved, and we, we really don't know what it looks like at this point. Um, this is really, but this structure has really been informative for us. Um, if we take the, the core structure of a single TSC2 molecule um, from this uh, structure of the complex, we see that it has this large uh, uh, domain that is uh, really a solenoid, uh, and it's a, just a series of heat repeats. 
uh, followed by a small region that has uh, beta sheets. Uh, that, that, that is a beta sheet that, that these uh, investigators call the dimerization domain. This is where the two TSE2 molecules come together. And then the highly conserved gap domain on TSE2. And again, this is what's resolved in, um, in this uh, structure. If we overlay this structure with the fission yeast TSE2, we see that almost a perfect overlay of fission yeast TSE2 with this, uh, this uh, TSE2 that's resolved in the cryo-EM structure. And so I think what this is telling us is that the, what the cryo-EM structure is resolving is the, the basic core structure of the TSC complex. Uh, and so if you, if, you, if you look at the yeast structure, it really is just what's resolved uh, in the cryo-EM structure. Um, however, if you look at human uh, TSC2, and here we're modeling this with AlphaFold, um, and we're, we're basically, we basically see that there's a large number of unstructured regions um, that don't resolve in the cryo-EM because they're probably flexible, uh, but, that, but that lie outside of this core structure. And interestingly enough, this is where these phosphorylation sites are uh, that AKT phosphorylates. So uh, there's two, two sites on loop one, uh, two sites on loop two, and one site on loop three. And so we've just numbered the loops. Uh, which are the, these loops here. There's a loop here. There's actually a loop in between the, this uh, conserved region, and then there's a very large loop between uh, the dimerization domain and the gap domain. Um, so the reason I'm, I'm telling you this is we, we think it's very interesting in considering the evolution of TSC2. Um, so if you, if you look in phosphocyte, uh, this is a very useful database for those of you who don't know what it is, but it basically summarizes data from, uh, from all phosphoproteomic uh, uh, screens as well as kind of more uh, mechanistic uh, uh, one-off uh, uh, analyses of kinase substrate interactions. Um, there are 76 phosphorylation sites on TSE2. This is a very heavily phosphorylated protein. Uh, we only know which kinases phosphorylate a, a, a small number of these residues, but 70% of the phosphorylation sites that have been mapped on TSC2 reside on these loops uh, rather than the core structure. And so we think this tells us a lot about the evolution of TSC2. Uh, and if you look at these loops uh, in an evolutionary tree, you see, so what, what we're showing here are the lengths of the loops normalized to the human TSC2, uh, and it's also the, the, the uh, homology relative to the human TSC2. You can see that these loops all exist in mammals, they exist in, in, in lower vertebrates, um, they even exist in the, the most simple of, of metazoans, but they're completely absent in fungi. Um, and so, what we th and, and if you look at the, the, the core structure, um, it's really the, this core structure that's resolved in the cryo-EM structure that's, that's uh, conserved um, in, uh, in, in, in throughout evolution. And so we think that this core structure is really um, kind of evolutionarily constrained where these loops are more flexible in their ability to evolve. And so we think that uh, these loops really evolved with multicellularity and uh, they evolved in metazoans to receive distinct signals in distinct organisms. Um, and so we really think that these, these loops serve to integrate different signals that have to regulate mTOR complex one and regulate metabolism um, in, in, in various ways. <clears throat> okay, so I want to uh, move on to uh, discuss uh, kind of what, why we care about this and, and what this means for um, regulation of mTOR complex one in, in organisms. <clears throat> and so um, here I'm just showing the, the core structure of the, of the signaling network again. Um, this is really a, a, a gross over, oversimplification of, of how this pathway uh, actually looks. Um, there are many other signals that regulate TOR, and again, I'm just showing a few of them here, that regulate TOR, at least in part, by changing the function of the TSC complex, either activating it, for instance, in response to energy stress to inhibit TOR, or inhibiting the TSC complex to activate TOR, such as with the RAS, RAF, ERK pathway. Um, and importantly, there are a large number of the most common oncogenes and tumor suppressors in human cancers 
that lie in the network upstream of the, that, that converge on the TSC complex for regulation of mTOR complex one. And mTOR complex one is really believed to be apparently activated in the majority of human cancers where we, we think it, it contributes to driving uh, tumor cell metabolism by, by driving this uh, anabolic program. And so uh, a lot of these uh, kinases that, that regulate mTOR complex one do so by phosphorylating distinct sites on the TSC complex. So the, the TSC2 itself serves as really a, a, a signal integrating uh, hub for regulation of mTOR complex one. Um, so there are many other signals that regulate TOR uh, independent of AKT's phosphorylation of TSC2. Um, and, and there are feedback mechanisms by which regulation of mTOR complex one very strongly affects the ability of the cell to sense uh, growth factors. Uh, for instance, if you uh, delete components of the TSC complex and chronically activate mTOR1, mTORC1, you drive this program, but you also shut off the upstream part of the pathway. Uh, and the opposite occurs if you delete REB or mTOR complex 1, you, you shut off the downstream pathway, but you uh, you, you hyperactivate the upstream pathway. So these, this is really a circular pathway that uh, it makes it challenging to, to really understand the, the physiology of, of the pathway. Um, and because anything that affects the upstream part of the pathway will, will affect other targets. So, so we need to kind of uh, have more uh, precise genetic models to understand how this, uh, this seemingly linear pathway, which is not linear in any, in any fashion, uh, functions in vivo. And so, um, to make a long story short, we've generated a mouse uh, model that specifically lacks the AKT phosphorylation sites on TSC2. Um, so all the other signals that regulate TOR are intact, and all the things that the upstream pathway does are also intact. Um, they're perhaps a bit hyperactive, but, uh, but, these, but we're really just specifically breaking the signal from insulin to TOR and to see what happens. Um, the first surprise really came from this slide here in that uh, we really had no overt developmental phenotype. Um, I fully expected these animals to be embryonic lethal. Um, really what this is saying is that insulin and IGF-1, uh, particularly IGF-1, does not really need to signal to TOR during development. Um, and so these mice are born, they're born at Mendelian ratios and again, we spent a long time making these in a conditional manner because we thought that they would be embryonic lethal, but it turns out they're not. So what I want to share with you uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes are, is uh, what the phenotype of the whole body um, mouse is. So we, we can do tissue specifics, uh, but I won't share that with you today. I'll talk just about, a little, about some of the phenotypes that we revealed in these studies. Um, the first uh, is that, not surprisingly, they're smaller, um, but they're not smaller in stature or length. They're smaller in body weight. And specifically, they have a reduced uh, lean mass. Um, so this is specifically due to a reduction in, uh, in, in uh, <clears throat> should say, in skeletal muscle mass. Um, and this can be seen here if you, if you look at uh, muscle fiber size by cross area section, um, you see about a 10% decrease in, uh, in muscle fiber size. Um, if you look at TOR signaling in the muscle, so I should say that in, in all uh, kind of insulin responsive tissues like skeletal muscle, uh, TOR signaling is very sensitive to fasting and feeding cycles as, as one might predict. So under fasted states, it's off and uh, in response to feeding, it's strongly activated. And here we're just scoring a, a useful marker of, of mTOR uh, signaling uh, phosphorus 6. Um, you can see in the wild type animals, you see this very, very strong activation. We're just looking at two different muscle stations here, the gastroc and the quad. Uh, in the 5A animals, this signal is very strongly uh, uh, decreased, and this is just quantified here. Uh, <clears throat> if we isolate um, uh, myocytes from these uh, myoblasts and, and differentiate them into myotubes uh, from, from these mice, we see that um, really the, and then stimulate them with insulin, the ability of insulin to activate TOR is broken in the 5A animals, and the ability of insulin to promote uh, protein synthesis is also uh, greatly decreased. So we get about a 25% decrease in um, protein synthesis in the 5A animals. And we think this 
is really what underlies this, this uh, decrease in lean mass. Um, we also see a decrease in brain size. So these, these mice have uh, microcephaly. This is due to a decrease in cortical thickening that's really um, can, be, can be seen uh, also by a decrease in TOR signaling in the neurons, the cortical neurons, uh, between the wild type and the 5As. Um, if we isolate primary neurons from these mice, we see something very similar uh, to what we saw uh, in the, the myocytes or the myotubes. Uh, in that the, the ability of BDNF or IGF-1 to activate TOR is really uh, severely blunted. And of course, these, uh, these neurons themselves are smaller. Um, so we're in the process of making a neuron-specific as well as a muscle-specific um, model now to try to understand if these are completely cell-intrinsic effects. Um, although, uh, by isolating primary cells from these tissues, we, we believe that uh, these are indeed cell intrinsic uh, defects in the ability of exogenous signals to regulate TOR. <clears throat> okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, really the first metabolic phenotype we detected in these animals. Um, really, the, the, at the earliest age that we, we did this, and this is again on a normal chow diet, we see that these animals are glucose intolerant. And the, the, the glucose intolerance doesn't really get that much worse with age, um, but they're glucose intolerant really from the earliest time we can look at this. But they're, they have normal insulin tolerance. <clears throat> so this alone, this kind of glucose intolerance combined with normal insulin tolerance uh, started to point us towards uh, perhaps a defect in uh, the, the islets uh, in pancreatic beta cells. Um, and indeed, if we uh, inject insulin into wild-type animals and then measure blood glucose, uh, blood insulin levels 15 minutes later, we see uh, that, 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 that insulin levels appropriately increase in response to a glucose challenge. Um, however, these, uh, these animals, which are already a little bit hyperinsulinemic, that really reflects um, a hyperglycemia that we see, uh, especially under fasting uh, in these animals, um, they're really defective in the response to glucose stimulation. Um, this can also be seen uh, with the time course here that the acute release of insulin that we see in the wild types is severely blunted in the 5As. And we see a very similar effect if we do a glucose, um, if we do uh, oral uh, glucose delivery. So um, this, in its, th this phenotype really was not entirely surprising in that we, uh, there's a lot of literature on the TOR pathway regulating beta cell mass. So if you, if you chronically activate TOR by deleting TSC1 or TSC2 in the beta cells, you get enlarged beta cells that produce a lot of insulin. If you knock out REB in the beta cells, you get smaller islets that produce very little insulin. And if you knock out an essential component of mTOR complex one, the same thing happens. You get smaller islets and less insulin production. So really, we think developmentally, TOR regulates beta cell mass and therefore uh, the amount of insulin that's produced. However, in our TSC2 5A model, we see no defect in beta cell mass. Uh, they have normal levels of insulin. Uh, they have normal, uh, normal beta cell mass. Um, and uh, the amount of total insulin in the pancreas is, is really normal between wild type and 5As. So there's something else going on, and really pointing to the fact that perhaps there's a defect in the ability to sense glucose um, in the beta cells themselves. And so to look at this, we isolated primary islets, um, and, this was, and, and then looked, first of all, at TOR signaling. So not surprisingly, the 5As don't have phosphorylation of TSC2. Uh, however, they also lose uh, uh, TOR signaling, as seen here by a decrease in phospho-SXK or a downshift in 4-EBP1, two targets of mTOR complex 1. So there's a, there's a break on the ability to regulate TOR um, in these islets. And importantly, the defect we see on glucose-stimulated insulin release is islet intrinsic. So if we isolate uh, primary islets from these, these animals, we see that going from low glucose to high glucose stimulates insulin release. Uh, but in the wild types, but not in the 5A. However, these islets have plenty of insulin. Uh, if we stimulate uh, insulin granule release with uh, KCL, we see kind of normal release um, with it within these islets. 
So this is really my last data slide. <clears throat> um, what we think is going on uh, is uh, kind of related to what is canonically believed to be the mechanism of, um, of glucose-stimulated insulin release, and that's that, that high glucose through glucose catabolism and ATP production is really the trigger for glucose-stimulated insulin, uh, glucose -stimulated insulin release. So uh, at face value, our data is suggesting that perhaps high glucose influences the PI3 kinase AKT pathway and phosphorylation of TSE2, and that mTOR complex 1 acutely regulates glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. Now, we're not sure if this is true. Um, we're, we will know, actually, in the next week or two. Um, another alternative explanation is that signaling through the insulin IGF-1 PI3K AKT pathway to TOR is really essential to set up uh, glucose metabolism in the beta cells such that it can sense this, this uh, increase of, of glucose from low glucose to high glucose. In this case, what TOR would be doing in that scenario is establishing the beta cells to, to be able to sense glucose. And we think that this is just as likely, if, if not more likely, than, um, than the first scenario where, where the, the glucose is really signaling through the TOR pathway to stimulate insulin release. So just to summarize um, what we're doing now with these animals, um, really just starting off on, on a lot of these studies, uh, trying to understand its role in physiology and obesity, its role in cancer. Um, we're, we're crossing, for instance, we're crossing these animals to uh, cancer models that are driven by PI3 kinase AKT signaling, such as P10 heterozygous mice. Um, and we're also very interested in understanding uh, the role in aging. We think that these mice are a very interesting model to study, uh, to study longevity. Um, and then uh, we, we're doing a number of tissue-specific models, uh, all of which are underway, uh, beta cell-specific, myocyte-specific, uh, hepatocyte-specific, and, and neuronal-specific. Um, I just want to thank those involved in this work. Really, the, the, this has been, uh, we've been trying to make these mice for about 15 years. Um, but Jan Cormoray is the postdoc, the current postdoc, that uh, um, has kind of taken these to the finish line, and now, we, now most of the lab is actually working on, on these mice uh, in various models. So, uh, and I, I should point out that uh, this work really could not have been done without the help of the Sabri Ucker Center and Gokhan's lab, um, and particularly Karen and Casey were really instrumental in, uh, in helping us characterize these animals, and still are. So. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Maybe if you have a burning question. Um, Brendan, thank you for this very interesting talk. I have two very quick questions. The first one is about this um, conservation of the loop region, which mm -hmm. is disordered based on alcohol predictions yeah. across um, Vertebrates, did you try to do swaps between fish and? We have. We actually have just recently made a uh, mutant that has uh, replaced the Pombi sequences, which are very short sequences. Uh, we've removed all three loops and, placed the, and replaced them with the Pombi sequences. They, that, it folds into the TSC complex just fine. Um, and uh, we're just starting to understand the phenotype now. Uh, at least in cell culture models, it doesn't seem to regulate mTORC1. So if we, okay. if we rescue TSC2 null cells with that mutant, it doesn't suppress TOR. Okay. So there's still a lot of things we need to do. Localization yeah. is a major one, uh, but also measure the gap activity. There's no reason to believe yeah. the gap activity would be affected, but... Yeah, there, that might explain if that has really species-specific evolved. Yeah. The second question is about the TSC2 um, serotonin mice, that you didn't see any defect in embryonic Developments, but mm -hmm. I was wondering, um, considering the involvement of mTOR in diapause embryonic dormancy, yeah. which goes in the line of aging at the same time, right? Did you challenge nutritionally the pregnant mice to see if they would perform better at diapause or not? Maybe that's the we, embryonic phenotype yeah, that you cannot see normally. Yeah, we haven't we haven't done that. Um, it's an interesting interesting experiment. Um, my feeling about the the embryogenesis in general is that 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 signaling access just isn't, it just isn't critical. I mean, the, the fact that these mice are born and are relatively normal really suggests that we are just modulating one input into this pathway. 
um, and the other, the other inputs, nutrients and everything. And maybe nutrients are really the key signal um, during embryogenesis, uh, and that you don't that the, that the insulin IGF-1 signal is less important. But uh, these are all experiments to be done. Yeah. Thank you. you can augment uh, nutrient stimulated yeah we have we have not done that um, we've the, the you know the closest thing we've done it is, is is the oral glucose but we we haven't we haven't tried uh, to overcome it in other ways yeah all right thank you As our final speaker of the session, we have uh, Matthew van der Heiden, who is an MD, PhD, and currently the director of Koch Institute uh, for Integrative Cancer Research and a professor at the Department of Biology in MIT. So his focus is, uh, on, is on the role of metabolism in cancer and this tumor interaction, especially uh, with tumor growth and intermediate, intermediate metabolism. And I think his interest in biochemistry of metabolism even led him to biochemistry of food, where he actually had a stint as a referee in Big Chefs together with uh, uh, Gyal So it's also a very interesting story that I want to hear more about later as well. <laughs> All right. Uh -oh. He's back. OK, great. Um, so first of all, I want to thank Ocon for the very kind introduction to be here, first time to, uh, to Turkey, and I'm, I'm really um, enjoying the, the, the opportunity to be here. I also want to thank the uh, Sabri Ilker Foundation um, for making all of this possible. I've really enjoyed the meeting so far. Okay, so here are my disclosures. All right, so my group has been interested for a very long time in understanding how metabolism works in cancer, and, and we've largely been focused in two areas. Most of our work has really been focusing on the cancer cell and the tumor itself, and really what are the tumor cell intrinsic mechanisms that determine how it is that nutrients are used and really support the growth of a tumor. But a second interest, which you know, fits my uh, sort of love of physiology, is how this interacts with other aspects of the whole body, which of course have complex interactions with the tumor itself. Now, one thing that maybe makes our work a bit different from a lot of what else um, we've heard about here is that, is that we've really been interested in how the metabolic pathways themselves, that is, what determines which, nut which nutrients are used, how they're used differently across different cancers, and how this might influence cancer phenotypes, which is, of course, a step downstream of many of the upstream signaling interactions that um, also um, have clear impacts on these processes. And I thought what I would do is tell you about today is really focus on, on two stories, both of them unpublished. One of them that really is focusing on how looking at and trying to understand um, determinants of where tumors can grow might lead us to um, insight into metastasis, something very important for cancer progression, and then turn to a separate phenotype that we have that's really looking at how interactions with um, the whole body might be supplying various nutrients to support the growth of the tumor. Now, by way of introduction, um, if you'll just accept for a minute that work from many, many people has shown that how cancers solve their metabolic problems, that is how cancers decide which nutrients to use, has really led many to the uh, recognition that different cancers do metabolism differently, which leads to a very clear question about what determines why different cancers do metabolism in different ways. And like most cancer phenotypes, most people have focused on thinking about how it is that various um, uh, genetic mutations and genetic changes in cancer might lead to impact on metabolism. And beautiful work from many, many groups have shown how altering oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes can affect signaling pathways that have clear effects on, on metabolism. 
However, work from groups has also found that other things influence how cancers do metabolism, including where the cancer comes from, what I'm referring to here as lineage, as well as which nutrients are in the, in the environment. It's this changes in nutrients in the environment that is probably most impacted by, by whole animal physiology and things like, like diet. Now, one way to conceptualize all this, and some of the best evidence that lineage might be as in important, is really work from groups that have asked a very simple question, and that's simply asking, what is it that determines which metabolic genes are expressed in different cancers? That is, do cancers show a metabolic gene expression that is cancer, or does it look more like normal tissues? And it turns out that you can actually tell where a cancer came from simply looking at what metabolic genes are expressed. And this is because cancers largely retain the metabolic enzymes that are found in the tissue where they come from. Now, the way we've interpreted this data is as follows, and that is we think that different tissues in our body obviously do different metabolism and therefore developmentally are wired to do metabolism in a way that allows you to be a liver or an islet cell or a brain or whatever tissue we have. Now, it could have been when you transform that you somehow now collapse to some common proliferative program that's found in all tissues. But that's not what the data says. Rather, it appears that you retain the metabolic um, um, lineage or the metabolic gene expression of where you came from, alter it in some way with a genetic mutation, and now this creates some new metabolic network that now is no longer wired to help you be a liver, but now, say, adapted in a way that now allows you to do uncontrolled proliferation. Now, of course, this enzyme simply defined the metabolic network itself. And if you take a metabolic network and you put it in an environment like tissue culture media where many people study cancer, it's now going to look very, very flexible. But the reality is, is that cancers arise in environments where not all nutrients are available. And this has led us to hypothesize that it's perhaps the constraints by the nutrients that are found within tissues on the unique metabolic network of each tumor cell that ultimately determines how it is that cancers um, are limited and have specific nutrients to grow. And really, looking at this interaction between environment and the cancer um, is really where I want to start off telling you about some of the data today. Now, one way that we have been working to look at what nutrients are found in different environments was really work that was spearheaded by Mark Sullivan and Alex Muir, former student and former postdoc, who basically adapted old methods to isolate interstitial fluid from various tissues. This is an experiment published a couple of years ago where they took interstitial fluid from a pancreatic cancer. This is arising in the same mouse model we, you heard alluded to this morning and compared it to blood in the same mice. And this is just quantitative mass spec and it just basically shows that the nutrients that are found in blood are different than the nutrients that are found within the interstitial fluid in a tissue. Now, we've now repeated this experiment now across many normal tissues as well as tumor tissues. And I think a, a great summary is shown by an experiment here that we did in collaboration with, with Kim Rathmill's lab, where we got interstitial fluid from normal kidney or kidney cancer or plasma from patients. And what you can see is similar to what Mark and Alex found, is that what's in the blood is different than what's in the tissue. But what they found is, is that what is in the normal tissue and what is in the tumor tissue are not all that different which actually is suggesting to us what we think, just to summarize lots of data, is it appears that different tissues in our bodies have different nutrients available within them, and this is largely not something that's affected by the tumor. In other words, the tumor has to adapt to the environment to grow in a tissue rather than control its own environment, which is what led us to think about metastasis. Now, if there's any cancer biologists in the audience, much work on metastasis recently with advent and sequencing is really focused on the genetic, the clonal events that may or may not allow cancer cells to grow in different places. But of course, there's tons of evidence by the fact that cancers have these stereotype locations that they like to metastasize to, that perhaps something in the soil is also contributing to where tumors can metastasize. And this has led us that if each if each tissue has its own unique um, um, nutrient environment, perhaps accessing the right nutrient environments may be some barrier to metastasis. And this is something that we in our group have been very interested in testing. In fact, I've had numerous postdocs over the years who have joined my group to ask exactly this question. And what they've done is they've taken various things like mouse models of pancreas cancer, 
can take cells from those models and, or look at natural metastases and plant them to all kinds of different places in a mouse, and then ask, how does the metabolic um, um, phenotype dish, differ between the primary tumor and the various metastatic sites? Now, many groups have, have, have started doing this, and there's now a number of nice papers out there that have described various metabolic events that allow you to grow in different tissues. Although I have to say, a great summary of what we have found is actually shown here. So this is the same fancy metabolic tracing that's been done by all three of these postdocs. They effectively took C13 labeled glucose in this experiment, infused it into the mouse, and asked how it distributed across normal tissues. If you just look at these, you see three bars are the same and two are different. The two that are different are the normal tissues. The three that are same are the primary, in this case, pancreas tumor, as well as um, a, a metastatic site, the liver, or the subcutaneous space, a place that a lot of people do cancer models. And what was frustrating for these postdocs was is that over and over again, we saw much more similarities between the tumor and the metastasis than we saw differences. Now, I find this interesting because, of course, humans that have metastatic cancer, if they're treated with drugs, they tend to respond in all sites. So there has to be some similarities between sites. And this is at least exciting if there's some barrier to grow in different locations that have to do with accessing the right nutrient environment. However, it's very frustrating if you're a postdoc because, of course, it's very difficult to publish that things are the same. It's much easier to publish a paper that says that things are different, which is a bit, I think, of a publication bias in the literature. But nonetheless, Sharanya Sivanin, the current postdoc in the lab who um, was trained by one of our earlier speakers, she did her graduate work with, with Katie Wellen, um, I have to give her a lot of credit because she really took this on seriously, where she was working in mouse models of pancreas cancer and really tried to address the possibility that perhaps there was similarities to grow on all of these different sites. Now, the way Sharanya approached this is she actually did an experiment that, shockingly, we could not find having been done in the literature. And that is most people who study cancer metastasis ask the question about can you metastasize to various places. But what Sharanya wanted to ask was not could you get to places, but if you took the sort of extravasation and survival in the blood out of the equation and simply injected cells in different locations, how well it is, is it that cells grow in each place? That is, do they have a preference to grow in any site? And how is that affected by whether or not they came from a primary tumor or a metastasis? So the way Sharanya did this is she basically isolated cells from um, the, uh, uh, the, the KRAS P53 driven mouse model of pancreas cancer, one that many in the field use, um, that either had a natural liver or lung metastases. So she took cells from all of these sites, took the same number of cells and injected them into different locations, waited a defined period of time, and simply looked at how the big the tumors are. Now, the first thing I'll point out is that if you throw these cells in culture, there's really no difference. You can't tell any difference between them. They grow at the same rate. Their metabolism looks identical. However, what she found when she did her sort of quantitative transplantation assays was actually pretty striking, at least to me, and very surprising. So the first finding was is that no matter where you came from, all cells grew in all locations. But where you preferred to grow was not even close. They all formed gram, gram and a half size tumors within the pancreas in the time frame that she did her experiments, where she got tumors in all other organs, but the tumors in the other organs were so small, she couldn't even dissect them and accurately weigh them. So what I'm showing you here is actually the mass of the organ plus the tumor compared to a healthy mouse organ, which is not a fair comparison. But I can tell you, there's no way these small lesions are forming gram, gram and a half size tumors in any of these other locations. In fact, she also could not tell any difference between the primary metastatic tumors when they established in these different locations in terms of, say, KI67 positivity, how fast they, they can grow. The next experiment Sharanya did is she did a fitler masage like experiment where she effectively took cells and passaged them repeatedly to select for growth within various organs. That is, she took like longer liver mets and passaged them multiple times through mice and then repeated her experiment and got exactly the same result. That is, all of these cells could grow on all sites, but where they preferred to grow was not even close. Again, gram and a half size tumors in the pancreas, um, got lesions in all other places, but really no real difference in preference of where they grow. 
I should point out that if she simply injects these selected cells into a location in a mouse, they will better find the new location. That is, they can now better get to the liver or lung. So we can repeat exactly what's been shown in the literature. But nonetheless, is this was quite striking because it's hard to adapt cells away from this. They really love to grow in the pancreas much more than they like to grow in other sites. Now, I want to say, like, I, we study metabolism, and I'd like to think that this is metabolism, and I think it's naive to say that this is all metabolism. There could be other factors um, at play here. But there's at least some data to argue that, that metabolism may be at work. So the first thing is, this is two metabolomics experiments. This is um, basically looking at nutrient availability in the blood versus the liver, lung, and pancreas, the three sites we're looking at. And basically what this shows is what I told you earlier, that nutrient availability is different in the tissue than it is in the blood, and it's different across the different tissues. But despite having different nutrient availability across the different tissues, if you now do a different mass spec experiment and ask what is the metabolite level that's found within the tissues, you find that the metabolite levels, so the liver has different metabolite levels than the pancreas, but what we find in the tumor as well as the liver mets, actually we can't even separate by hierarchical clustering. So which this says is, is that the cancer cells or the tumors when they form have to maintain the same intracellular metabolites despite having different extracellular nutrient environments. Um, and in fact, this at least accounts for part of what's going on, because if we just reformulate nutrient environments that look like what we actually measure within the tissues, what we find is, is that they all grow quite well within the, in, in the nutrient levels that are found in the pancreas, nowhere near as well as they do nutrients in the blood, and DMEM would be way, way up here somewhere. Um, but they do this better in these other environments, which at least says that you care about the nutrients environments of where you come from, and it's not so easy to adapt away from those. We can also see this at the gene expression level. So if we just look at metabolic gene expression level, either from mouse KPC models, so KRS P53 mouse models, or human cancers, and in this case, look at primary pancreas cancer or liver metastases, the metabolic gene expression overlaps perfectly. It also overlaps quite well in human data. You'll see some liver metastatic pancreas cancers are sort of pulled here in the direction towards healthy liver, which, by the way, overlaps with HCC. And it turns out the ones that are pulled in this direction really defines how many hepatocytes are actually contaminating the sample where the gene expression was, was derived. Now, I think the real test of this, though, is that I've shown you mostly data from pancreas cancer. But the prediction would be is that if you move to a different tumor type, say a primary lung cancer or a primary liver cancer, that now the preferences should shift to be where the tumor actually comes from, not, not these different sites. It could be perhaps it's just easier to grow in the pancreas. However, this is exactly what we see. We see that if we take primary lung cancer, it has a strong preference to form big tumors, now gram-sized tumors in the lung. Lung mets from a pancreas cancer don't do so well in the, in, in the pancreas, but form gram-sized tumors in the pancreas. The lung doesn't grow so well in the pancreas, not even a normal site of lung metastases. Same is true if we look at primary liver cancer. It grows best in the liver. Um, pancreas um, grows, pancreas liver mets grow best in the pancreas. And so I think what this argues is, is that something about accessing the right nutrient environment that looks like where you came from is at least a barrier to grow in different metastatic sites, which again, I think fits with actually clinical observation. And I'll point out again, that if you treat patients with drugs, many of which target metabolism, um, at least chemotherapy drugs that target metabolism, tumors at least initially tend to respond in all sites. Now, one big exception to this is the brain. This is data that was, was uh, that from our lab that was published now a couple years ago, so I won't go through it in much detail. But some of you may be familiar with the study. Basically, we were looking at breast cancer, and we found that it looked very similar metabolically in the liver or mammary fat pad. But there was a site-specific um, um, difference to grow in the brain. And the site-specific difference we identified was that to grow in the brain, you needed to make your own fat. And the argument for this was is that lipids were simply not available within the brain. There's plenty of lipids in the brain, but not ones that are, that, that are available to, to breast cancer cells. And I should say that many other groups have also identified some site-specific um, um, growth in the brain. And again, it's interesting because where drugs fail in a specific site, it's almost always the brain. Now, many people think this is drug delivery, but there's also beautiful work from a number of groups that said that even if you deliver drugs to the brain, response is somewhat different. 
Now, at a very high level, we think what this means is, is that cancers must have a budget, and that metabolic budget must mean that they're now addicted to making certain things and accessing other things from their environment. That is, they are resource limited to the point that you can't easily switch from one thing to another. The analogy I like to give for this is, you know, graduate students find it expensive to live in Boston, and we pay them a certain salary. Now, if I give them free housing, they're gonna spend all their money on all their other things. And now if I suddenly say you have to pay for housing, they're gonna go on strike because they're not gonna be able to pay for the housing because they can't quickly switch to now suddenly get away, now pay for something that previously they got for free. And we think something similar is going on in cancer um, 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 as well. And if people are interested, I'd love to talk to you about our ongoing work to try to understand what this budget might be. Now in the last uh, 10, minutes or so that I have, I now want to turn to um, some efforts about how understanding environment and how interactions with um, um, the whole body might actually explain some other cancer metabolic phenotypes and how they might influence the growth, the growth of cancers. And this really goes back to, again, our interest in pancreas cancer. We found a number of years ago that, um, that muscle breakdown, of course, it's well known that pancreas cancer is associated with tissue loss. Many people think of this in late stage disease, work from us and some other groups have also found that, um, that this can also happen early in pancreas cancer. And I like to remind people that muscle, at least in human, well, in all organisms, is really a metabolic organ, right? We think of muscle, um, or, or th this audience probably gets this better than most people, but this is really the primary site of amino acid storage, right? We're constantly building and breaking down muscle as a way to sort of buffer amino acids for our body. So first, this is some data from our collaborator, Brian Wolpen, that this is really true in pancreas cancer, that you lose muscle early. This was a study that they did where they were able to go back um, working with um, a large database, Kaiser Permanente, on the west coast of the United States, where they were able to access CT scans of patients who got CT scans done and then happened to later be diagnosed with pancreas cancer. And then they could go back and quantitate how muscle changed from the period prior to diagnose to after diagnosis. And what they found was is that patients were losing muscle mass in a window that maybe went back as early as three years prior to their diagnosis of pancreas cancer, which really argues that muscle loss does indeed happen early in patients. Although interestingly, for the mechanism I'm gonna tell you about in mice, it actually did not matter how advanced the disease was at the time of diagnosis about whether or not you saw this phenotype. This was true if you had primary pancreas cancer with tiny lesions anywhere in the pancreas, or if you were diagnosed with widely metastatic pancreas cancer. Now we can, we can model this in mouse models. Um, I don't quite know why it's doing this. Um, I hope the AV people can help. Um, they're working on fixing it. But basically, if you, could, uh, if you could see my slide, you would see that basically we can show in mouse models where we delete KRAS and P53 with either very defined kinetics or even if we inject small, um, um, le small tumors into, into the pancreas itself, that we can actually, oh, there we go, it's better. All right that if we uh, um, can, can uh, we can get, so this, I'll just go right to this experiment, where this is where we take mouse models of, of pancreas cancer, these are pancreatic cancer cells, inject them into the tail of the pancreas, so it's very important that this is the tail, and you can see that here at four weeks, long before the mice succumb to pancreas cancer, when they actually have very small lesions, you can actually see very clear um, growth of the tumor, as well as um, tissue loss of both muscle and fat. I should point out that fat wasting is much more prominent in mice than it is in humans. Human, as humans have more prominent muscle wasting than fat wasting, which is an interesting difference between the two animals. Now, what we think the mechanism is actually goes back to, uh, to work that Laura and I published several years ago. And the key experiment for this is that the amount of tissue wasting actually depended on where we put the tumors. That is, if we put the tumors in the flank, we actually saw no tissue wasting. Whereas if we put them in the pancreas, we saw actually profound tissue wasting, both adipose tissue and muscle. And to make a long story short, what Laura found was is that just having small lesions in the pancreas, in fact, this is work that um, I'm mostly showing you data here from Yedish Giltekin, a current postdoc in the lab. Um, and Yedish can basically re repeat what Laura found. This is injecting small tumors in the pancreas, so again, 
small tumors in the tail of the pancreas, you see that you're now accumulating fecal lipids and fecal proteins. You have less lipase activity and protease activity in the tumors, and this follows the loss of adipose tissue and muscle wasting. So effectively what's going on is these mice are exocrine insufficient. Therefore, they're, no matter what they're eating, they're actually absorbing less food. This is basically like chronic low-level starvation, and we think this is what's leading to the early tissue loss and exactly why having even small lesions in the tail of the pancreas call this, cause this is a whole other question that Yadish is working on, but, but one we don't fully understand, but it does appear to be the case. And what Laura published, Yadish can also re um, um, repeat, is that if you fix this by giving pancreatic enzyme um, um, replacement, you actually make the tumors far worse. You have some effect on, on mitigating the tissue loss, but you make the tumors far worse, which at least argues that perhaps restoring nutrition is actually helping the tumors grow in some way. Now, one way to think about this is coming back to metabolism as a metabolic storage organ, and really this idea that amino acids may be a limiting factor, and perhaps what's going on is that the chronic starvation is actually leading to excess muscle breakdown, and that excess muscle breakdown might be supplying amino acids to support the tumor. At least that's the hypothesis that, that, that Yedish wanted to test. And so to test that hypothesis, what Yedish did is we went and we, uh, we, we looked for ways that we could genetically disrupt the breakdown of muscle protein under the situation where we did this. And the data that is most mature is actually by getting a, a knockout of ATG7. So we got a, a conditional allele for the essential autophagy protein, ATG7, from Eileen White. We cross it into mice that have a, um, a uh, muscle-specific Cree, so we can now delete ATG7 in the mice. These muscles are now completely deficient in autophagy um, under both fat and fasted conditions. And then we use this within a pancreas model where we either implanted pancreas um, um, tumors within the mouse or we use genetic deletion of, of, of using flip alleles in the tumor, and we get exactly the same results. So this here's the data from the implantation data. And basically, you can see that just deleting autophagy in the muscle leads to the opposite phenotype we saw before. Now we prolong survival of the mice. The tumors are smaller, and we completely fix tissue wasting. The muscle doesn't waste at all, and we even have an effect on adipose tissue wasting. We don't really fully understand the effect on adipose tissue. It could be because the tumors themselves are smaller, although what is clear here is that, is that we clearly can, by stopping muscle wasting, we actually help, help the, the mouse and hurt the tumor. Now, I should point out that we can do the same experiment in the flank, and consistent with the flank not having any tissue wasting, um, we actually see no effect here in this model of, 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 uh, of manipulating the, the muscle, which really leads us to the hypothesis that maybe what's going on is, is that as the tumor is growing, you have chronic starvation. Chronic starvation is leading to increased liberation to maintain systemic availability of amino acids, and these are necessary to support the tumor. Now, the way we can prove this is we can actually go back and say, well, let's actually, rather than block breakdown of the muscle itself, let's restore amino acids a different way by taking advantage of the fact that we can do this through the diet. And in fact, overcoming the fact that there's exocrine insufficiency, do it with elemental amino acids as a way that will sort of bypass the, 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 uh, the necessity to break these down. And it turns out if we do this, and this is an ATG7 knockout mice, so we've taken the muscle out of the equation, we can now titrate with amino acids in the diet, how big the pancreas is, and how much, um, but at all cases, having different amino acids in the diet actually suppresses the muscle wasting. And so what we think is going on is that actually you need for tumors to grow, they need to get their amino acids from somewhere. If you're chronically starved, you will now break down muscle. We think this contributes to the early muscle wasting seen in pancreas cancer. And whether or not you fix this through diet or other perturbations that directly affect the muscle will have an effect on whether or not it actually matters for the growth of the tumor. The tumor cares about the amino acids, 
the muscle wasting is to support the dietary issue in the whole body amino acid depletion. And what's interesting about this is that even whole body knockouts in cancer, this is Eileen White's work, she has found that it's actually systemic autophagy is actually required to maintain things like circulating arginine to actually support the growth of the tumor. So very consistent with uh, her findings. All right, apologies for the technical issues. And I'll just close there by thanking the people who did the work. I tried to acknowledge them around the way. The real, these are past and present members of my lab, um, but the real heroes are, are Yedish, who did the whole body work, and Sharanya, who did the metastasis work, um, our collaborators, our funding sources. And thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Um, I look forward to the rest of the meeting. That was very interesting. Do we have questions? Yes. So referring for uh, the tumors that you showed were implanted at different locations, do you know whether the inflammatory milieu in the different locations contributes to this growth difference? Yeah, so, so we can't fully rule out an effect of, of sort of immune contributions in different locations. Although we can do the very easy and obvious experiment and that's get rid of the adaptive immune system, right? There's lots of ways to get rid of T cells and it turns out that has no effect on the phenotype. We did all that work, I, I didn't, I should have said this, we did all that work in black six mice, so it's syngeneic transplants across black six mice. Interestingly, tumors grow much better as syngeneic transplants than they do in nude mice, so there's something about that that's there, but we still see exactly the same phenotypes. There's still a preference to grow in the pancreas, even if you get rid of the adaptive immune system. The now, innate. the innate immune system is a lot harder to manipulate in a tissue-specific way. If people have ideas, we'd love to work with you and come up with a way to actually do that, because there could very well be different inflammatory effects in different tissues, although it would still now have to be matched in some way to the tissue of origin because you do have this preference to grow in the other, so it can't be as, as easy as, you know, pancreatic cancer loves neutrophils unless there's always more neutrophils in the pancreas than the other sites, and we didn't look at that, but maybe that's true, but I doubt it, it's true. Mm -hmm. CDF-15 levels as a function of the different manipulations, because we know that that's a major regulator of the food intake and probably other aspects of cachexia mm -hmm. in cancer. Yeah, so we, we, we have not looked specifically at GDF-15. We've done sort of whole cytokine panels across both blood as well as a couple tissues where we've looked at. And I'll just say that our results are inconsistent, right? Sometimes we might see something, sometimes we might not. Um, you know, it's interesting. I know there's, there's, uh, there's a couple groups that have you know, challenged us that they're really eating the same amount, and I think it doesn't really matter, like certainly real human patients, what happens when you have cancer, two things happen, or could be sort of cell starvation because of exocrine insufficiency, but if you eat less, it's kind of the same phenotype anyway, so in some ways I'm a little bit agnostic how much is diet or central, like, appetite induced versus, um, versus direct effect of sort of nutrient breakdown. Um, in fact, we can never, with enzyme replacement, fully fix the problem, so it very well could be some contribution of some other systemic, most likely central sort of eating behavior or systemic control of, of, of a metabolism that could be contributing. But I think the base, the end point is the same, right? It's sort of lower nutrient availability to the organism leads to basically the tumor well, leads to normal starvation physiology, right? You break down tissue, and in the end, that helps the tumor grow because it's not subject to the same social compact with the rest of the organism to try to work in the same way. Oh, just, so you'd need to probably then kind of block autophagy together with starvation, which might not be great for the organism? Yeah, so, so it's interesting. So the, so the question is, how do you fix muscle wasting in, in humans, right? Um, and, and it's actually a really complex question about whether or not you even want to do this, right? So families are very bothered by this. Patients rarely are. At least that's been my experience, right? Um, and so that's number one. But there's actually an added thing. So as an oncologist you know, who treats cancer, I can tell you that there's sort of an additional piece that is not modeled in our mice, and that is 
if you believe our therapies work, can you give therapy, right? And if people are in too bad of a body condition, we don't give therapy because people don't respond to it. Um, you know, there's a grad student, uh, um, Anna Barbeau, she's a grad student in the lab who's really tried to tackle that question. And it turns out we actually don't see a difference in at least fulfirinox and pancreas cancer. That's sort of the hard therapy, the standard, most powerful standard of care in pancreas cancer. We actually don't see a difference in fulfirinox response if we manipulate these things. So that's at least somewhat hopeful. But I think if you want to block muscle weight, what do we do now in patients? We give them boost shakes, which someone mentioned boost earlier. Boost shakes are basically high protein formulations, right? Um, now, how much of that's free amino acids versus intact amino acids? Like, there's lots of variables here that are complex. Maybe that's not always such a good idea, but maybe if you could block autophagy in the muscle, maybe that actually would be beneficial in some ways, although, well, it certainly would help give muscle mass back, which would make families happy and maybe patients, but it also may starve the patient, or may also starve the tumor while at the same time helping the patients. But how to block autophagy only in the muscle? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how to do that, so, <laughs> except genetically. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. Okay, thank you. Just a quick announcement. We will proceed into lunch now, which I believe is on this floor. Is that right? Yes. Okay. It's going to be on this floor, and we'll reconvene after lunch. Thank you. Thank you to all speakers.
right, good afternoon, everyone. We're, going to, we're about to start the postprennial session. Hopefully, everybody is uh, fed and alert. Um, the second, uh, the third session is cardio metabolism, and our first speaker is Dr. Rui Ping Xiao. Uh, she is the dean of College of Future Technology at Peking University. And uh, as someone who uh, worked with uh, GPCR structure and function, I really appreciate her prior work on identifying beta-2 adrenergic receptor activity and structure. And uh, these uh, studies have led to treatment strategies towards heart failure. And this is not the only case uh, where she has put bench to bedside. She has many clinical studies uh, ongoing right now. Today, she's going to talk to us about a multifactorial protein, MG53, which plays a role in the ubiquitination of insulin receptor and its substrate, insulin receptor substrate 1. Looking forward to it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First, I'd like to thank Gohan for your kind invitation. This is my first trip to this beautiful city to meet all of you. Um, in the metabolic field, I'm a newcomer. But uh, like Brian said, in the cardiac field, I have been there for three decades, even longer. So today, um, it's my great honor to talk about the role of MG53 in cardiometabolic disease. Okay. Um, as we know, the combination of this cluster of disease named cardiometabolic disease is the global epidemic. It's affect multiple organs as a, as a cluster of uh, comorbidities. The common soil for this cluster of disease actually is insulin resistance. Uh, we know there's a pre-diabetic syndrome named metabolic syndrome, which includes a cluster of disorders, including hypertension, dyslipidemia, hypoglycemia, obesity. But the core pathological factor is insulin resistance. Why should we care about metabolic syndrome? It is not a disease by a strict definition, but it increases the risk of cardiovascular disease by two-thirds and type 2 diabetes by five-fold. These two are very much interwoven. So as you can see here, the combination of cardiovascular disease and the diabetes indeed is the number one killer in China as well as in the States. So today, I'm going to show you a key factor for this cluster of disease, MG53, which blocks insulin signaling. As a result, the ending point could be diabetes or a whole cluster of cardiometabolic disease. This molecule is amazing. They can, it, it uh, it's a multifunctional protein, can be located in different places. Uh, if in the cells, in the cytosol, works as a E3 ligase, induce uh, degradation of insulin receptor and uh, IRS1. Another substrate is NPK alpha. It also can be a myokine secreted to the cell, uh, out of the cells, then go to the circulation, affect multiple organs, regulate the insulin sensitivity of the whole body. 
And in a disease condition, it goes to the nuclear compartment and uh, enhance mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, as a result, could be oxidative stress or mitochondrial dysfunction contributes to um, cardiometabolic disease and accelerate aging. But uh, it is a very um, interesting protein, not only involved in those uh, metabolic side effects, but also have some beneficial effects. In the membrane repair machinery, MG53 is a key component. So it's a double-edged sword. I will show you how to take advantage of this property. From these four different aspects, first let me focus on the intracellular function as an E3 legacy. MG53 targeting to insulin synchronin pathway as well as MTK pathway. So this protein, as you can see, uh, we appreciate that it's a muscle-enriched protein in the heart and the skeletal muscle is very much enriched. Under disease condition, uh, from small animal to monkeys to humans, we see um, with metabolic disorders, this protein is upregulated in skeletal muscle. Uh, here shows high fat dye induced obese mice, uh, type 2 diabetic mice, spontaneous hypertensive rats, um, sp uh, metabolic syndrome monkeys, then metabolic syndrome humans. You can see cross bolt skeletal muscle MG53 is upregulated. Then we were wondering what's the consequence for this upregulation. So we made a transgenic mice, uh, mouse model just show spontaneous obesity and the glucose intolerance, insulin intolerance. That's a waste time to get worse than go to type 2 diabetes. In contrast, if we lock out this gene, can protect the mice against dye-induced obesity, fatty liver, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. So it's very powerful for all kind of aspects. Recently, uh, here I'd like to show you uh, a little bit more details. We use uh, the ubiquitin assay, you can see the ubiquitination of the receptor and the IRS1 is markedly increased in the skeletal muscle from the transgenic mice. High fat dye can do the same trick. You see high fat dye induced the, uh, the enhanced ubiquitination of both the receptor and the IRS1. The lockout uh, uh, group uh, really clean is associated with uh, the upper regulation of the protein abundance. Here shows the increase of uh, MG53 in the disease model uh, in high fat diet treated mice and the TG mice uh, inversely correlate with uh, the down regulation of uh, IRS1. The same is true for insulin receptor. More recently, uh, we find another substrate for this E3 nuggets, NPK alpha. So first, again, in this different kind of disease model and human, we find um, metabolic disorder is associated with down regulation of NPK alpha, both alpha-1 and alpha-2 in skeletal muscle. Uh, again, there is a negative correlation between the increase of MG53 with the reduction of NPK alpha. Um, MG53 as a E3 ligase does induce ubiquitination of uh, NPK alpha 2. If we use skeletal muscle from DPTP mice or high fat dye treated mice, 
we see robust increase of the ubiquitination of NPK alpha. In a situation of nutrient overloading, um, particularly for high glucose, we see there is uh, interaction between NPK alpha 2 and uh, M this E3 ligase. This is kind of um, non singularly pathway. We also map out the whole uh, pathway. ROS is uh, involved and uh, related to AKT phosphorylation, then induce the negative inhibitory phosphorylation of the kinase, which promote the interaction between MG53 with the kinase, uh, resulting the degradation. Meanwhile, these uh, E3 ligase also functionally inhibit uh, MPK alpha 2. The second feature of this protein is uh, myokine, which can be secreted to the extracellular domain and uh, goes to the circulation. The first clue for this conclusion is from our cardiac specific transgenic mice. Um, with time, you can see doesn't matter low copy or high copy, those mice develop obesity and insulin resistance as evidenced by glucose intolerance and the insulin intolerance. As you can imagine, the heart only about 0.5% of our body weight. Cardiac specific transgenic uh, does the same thing as global transgenic mice. So we were wondering whether this protein goes to the circulation and uh, influence multiple organs. The answer is yes. We use isolated heart, then perfuse the heart with high glucose or high insulin. You see, they are very much dose-dependent uh, uh, secretion of uh, MG53 from myocardium. Um, this panel C, we use the lockout mice as a control, negative control. With oxidative stress is sufficient to induce this kind of secretion. Uh, here shows cultured cardiac mouse eyes treated with hydrogen peroxide. There's a dose and time-dependent secretion of MG53, which was totally blocked by catalyst. In the heart, in vivo and in the perfused heart, uh, we map out the single pathway. High glucose or high insulin can induce uh, increase in the hydrogen peroxide, then subsequently activate PKC delta, which promotes the secretion of MG53. Then you may ask whether this kind of uh, secreted MG53 is a garbage or a message. Does any biological function? To address this question, uh, we made some recombinant MG53 proteins and treat normal mice, as you can appreciate. 10 minutes pretreatment is sufficient to treat uh, to suppress insulin-induced AKT phosphorylation in multiple organs, including skeletal muscle, liver, adipo tissue, and the heart. Only 10 minutes pretreatment. Then we uh, ask ourselves whether this extracellular MG53 is a receptor. After intensive screening, Turn out it is insulin receptor. So the extracellular domain of insulin receptor can interact with MG53 as shown 
by the CoIP assay and the SPR assay. The binding affinity of MG53 to the receptor actually is as high as the lateral ligand, even a little bit higher. So the binding is very strong. But this kind of binding does not block the ligand, the lateral ligand binding. Uh, there are no competition. So MG53 anosterically inhibits insulin receptor signaling, but does not competitively block insulin binding. So how to regulate circulating MG53? If, uh, you know, we're all familiar, PCSK9, it does the job very similar to LDL cholesterol receptor, intracellularly induce degradation and uh, also binds to the receptor extracellularly. So whether we can regulate the circulating MG53 like the circulating PCSK9. Indeed, in the disease condition, we see this kind of regulation with uh, uh, the development of type 2 diabetes. We can see the increase in MG53 in the blood is associated with high glucose, hypoglycemia, hypoinsulinemia, and obesity. Same in human. Then we made a monoclonal antibody. This is just for proof of the principle we did in the mice. Um, one injection, we can see uh, lowering the blood glucose and improve glucose tolerance and the body weight reduction. This is really exciting. So we try to uh, make a human, full human antibody. The good news is healthy lifestyle does the same job. As you can see here, eight weeks exercise in rats is enough to reduce muscle and blood MG53 abundance. Uh, and uh, this is associated with the body weight reduction, improved uh, glucose tolerance, and the insulin sensitivity is also improved. What's the mechanism regulated this kind of exercise dependent reduction? So uh, using um, the chipstick assay, you can see there are several factors are involved. So next, we are focused on the glucocorticoid receptor. This morning, uh, you already heard the nuclear receptor. There are several binding regions of this uh, nuclear receptor on the MG53 promoter. Um, if we make some mutation, we can block this kind of uh, activation for the promoter. Indeed, exercise, you can see, um, can make down regulation of the receptor and uh, the hormone in the blood. In contrast, in type 2 diabetic rat or mouse, mice, you can see there is a positive association for MG53 and the cortical corticotism. Yeah, that's definitely uh, our belief. This kind of uh, manipulation of blood, MG53, use either monoclonal antibody or exercise. We can control the abundance of this protein 
could be a novel therapeutic agents for the diabetes and a variety of the complications. Another aspect is transcription factor function. That's only happened in some disease condition or stress condition. So we made some transgenic mice. This strain with a high, very high uh, level of the overexpression. You can see the exaggerated phenotype. This for one aspect is the accelerated aging for both males and females. The lifespan is markedly uh, shortened. Then we use ChIP-seq uh, to see what's the involved pathway genes and uh, proteins for the singling um, events. Turn out uh, MG53 is recruited to the promoters of uh, uh, oxidative phosphorylation related genes as layout in here we have uh, validated the whole panel of the genes. Furthermore, MG53 can form a heterodimer with NRF1. What is NRF1? Nuclear respiratory factor one, which uh, regulates a whole panel of uh, the gene products involved in mitochondrial function. So here shows uh, the interaction, direct physical interaction between MG53 with NRF1, as shown by SPR assay and co-IP assay. Uh, by the way, actually, the, the binding motif of these two are very similar, almost identical. So NRF1, by the definition, is controlled nuclear genes involved in mitochondrial respiratory function. MG53 form a dimer with NRF1 to control the whole panel of those genes regulation. MG53 is relatively more dominant than NRF1 in upregulating this final of genes, as shown in here, if we do the individual oval expression. So functionally, uh, upregulation of MG53 leads to uh, the lipid accumulation in different organs. For example, in the heart, in cardiac mouse size, with uh, adenoviral gene transfer of MG53 resulting uh, lipid accumulation. And the enhanced mitochondrial respiratory function, but uh, the coupling efficiency is reduced. In contrast, downregulation of this protein, uh, this gene uh, is in kind of reduce oxygen consumption and improve the company efficiency. The cells, uh, both for cardiac mouse size and the skeletal muscle, we see ROS production is significantly increased. And uh, in the heart, we do see typical diabetic cardiomyopathy as shown by lipid accumulation and the lipid toxicity. There are a lot of cell deaths and the fibrosis. So here with uh, 30 weeks of age, the mice already show heart failure. In skeletal muscle uh, and the heart, we do see dysfunction and uh, morphological change of mitochondrial. With uh, age, this is about uh, 40 weeks of age, the transgenic mice, mitochondrial number reduced 
by more than 50%. So taken together, I have shown you that it is a E3 lattice, but also can go to the nuclear, interact with NRF1, um, induce mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress, contributing to the phenotype of uh, cardiometabolic disease and accelerate aging. As I just mentioned, it is a double-edged sword. So we made some mutants. First one is an E3 that MG53 mutant. We try to use this mutant protein to repel the organ damage, for example, heart attack or other organ damage, since this protein is important for membrane repair. How to do that? As I just mentioned, we try to get rid of the metabolic effect, but maintain the cell membrane repair function and the cell survival function. Our early work have shown that in the heart, if we do mechanical injury, like laser induced injury, um, the fluorescent dye can leak in to the heart, the cell. The accumulation of the fluorescence uh, in the trans lockout mice is much worse than the wild type. Uh, suggesting the damage is worsened. So this mutant, one point mutation in sarin uh, 255, this uh, residue, we just uh, uh, did uh, make a mutation. Then this MG53 mutant lost the ability to bind to the substrate cannot bind to insulin receptor anymore, and also knows the E3 ligase activity. Uh, as we know, I think many of you are physicians, cardiac issues are often associated with type 2 diabetes. So um, we were wondering, was the difference, the wild type uh, compared to the mutant in the background of uh, type 2 diabetes. Since many patients suffering from this kind of uh, comorbidity, they don't really have good response to any kind of uh, therapy, specifically uh, for heart failure, for uh, heart therapy. So we compared uh, the injection of wild type MG53 to the mutant. Blood glucose, as you can appreciate, with uh, the injection of wild type MG53, blood glucose was further increased. It is very toxic, which cannot be developed as um, the natural form. Also, insulin response uh, was getting worse with uh, the wild type of MG53. This is not the case for the mutant. Both for the blood glucose and the insulin response. But uh, you see, the membrane repair function is uh, perfect compared to the wild type. That's in the cultural mouse size. We see without the treatment uh, with time, the leaky of the uh, membrane is getting worse. You can see the accumulation of the fluorescent dye uh, in the cells. With the wild type, you can do uh, the protection. The mutant does the same. For cardiac mouse size, we uh, insult the cells with hypoxia, then followed by reoxygenation. It is sufficient to induce cell death, 
with this wild type or mutant, you can see the protection. Now, in vivo, you can compare the real difference. In the healthy condition, not so much difference as shown in the cells, but in type 2 diabetic mice, only the mutant can reduce the infection size and uh, the injury of the cardiac mouse size. The most important result in this slide is only the mutant can protect the animal, reduce death rate. Chronic uh, model, we did the ischemia reperfusion, then follow up by uh, four weeks. We also can see the remodeling of the heart. With uh, the mutant therapy, we can see this is very much improved, both for fibrosis and the cardiac function. Now we are in the process to develop these mutants uh, as a novel therapy for acute myocardial injury, even for chronic cardiometabolic disease. In summary, uh, I have shown you that as an E3 legacy, intracellular MG53 targeting, targets insulin receptor IRS1 and uh, NPK alpha for ubiquitin dependent degradation, thus empowering in glucose metabolism. As a myokine secreted MG53 um, goes to the circulation and uh, affect uh, the insulin signaling in multiple organs. Upregulated MG53 enhances oxidative phosphorylation gene expression, uh, enhance mitochondrial respiratory function, contributing to the accelerated aging phenotype and other kind of cardiometabolic disease. We believe MG53 has a high potential to be developed as a novel therapy for the treatment of uh, myocardial injury and some chronic cardiometabolic disease. Finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues for uh, this early work was conducted by a panel of the students, Dr. Song, uh, Liu, and uh, Zhang. They all become professors now, some in the US, some in China. And uh, Professor Hu, who is in the audience. Um, he, she contributed a lot for those genetic models, also mentoring the students. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Xiao. This is definitely a multifactorial protein that will get multi-questions. Well, we, we do have time for one or two short questions because our next speaker will join us via Zoom and is ready, already online, so. Um, we have a question. Yes. It's a great work and very nice presentations. Congratulations. I have a simple question. You mentioned exercise reducing this level. Uh, I assume you meant cardiovascular exercise. Uh, how long and how often did you guys look at that uh, to exercise to reduce this level? Um, is uh, the study was done in the rats, so eight weeks exercise and medium level is not so intensive, is sufficient. Actually, okay. even uh, with a little bit shorter time, uh, we already observed that. Thank you. Um, what was the effect on food intake with MGF, MG53 upregulation or inhibition? Sorry? What's the effect on food intake? Food intake. Food intake. Yes. <laughs> it's a good question. We didn't check that aspect. Thank you. 
uh, protein take. Yeah, if it, yeah. If it, they, they weigh less, right? Um, yeah, that was one of my questions too, but uh, we can discuss after since our next speaker is here. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Helen Hobbs, who is an investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute at UT Southwestern, uh, which is a wonderful hub for liver research. Dr. Hobbs is a pioneer and leader in identifying and characterizing rare and common variants that are either sus uh, confer susceptibility or protection against liver or lipid disorders. And uh, <clears throat> she has the, she's been the recipient of a Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences and Harrington Prize for Innovation in Medicine. And the title of her talk is Genetic Disorders of Dietary Excess. Looking forward to it. Thank you so
the session. Um, and thank you, Dr. Hobbs, again, for the wonderful presentation. All right, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Catherine Moore. Um, she is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. I think that's almost like a summary. You don't need to say anything else, but I'll give a little more. Uh, she is the Director of Cardiovascular Research Center at New York University. She is renowned for identifying factors that contribute to cardiometabolic diseases, such as atherosclerosis, uh, including non-coding RNA and immune responses. And the title of her talk is Molecular Links Between Heart Disease and Cancer. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. And Gokhan, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. You've created such a wonderful community, and it's really a pleasure to be here to be able to see that. Um, I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different today that my lab has become interested in in the past couple of years, and that is cross-disease communication between cardiovascular disease and cancer. Um, cancer and cardiovascular disease are, of course, the two most common causes of death in the world, and they have uh, common risk factors and a complicated bidirectional relationship. So uh, risk factors that I commonly think of as cardiovascular risk factors, such as cigarette smoking, obesity, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes, are also risk factors for cancer. And in turn, certain cancer therapies can have metabolic and cardiovascular complications that can increase the risk for heart disease. In fact, uh, a recent prospective uh, study published last summer in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, which followed 12,000 individuals over decades, found that cancer survivors have a 42% increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And this was particularly true for heart failure, where the hazard ratio was 1.59. I'm, I apologize that I don't have a pointer, so I can't uh, show you these numbers, um, but you'll have to take my word for it. They're right up there. They're kind of small. Um, but what was interesting about the increased risk in cancer survivors was that traditional cardiovascular risk factors could not account for this increased risk fully. So after adjustment for traditional risk factors such as hyperlipidemia, diabetes, obesity, the hazard ratio remained 1.37 for cardiovascular disease overall. Um, and 1.52 for, for heart failure. Uh, and this really reinforces the importance of cardiovascular disease prevention in cancer survivors. And this is an area that's expected to grow. Currently, there are 17 million adult cancer survivors in the United States. Um, and this is expected to swell to 25 million uh, in the next five years with the introduction of new immunotherapies and the expansion of their use. And so there's, there's growing concern um, about this increased risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer survivors. But as this risk has become appreciated, we and, and other groups have become interested in what happens in this patient population when they have a cardiovascular event. Could a heart attack in a cancer survivor cause uh, in, an increased risk of recurrence or worse outcomes. And I'm going to share some data today from a study from my lab that suggests that, yes, there is this uh, reciprocal relationship. Um, and together with a few other studies that have emerged, this, this is leading to a new field that has been termed reverse cardio-oncology. So I became particularly interested in this area in the setting of breast cancer. Breast cancer is the most common form of cancer in women worldwide. One in eight women will experience breast cancer in their lifetimes. And I'm sure that for many people in the audience, um, as for myself, my family has been impacted by breast cancer. Uh, the good news is that the treatments for breast cancer continue to improve and relative survival rates over five years have reached greater than 90%. The bad news is that these cancer survivors have a 40% in increased risk of cardiovascular disease. 
And this is thought to be due to um, the, the toxicities of therapies such as radiation and chemotherapy, but also due to changes in lifestyle behavior that accompany a cancer diagnosis. Um, and I became interested in this area because of this graph in particular. So this shows the cumulative incidence of cardiac events in patients diagnosed with early stage breast cancer over seven years. And the graph is stratified by baseline cardiovascular disease risk factors. So in women that had no cardiovascular disease risk factors when they were diagnosed, you can see that the cumulative incidence of a cardiac event is approximately 10%. But in those that had multiple cardiovascular risk factors, that gray line, it's approaching 50% after seven years. And I was really struck by this. Um, for people that in the audience that are very young, you might think that three cardiovascular risk factors sounds like a lot. Um, but with the incidence of um, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia in, in the world today, achieving uh, three cardiovascular risk factors is pretty easy. And so I wondered, with, with this group of patients, with so many of them experiencing a cardiovascular event, such as a heart attack, what happens to their cancer? How does this affect recurrence? How does this affect outcomes? And I was surprised to find that no one had looked at this yet. And so although I am not a, a cancer biologist, I decided to take this on. And uh, in collaboration with Kaiser Permanente, we performed a retrospective analysis of two prospective case cohort studies in which close to 4,000 uh, breast cancer patients had been studied for um, a mean follow-up time of 12 years. The studies uh, were the, the Life After Cancer Epidemiology Study and the Pathways Population uh, Study. And we found that in those patients that had no prior history of cardiovascular disease uh, at diagnosis, if they um, had a cardiovascular event, which we've defined as acute myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure, or arrhythmia, they had a 59% increased risk of cancer recurrence. And if their cancer came back, a 60% increased risk of dying from their cancer. And on the right here, you can see the associated Kaplan-Meier curves. In red, those individuals that had a cardiac event, uh, and in gray, those that did not. And you can clearly see the reduction in disease for years and reduction in survival. So with this data in hand, we were very interested to try to understand the molecular mechanisms underpinning this relationship. Um, we developed mouse models of heart attack or myocardial infarction in breast cancer. Um, in mice, a myocardial infarction can be simulated by ligating the left anterior descending coronary artery. And because this is a surgical procedure, and surgery has been shown also to increase tumor growth, our controls here is a sham surgery. Um, and we did this in C57 black 6 mice with the EO771 orthotopic breast cancer model. So in this model, we implant a few cancer cells into the mammary fat pad of the mice, and three days later, the, the mice undergo the MI or sham surgery. And we followed tumor growth over 20 days. And you can see in the red trace that those mice that experienced a myocardial infarction have accelerated tumor growth compared to the shams. And at sacrifice, at day 20, those tumors, the tumor weights were, were twice, as, twice as large. And when we looked at those tumors and stain for KI67, a marker of proliferation, we found a doubling of proliferating cells in the tumor border, suggesting that myocardial infarction was, was causing these tumors to grow faster, there was more proliferation, and that those proliferating cells were both cells, um, tumor cells and uh, cells in the tumor microenvironment, such as immune cells. We wanted to confirm that this was not simply one mouse model, um, and we repeated our study in the MMTB PYMT spontaneous tumor model. So these mice spontaneously develop uh, breast tumors, 
at, or mammary tumors um, at 14 to 16 weeks of age. Again, we performed the MI or sham surgery um, and followed this out over 18 days. And as you can see in blue, those mice that experienced um, MI or LAD ligation had a doubling of tumor growth. And although we were stopping this study quite early and there were no overt metastases in the lung, we could do uh, qPCR for uh, the PYMT gene and show that uh, we, had, we had twice as many uh, cells expressing PYMT in the, the MI versus sham. Um, we went on to show in, in another model of cancer metastasis that after MI, there is an increase in metastasis of cancer cells to the lung with um, a, an increase in tumor to healthy uh, lung area, shown here on the bottom. So these data from our preclinical models, as well as the data from the patients that I showed you, suggest that a cardiac event can accelerate tumor progression. So how is a myocardial infarction altering tumor growth? We know that a heart attack causes myriad local and systemic effects. It starts with ischemic injury in the heart. This can cause the release of danger and alarm, alarming signals, such as interleukin-1, and also beta-adrenergic stimulation. Both of these factors can act on the bone marrow to increase hematopoiesis. And studies in the, in the heart attack field have shown that um, this causes a transient monocytosis. And that, that this increase in monocytes uh, in the circulation can accelerate um, chronic inflammatory diseases such as atherosclerosis. And so we wondered if something similar was happening with cancer. But the immune responses that drive uh, cancer and, and the ones that drive atherosclerosis actually are quite different. So we reasoned that it, it couldn't be that simple, that there could just be more monocytes in the circulation, but rather that the MI could be reprogramming immune responses. The immune system critically regulates uh, tumor growth and cancer progression. So when the immune system is functioning properly, Immune cells such as anti-tumorigenic macrophages, neutrophils, um, and, and, um, and T cells can restrict tumor growth through a series of mechanisms that, that involve antigen presentation, the production of type 1 cytokines. But tumors have, of course, evolved mechanisms to evade these immune responses, and chief among them is to enrich the tumor in immunosuppressive immune cell types, such as regulatory T cells um, and, and cells that are called MDSCs, myeloid-derived suppressor cells. These cells together um, can inhibit many of the anti-tumorigenic mechanisms. And we were interested in the MDSCs in particular because these MDSCs are derived from lysoxy high monocytes that come from the bone marrow. This, those same cells that I was saying were increased after a myocardial infarction. So to begin to look at our tumors to see um, what the, the tumor microenvironment looked like, we took our bulk tumors at day 20, we digested them, and we performed flow cytometry and RNA sequencing. Um, and by flow cytometry, you can see in red that the mice that experienced MI in their tumors, we had an, an increased proportion of CD45 positive cells, those immune cells. And um, looking at the distinct myeloid populations, we saw no changes in neutrophils, no changes in GR1 um, negative macrophages. Uh, they were F480 also. Um, but we saw an increase, a significant increase in the Lysoxy high monocytic cells that share markers with MDSCs. And on the lymphocyte side, we saw an overall decrease in, in CD3 positive cells in the tumor, um, but an enrichment of CD4 positive, FOXP3 positive uh, regulatory T cells. And this suggests that after 
uh, a heart attack, we were seeing an enrichment in the tumor of myeloid-derived suppressor cells and regulatory T cells that are driving the tumor immune set point towards tolerance or immunosuppression. We were particularly interested in the role of the monocytes in this, um, in, in this interaction. Uh, previous studies in the, the field of MI have shown that there is a, a transient monocytosis. So after heart attack, the levels of monocytes increase in the blood and also in the heart. Um, and this follows two phases, where um, in that first phase that peaks at three days, there's an increase in the Lysoxy high monocytes. And that's followed by um, an influx or accumulation of Lysoxy low monocytes. And that reparative phase ends at around day 10. So um, we wondered whether something similar was going on um, that could be driving tumor growth. And there are a lot of groups here. But if you focus first on the red circles at the top, um, these are mice that have, oh, sorry, if you f focus on the red triangles, just below the red circles, these are mice um, that have had a myocardial infarction, but they don't have cancer. And you can see that we see something similar to what's been previously reported, where you have a peak of monocytes, and then it wanes. But in the mice that had tumors, and also experienced an MI, the red circles, the monocyte level goes up, and it is sustained throughout the course of our experiments. And these, we could show by flow cytometry, were particularly those Lysoxy high monocytes. And when we look at day 12, that point where in mice without cancer, the monocytes are coming down, we see that in the, after MI, in the mice that have cancer in the bottom right here, we have an increase in the common myeloid progenitor population in the bone marrow. So there's this increased supply that continues in the setting of cancer that we uh, hypothesized was feeding the tumors. So to test this, we did monocyte adoptive transfer experiments. We took advantage of the CD45.1, CD45.2 congenic mice. Um, we used our EO771 model where we introduced the, the cells into the mammary fat pad, performed the MI or sham surgery, and then on day 12, a time point where we see equivalent tumor weights, so this is right before the tumor growth curves diverge, we introduce CD45.1 monocytes and we trace them to the tumors. And we saw that in the mice that experienced MI, we had accelerated recruitment of the monocytes to the tumor. Those tumors, when we did bulk RNA sequencing, express uh, chemokines that are responsible for recruiting those monocytic cells. And when we look in the blood, particularly in the mice that have MI plus cancer, we see an upregulation of the receptors for those chemokines. So this suggests that there's a, a cross-disease communication that's happening between the cancer uh, and the heart attack. So we know that we have more of those cells in the circulation, more are being recruited to the tumor, but is this the mechanism for the MI-induced tumor growth advantage? To look at this, we used uh, a mouse model called um, the CCR2 depleter model. This is a model where the diphtheria toxin receptor is expressed from the CCR2 locus. Um, mice don't normally express the diphtheria toxin receptor. And this allows us the ability to um, inject diphtheria toxin and deplete mon lysoxy high monocytes um, at certain times. And this was important because we wanted to wait until after healing of the heart had, had um, mostly um, been finished. So um, we used our model. We inject diphtheria toxin starting on day 10, serial injections. Um, and these are control experiments just to show you how effective this, this mouse is um, in terms of deleting Lysoxy high monocytes. So in the darker bars, um, those are our wild-type mice. In the, in the lighter shades are the CCR2 DTR mice. And you can see that in the bone marrow, the circulation, 
and the tumor, when we inject diphtheria toxin, we're depleting those monocyte populations in all of these tissues. And this completely abrogates the MI-induced tumor growth advantage. So in the circles in red, you can see the, the mice, the wild-type mice that had MI and the tumor growth. And in the triangles, these are our mice where we've depleted the, the Lysoxy high monocytes. And we've now lost that accelerated tumor, um, tumor growth. But we've also, by um, getting rid of those cells, changed the uh, tumor immune microenvironment. So um, on the right here, you can see the level of FOXP3 expression in the tumors, and in red, the mice that experienced MI, when we deplete those Lysoxy high monocytes, there's a reduction in the immunosuppressive regulatory T cells, and that corresponds with an increase in CD8 positive T cells, particularly those that are expressing granzyme B, which is a marker of T cell activation. So I've referred to the, these monocytic cells as MDSCs, um, but in order to, to actually give them that name, you have to show that they're immunosuppressive. Um, and this is done in cool culture assays uh, between the, the MDSC cells and CD8 T cells. We isolated the MDSCs from the tumors at 20 days and co-cultured them with naive T cells. We saw no difference in T cell uh, proliferation, but we found that the, the MDSCs from mice that experienced MI, shown in red, were much more effective at uh, suppressing T cell activation compared to the shams, shown in gray. So what you're looking at in the first graph is expression of interferon uh, gamma, TNF-alpha, and granzyme B. And in all three cases, you can see that the, the MDSCs from the mice that experienced MI are more effective on a per cell basis at suppressing T cell activation. And this was reflected by our RNA sequencing as well. When we isolated the MDSCs from the tumors and did RNA sequencing um, on in the MI column, you can see that we have uh, broad downregulation of genes that, uh, by pathway analysis, were found to be involved in the immune response, lymphocyte activation, cytokine-mediated signaling pathways, and it's hard for me to read, <laughs> but uh, definitely pathways that are needed to mount an anti-tumorigenic immune response. Um, and when we look at the potential upstream regulators of, of those pathways, it also identifies repression or inhibition of interferons and um, STAT1 and TLR3, which are uh, signal, uh, elements of the signal transduction pathways leading to the type 1 interferon response. So how are the effects of the heart attack being sustained? We're looking three weeks after the mouse has experienced a heart attack, and we're seeing this accelerated tumor growth. And um, this got me thinking a little bit about the concept of innate immune memory. And um, this, this is a, a concept that's, that's really emerged over the past five to 10 years, where microbial stimuli, such as beta-glucan, can induce an inflammatory response, an initial inflammatory response. And after a rest period, if these monocytes are re-stimulated, you have an amplified immune response. And on the flip side, below, we've known for a very long time about LPS tolerance, LPS-induced tolerance, where initially, if you expose macrophages to LPS, you have an inflammatory response. And then upon re-stimulation, they're refractive. But what's really come about in the last five years is the understanding that these phenotypes are driven by epigenetic and metabolic reprogramming of um, progenitor cells in the bone marrow, and that this is what confers that long-term responsiveness. So that the change uh, in response can be, can be lasting from three months up to a year. And we wondered whether this was what was happening after a heart attack. To look at whether uh, the heart attack could be imprinting 
innate immune memory on the chromatin, we used a technique called ATAC sequencing, which looks at regions of accessible chromatin. So when the chromatin is more accessible, these genes are poised to be expressed. When it's more compacted, essentially the genes are closed for business. Um, and when we performed ATAC sequencing of bone marrow monocytes from the, the mice that experienced MI versus SHEM, we saw in blue that many more loci were less accessible. And when we looked at what, what pathways those loci belong to using um, an analysis, analysis program called GREAT, we found that they were genes involved in regulation of the immune system, regulation of the inflammatory response, leukocyte activation, Again, all of these pathways that are required to, um, to fight the tumor. And we could look specifically in those regions that were less accessible for what transcription factor binding sites um, were there, so which transcription factors actually couldn't, couldn't um, activate those genes. And it identified pioneer factors such as PU1 and CBP, but also IRF8. And that was very interesting because mice that, are, um, that have an IRF8 knockout have monocytes that take on an MDSC-like phenotype. And this suggested that the MI was acting on the bone marrow to imprint a memory that could confer an immunosuppressive phenotype. To, to try to find more evidence for this, we integrated our bone marrow lysoxy um, high monocyte ATAC sequencing with the RNA sequencing of the tumoral lysoxy high monocytes. And we were trying to find genes that showed both reduced chromatin accessibility in the bone marrow and also transcriptional inhibition in the tumors. Um, and this identified uh, a really interesting subset of genes, but particularly ones that are important in the immune response. And this is the actual data, rather than showing you lists. Um, and you can see in the top track, the sham mice are shown in turquoise, the MI mice are, are shown in that gold color. The first set of tracks is ATAC sequencing. This is the CD40 locus. And you can see uh, right there at the beginning that there's uh, a decrease in chromatin accessibility. The next set of tracks is RNA sequencing of lysoxy high monocytes in the bone marrow, and below that, the tumoral MDSCs. And uh, if you compare the gold traces to, to the turquoise, you can see reduced expression. Um, and so this was true for all of these uh, loci that we looked at. So this suggested to us that the memory of the heart attack was imprinted on the bone marrow, and that the monocytes were immunosuppressive um, or, or bound to be immunosuppressive well before they even reached the tumor. To test that, we reasoned that this should be transferable by bone marrow transplant. And so again, we used the CD45.1 and CD45.2 mice. Um, we used our EO771 model, MI or sham, and at day 23, we harvested the bone marrow and transplanted it. We allowed the mice to recover for um, 14 weeks, so uh, three and a half months, and then we injected uh, tumors into these mice. We saw equivalent reconstitution of sham and MI um, bone marrow cells, and when we looked at the growth of the tumors, the mice that had bone marrow uh, from mice that had experienced MI have accelerated tumor growth, as we saw in, in the primary tumors. And again, on the top right, we also saw a, a monocytosis, su suggesting that um, this was, in fact, driven by reprogramming of the bone marrow and that this phenotype of accelerated tumor growth could be transferred. Um, so um, in, the, in the red, those mice have never experienced a heart attack themselves, but they have uh, bone marrow from mice that have. So one of the questions I often get is whether this is just um, true for breast cancer. Does, does this apply to other cancer 
types. We've also looked at melanoma. We were interested in melanoma because it's a, a cancer that can affect younger people. So it's the number one form of cancer in individuals aged 25 to 29, which means that these cancer survivors are going to have a, a longer survival time as well. Um, assuming that their melanoma is properly treated. Uh, and as you can see here, um, in, the, in the B16 F10 melanoma model in C57 black sex mice, when we do these experiments, we see again that MI accelerates tumor growth, oh, and also tumor metastasis, but clearly it didn't like that. Um, so I will go to my summary. Um, what I've told you today is that we find that myocardial infarction is an acute pathologic stressor that can accelerate cancer. MI induces a systemic response that epigenetically reprograms myeloid cells in hematopoietic reservoirs towards an immunosuppressive state. We also have more of those cells being released uh, to the circulation. And together, this is co-opted by the tumor to propagate tumor growth. And in ongoing studies, we're looking at the signals that imprint this innate immune response, particularly the metabolic changes that are occurring in those precursors in the bone marrow. Um, and we're also very interested in how MI is altering uh, metastasis. And we have some, some really interesting findings in terms of uh, platelet activation um, that I think that I think will be very interesting. So I will, oh, I will not end there. <laughs> in conclusion, uh, our findings exemplify the importance of understanding host comorbidities and their impact on cross-disease communication. And I have to say that this study has really got me thinking about how we design experiments as scientists. We're often studying disease models in isolation, um, whereas in the patient population, particularly patients with metabolic diseases, there are multiple comorbidities. And I think, actually, as a community, uh, scientists that focus on metabolism are much more in tune with this. But for many other fields, I think this, this concept of uh, comorbidities and, and how there might be cross-disease communication still uh, needs to be brought uh, awareness to. Um, I think for cancer survivors, our study will have important implications um, to ensure that, that these cancer survivors are closely followed uh, to treat their cardiovascular risk factors to improve not only cardiovascular specific, but also cancer specific outcomes. And I'll end by thanking the people in my lab that did this work, particularly Graham Colwyn. He was a graduate student. Um, that took on this project. He's now an assistant professor. Uh, Alexandra Newman and Richard von Itter, uh, whose data I showed you, as well as my many collaborators. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Is there something specific about the heart and heart attacks, or would you see this, a similar phenomenon with other resolving uh, diseases? So we've tried to get at this using femoral artery ligation, for example. Um, and we compared femoral artery ligation to cryo-injury of the heart. So the femoral artery ligation, we reasoned, would be simulating um, the ischemic uh, insult, and the cryo-injury to the heart uh, tissue damage, and, and particularly cardiac damage. Uh, what was frustrating about those studies was that we saw an intermediate phenotype. Um, and what I suspect, actually, is that this is multifactorial, that it's not ischemia alone or tissue injury alone, that there are multiple factors um, that, that are occurring. Catherine, fascinating uh, studies. Congratulations. So two questions. So when you deleted the monocytes, did you see any change in the infarct, infarct fibrosis, infarct healing? Um, and then the second question is, do you think 
because these are presumably fairly young mice. Have you done the experiments in older mice? There's a tremendous amount of plasticity and dynamic changes that occur in young mice, and maybe if they were 12 months old with chronic uh, metabolic disease, that I don't know if you have thoughts mm. about that. We haven't done it in mice older than 12 weeks. 12 weeks is usually when we, when we start the study, so that is an interesting thought that we should look at. Um, and your first question, I'm sorry, I just yeah. blanked. So fibrosis, infarct healing. Oh, right. Um, sorry, I, I, took, I didn't want to go over time, so I took that data out. Um, we see no difference in, um, in cardiac remodeling or in cardiac function. And the time that you deleted the monocytes in relationship to the infarct was? Ten days. Ten days after. After, So yep. maybe there was a window there. Because there's, it's supposed to be helpful, right, that monocyte. Right, so we were trying, you know, it's sort of like a peak at three days of those Lysaxe high monocytes and a peak uh, then that follows of the Lysaxe low. And that, the Lysaxe low are, are coming down around day seven. Um, and so we were hopefully past that window. Um, but we saw no significant differences. Very, very nice, Catherine. I'm also kind of when we saw your paper, we were a little bit shocked. And I mean, one question I was also wondering, similar to Mitch, whether this is a generalized phenomenon for like ischemia reperfusion related injury or a hormetic uh, response that predisposes to tumor genesis. But I'm also wondering, there are some oncogenic pathways, for example, that also predispose to cardiac. Uh, failure, like P53 activation, for example, could there be reverse causality in that in that way? Have you thought about that? Um, we have started to look at that, but and also to look at how the heart attack affects uh, not just the immune system, but also tumor tumor cells, and um, and it's too early actually to talk about that. But one of the things, so I was initially surprised by our results because I'd always thought of a heart attack as being an inflammatory event. And in fact, a lot of people have looked three days later and they see an increase in inflammation. Um, and in a lot of our studies, we're looking at 10 days or 20 days. And so one thing that I thought of immediately when I saw these results was, well, what would happen if we challenged the mice with a pathogen? Um, and, and I felt more comfortable doing that experiment um, to, to be sure that what we were seeing was truly uh, some form of immunosuppression. And when we challenged these mice at day 10 with uh, Staph aureus, they, the mice that have had a heart attack can't fight off the infection. Um, there, there's a huge burden of bacteria that, that can't be cleared, uh, and all of those mice succumb. But if you do that experiment at day three, immediately after the heart attack when you're having this inflammatory response, it's actually protective. But I think that uh, not enough people have, have studied those longer term effects. And I think that in some ways this is similar to what you see in sepsis, where in sepsis you initially see this big inflammatory response, but then it goes below homeostasis um, and, and you have a suppressive response. So we're really interested in the metabolic pathways that are driving this in the progenitors. Thank you for a very beautiful talk. Um, I have two questions. One is general, uh, which is uh, that in uh, some of the most common uh, cancers, such as breast cancer and prostate cancer, the drug treatments, they result in negative uh, metabolic consequences including cardiovascular uh, events. Um, how much of the uh, link between cardiovascular events and cancer uh, is due to prior events to cancer or caused by the treatments? And related to that is, have you looked at the uh, beautiful data that you presented on changes in the immune microenvironment, such as MDSCs, in the breast cancer, human breast cancer tumors? Um, so we haven't had access to 
to tissues to look at that in the human patients. Um, I was excited to try to get circulating monocytes um, from Kaiser Permanente, um, but we weren't able to obtain them because I thought that that would allow it. They had been collecting uh, PBMCs um, on, on these patients, and, and I thought that would allow us to take a look at some of these questions. Um, and I, I wasn't sure I understood your first question. Uh, so, for example, aromatase inhibitors for breast cancer and androgen deprivation uh, and uh, anti-androgen treatments are associated with uh, metabolic, uh, negative metabolic consequences and also cardiovascular events. Mm -hmm. So, um, when we look at cancer survivors, how much of the events that we see are due to prior cardiovascular events and their continuation versus the consequence of the treatments th that those patients uh, got for their cancer? Um, well, I'm, I think that's a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> um, the way that we designed the study was that we looked at patients with no prior history of cardiovascular events um, and then compared ones that had an event versus those that did not. Um, and, and so uh, from what we can see there, we see this increased risk, but um, dissecting that further uh, into the, the metabolic changes I think is difficult, other than to say that um, the data were adjusted for BMI, um, treatment, age, at onset, uh, various different factors. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to reconvene at 4.15 for the last session.
Okay, I guess we can get started with the last session of this exciting day. I hope all of you is caffeinated well enough and is energized back for a few more exciting talks. Um, in this session, unfortunately, the third speaker has fallen ill and cannot join us today. So therefore, we will have two speakers. And the first of which is uh, James Ntambi from University of Wisconsin in Madison. And um, generally speaking, um, James Lab is interested in systemic, systemic metabolism with a focus on lipogenesis. And probably most of you know his pioneering work with SCD1. And he's been also recently elected as a member to American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. But beyond all these scientific accomplishments and recognitions he's been awarded, I'd like to mention one more thing that perhaps most of you is, are unaware of. That is um, his social engagement back at his home country in Uganda. So um, James has started this uh, Uganda program two decades ago, which um, couples the students from US um, to public in rural Uganda. And they train the people there on health and nutrition, which is, in my opinion, a valuable return back to the public and shows also uh, the good heart that James carries. With that, I'd like to welcome him on stage, and stage is yours. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, introduction. I would also like to use this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Gahan and also the founders, the Sibri Wuka Center founders, uh, for the invitation to come and participate in this uh, symposium uh, uh, of me in the metabolism of life. Uh, to me, it's very exciting. I became so interested in biochemistry many, many years ago when I was an undergrad, and I was interested mainly in metabolism. So when I get to a, a symposium like this, to talk about my metabolism, I feel very, very excited. So thanks very much for that. Uh, invitation. So, uh, could you just, yeah, yes, I just, uh, yeah, exactly, thank you. Right, all right. Okay, so I would like to start off by, uh, sharing uh, this uh, global, yeah, as, as, as you heard, I have this interest in uh, uh, global health. And as we talk about this topic uh, on uh, steroid saturation, just keep in mind uh, the kind of diets that people consume globally. And you know, in the first part, you can see countries uh, that uh, consume mainly high-fat, high-carbohydrate diets, particularly Western uh, countries. But down below, in the blue, you will see a lot of countries that uh, uh, consume high-carbohydrate diets. Now, just to remind you, both diets, when consumed in uh, large amounts, will cause uh, obesity, uh, overweight. So one of the reasons why I am so interested in this aspect is you will find, if you look at nutrition globally, that while one billion people go hungry every day, uh, almost two billion are overweight. So I have been addressing both aspects of malnutrition, the undernutrition and the overnutrition. Uh, but uh, oh, wait. just wanted to remind you also that I'm going to speak or mainly talk about the overnutrition aspect. And just remind you that uh, overweight, uh, I don't want to use the word obesity. It's, it's, it does, is uh, offensive in some cases. But overweight, as you can see, Diabetes, diabetes is uh, a factor. Hypertension, uh, cardiovascular, 
cancer, fatty liver disease, uh, inflammation. So obesity is a, a risk factor for all of these diseases. And you have heard about them uh, quite a bit uh, in, this, uh, in this symposium. Now, I would like to talk about this in the context of one particular enzyme that is involved in uh, a lipid metabolism or in fatty acid synthesis. And uh, this is uh, an enzyme that I started working on uh, many, many years ago, even before I met uh, uh, Gohan uh, uh, about 25 years ago. And at one time, I thought I would be done in 20 years. But up to now, I'm still struggling to understand the role of this enzyme in, in metabolism. So what is this, this, this is a very simple, you would think, enzyme that resides in the ER, in the endoplasmic reticulum. And in collaboration with uh, so many other uh, proteins, the cytochrome B5 reductase, the cytochrome B5, uh, and in the presence of molecular oxygen, we are talking about the ER, so oxygen has to get to the ER. Uh, this enzyme will abstract the protons from saturated fatty acids, positions nine and 10, to create a double bond uh, at that position. So if you start with the palimitic acid, you form a palimitic acid, and if you, you start from stereoic acid or stereo-CoA, so because these fatty acids have to be activated initially, you synthesize oleic acid. So this is what this enzyme does specifically. And in fact, in the ER, it is also in close association with other enzymes like DGAT and ACAT. So just to give you the context, and, and this is a pathway that I normally teach when I teach biochemistry, and start, so, sort of talk about the flux uh, the, of fatty acids into tissue lipids, uh, uh, that uh, some of which are made de novo, uh, uh, mainly from fructose, uh, glucose, uh, acetate, uh, mainly, or, or, or it can, the, 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 the lipids can come from uh, uh, dietary sources. So you can come th through here, you are all familiar with these uh, lipogenic enzymes, fatty acid synthase, acetylcholic carboxylase, the elongases that have also been uh, talked about uh, uh, today. And when you get it to C16-0, that is primitive, then the, 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 the substrates move on to the ER, and that's where the SCD is located, and then you will introduce that double bond. Turns out, that these uh, monounsaturated fatty acids, the ones that are made de novo, and also from the diet, become the major substrates for a number of enzymes that a lot of us uh, scientists have been working on, and you have heard about some of these already, the DGATs, uh, the triglycerides, the phospholipids, uh, the wax esters, the retinal esters, the cholesterol esters, the alkyldiacylglycerols, all of these, if you look at their structures, they have these monounsaturated fatty acids at the various SN positions in the triglyceride, let's say, or even in the phospholipid uh, 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 structure. So these uh, become very important tissue lipids. Now, when I was uh, a postdoc uh, with Dan Lane many, many years ago at Johns Hopkins, I was able to clone uh, this, the gene that uh, encodes this, uh, this enzyme. And we called it steroid saturase, uh, or SCD. SCD. The first gene we got was SCD1. And this, it, it, we, we found very quickly that there were actually several isoforms of SCD in the mouse. There was SCD1 up to SCD4. And we were lucky that we could also start working on the human SCDs. And we found that in humans, uh, there are mainly two SCDs, uh, SCD, SCD1 and SCD5. Now, sheep, pigs, uh, cattle have mainly two SCDs, just like the humans do. Now, we, we found very quickly that this, when we started work using animals, that the SCD1 gene was very, very responsive to a number of dietary uh, factors. So every, all the, doc, the factors on the left-hand side here turned out to be inducers of the expression of this gene. Initially, we had looked at it in adipocyte differentiation, and it was one of the genes that was turned on more than almost 200-fold in addition to the other lipogenic genes like fatty acid synthesis or carboxylase. But 
Uh, the gene also had repressors, so they were, they were you know, factors that will induce, of course these factors will include the cholesterol, fructose, uh, insulin itself, uh, the elect electoral agonist, vitamin A, vitamin D, all these, some of these are all components of the diets that we eat. And if you look at the repressors also, the PUFAs, for instance, are repressors. Leptin can repress also, thyroid hormones, glucagon, the TZDs that are involved in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, diabetes treatment. So we, 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 did, we decided, and some of this work is already, already published, but what I want to do is fill in the gaps, tell you the story about this enzyme, and just show you that uh, you, why don't you think that you, you have the answers? It may not really be the case. So as I told you, uh, because we found that this enzyme was more expressed in overweight or uh, obese uh, circumstances, we decided to knock it out using a mouse. So we, we created a mouse model that had a global knockout of the SCD1. We didn't touch the other SCDs in the mouse. And what we found when we put on the two diets that I showed you in the, in the first slide, the high carbohydrate diets and the high fat diets uh, administered or fed to these animals, these animals never gained weight. So they were totally, totally protected against the high carbohydrate diet induced weight gain and the high fat diet induced weight gain. Okay, so and we, we kept going for several weeks where, while all the, 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 the wild type uh, mice would gain weight. The other thing that we noticed that these animals were very hyperphagic. So they were eating much more than the wild type mice. So at that time, we said, oh, okay, this is good. And if you are human, you want to eat as much as you want and you don't gain weight. So we said, okay, now we have a solution. That's what we thought at that time. But we, we continued anyway. And we also found out that these animals were very insulin sensitive. So this is the global knockout, very insulin sensitive. And also, uh, they, they, you know, using the glucose tolerance test, they were, you know, glucose tolerant. So, so they were also protected against type 2 diabetes after analyzing them for, 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 for several weeks. The other thing that we discovered is that they were, they, these, they, the mutation also protected animals against fatty liver uh, or the accumulation of or liver steatosis. And we also discovered that when it introduced into models uh, of, of obesity, like the OB, OB mice or the the a, 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 uh, yellow mice, they were also protected against uh, weight gain. So there was uh, a number of phenotypes that we thought were very favorable when the SCD1 was knocked out. But of course, there were also some side effects. So, so they were reduced, they reduced genetically induced uh, obesity. Uh, prevented leptin deficiency, uh, PPR alpha lipodystrophic induced liver steatosis. So we could even cross them against the PPR alpha, where when you uh, remove PPR alpha, you get a fatty liver. But when you have the SCD1 mutation, the, the, the lipids or the triglycerides don't accumulate. Increased insulin sensitivity, as I mentioned, uh, resistance to diabetes, and this was leptin de uh, dependent. Uh, increased the expenditure, because at first we thought, where, where was the food going? They were eating. I mean, there was no defect in, in food consumption. They had increased thermogenesis. That was also interesting. UCPs were uh, upregulated. Uh, increased the fatty acid oxidation, because we looked at all the MPKs, the fatty acid uh, oxidation genes were upregulated. But then we also noticed that uh, the, the transcription factors, uh, SRBP1C that you heard about uh, today, and also the CHREBP transcription factor, the two major factors involved in turning on lipogenic genes were also downregulated. So there was uh, a decrease or reduced hepatic de novo lipogenesis because the SRBPs and the CHRBP and the target genes uh, we were, were reduced. So we thought that, that was really interesting. And, and we, we had a general reduction in the levels of oleic acid throughout the animal. So, so we, we decided to sort of quickly do a, a, a test to figure out 
whether the changes that we are seeing are due to the deficiency of oleic acid uh, in the, in the, being made in the liver, either de novo or sent it through the diet. So we fed these animals with diets that were rich in, in oleic acid, like the large diets, but they were not able to correct. So we decided to uh, create a transgenic mouse model where we could express a cDNA of the human SCD5. So we wanted to humanize this study. So we would express the SCD5 from the human in the livers of the global knockout mice to see whether that would cause some changes. So as, as shown here, uh, we have both the human SCD5 and the mouse SCD3. Now we know that the human SCD5 makes mainly oleic acid. That is C18-1. Uh, whereas the, the mouse uh, SCD3 makes a 16 one. So we have both uh, oleic acid and palimetoleic acid. And we wanted to see what effects these two MUFAs, they are related, whether they have similar effects. And what we found is that they actually they don't. And, and as, as you, are, you can see here, when we put in the, SCD, the human SCD5 that makes oleic acid, we are able to recover the triglycerides in the liver, whereas with the SCD3, we could not. Okay, and then when we looked at uh, the genes, uh, the lipogenic genes, particularly when we did the female mice, they were sort of recovered to a certain extent. The, ex the expression was induced when, it, when the livers were gaining uh, oleic acid from this transgene mouse. And you can see the SREBPs here are also recovering when the oleic acid is, is inside inside the liver, made de novo through that CD. The 16.1 uh, N7 did not uh, rescue the SRIBP. So the SRIBPs were down, and, and all the genes that are targeted by SRIBP, we found out, we did lots and lots of two PCRs, were all down. So were the genes of uh, CHRIBP, which is the other one that it regulates uh, some of these lipogenic genes in response to high glucose or high fructose levels. Now, we also did discover very quickly that when the SCD1 was being expressed, or the SCD5 was being expressed in the liver, the animals gained weight again, as, as shown over here. Okay, and we could actually show that the fat pad, fat pads were also uh, sizes were, were increased, and this, this happened mainly uh, in the female mice. The, the, the male mice were a little bit resistant. Now, one interesting thing that was also noticed is that although the de novo lipogenesis was repressed or dramatically reduced in the liver, we discovered that in the global knockouts, the, the de novo lipogenesis in the white adipose tissue of these mice was very high up there. And, and in fact, when we looked at the, the SCD5s, so the ones that have the transgene, SCD5 transgene, and then we looked at the de novo lipogenesis in the white adipose tissue, that was now reduced. And we had already monitored the movement of uh, oleic acid from the liver to the adipose tissue. And, and so we, we discovered that the, 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 the de novo synthesized oleate from the liver was actually repressing de novo lipogenesis in the adipose tissue. It was also repressing fatty acid oxidation in the adipose tissue. So we came up with this model then. Uh, we think that uh, the S, the, the, in, the response, in response to a high carbohydrate diet, so we are, we are talking about in the context of the, the high carbohydrate diet now, that uh, you, you synthesize oleate uh, de novo and in response to uh, even other lipogenic stimuli. So not only high sucrose diet, you can also increase the de novo lipogenesis in response to microbiomes. Uh, you, of course, a high fat diet. And a high fat diet, mainly the one that contains saturated fat, is gonna enhance uh, uh, oleate synthesis. That this oleate travels uh, through, through the plasma, goes to the liver, and then will, will actually, uh, we, 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 it will de, de reduce the de novo lipogenesis in fatty acid oxidation, and then the fat mass will, will increase. So this is oleate 
in high levels will increase fat mass in the adipose tissue. And then also the 16.1 and 7, we found out, would travel, and Gohan had already shown this, would travel from the adipose tissue, from, let's say, through uh, lipolysis, and then it will have activities uh, back uh, in the liver. So we have these two morphers doing uh, different things uh, metabolically and also showing a, a, co a crosstalk between the liver and the, white, the, the adipose tissue. So, so that was the global, and, and, and then we said, okay, because the global, there are always so many problems with the global knockouts. You are taking the, the gene out of all the tissues. So we wanted to figure out which tissue was really responsible in protecting these mice against these high-fat diets and high carbohydrate diets. And that's where we started doing tissue-specific knockouts. And, uh, and I'm not gonna go into the details. We talked about, we talked about the, the skin uh, this morning. We knocked out SCD1 from the liver, from the adipose tissue, from the skin, from the muscle, from the brain, and we did even double knockouts where we knocked out both in the liver and the, uh, and the adipose tissue. So you can imagine how many mice we had. There's a time we had more than 1,000 mice uh, in, in our facility. So, so we wanted to put these, these various mice now on this high carbohydrate, low fat diet. So this diet is very high in sucrose, of course, you have, you have the, you know, the glucose and fructose, but very low in fat. So in, you, in, a, in a way, you have deficiency uh, of oleic acid in this diet. And what, it, what we found out is that when the liver-specific knockout mice are put on a high-fat diet, so this is a high-fat diet, whether saturated fat or a large, uh, large diet that has oleic acid, the animals are not protected against the high-fat diet induced weight gain. They were only protected against the high-carbohydrate diet induced weight gain. And, and if you know, most of the, the, the fat that we get from excess carbohydrate is coming from the liver. And when you, you, when you ingest the, the, the high carbohydrate, the excess glucose can be uh, stored as glycogen, and then some of it is converted into, into fat and then the fat is transported out of the liver to go to the adipose tissue uh, for storage. So we found out that the animals with the liver-specific knockout were protected against uh, the high carbohydrate diet induced weight gain, and they were also protected against uh, liver steatosis. We did, it, we did uh, experiments using radioactive water, and we showed that although they were on a high carbohydrate diet, which is lipogenic, the de novo lipogenesis was dramatically reduced, as shown here. Okay, so there is a deficiency of oleic acid. The de novo lipogenesis is reduced, and most of the uh, lipogenic genes, like uh, fatty acid synthase, uh, acetyl carboxyl, the uh, elongases, are uh, all down. Uh, and then, when we take the high carbohydrate diet and supplement it with triolene. That is the triglyceride, which is mainly, uh, which has uh, oleic acid. Then we can recover the de novo lipogenesis. Uh, we also showed under, in the same experiment that when in the, in the liver specific knockouts, the CHR EBP and the SR EBPs are also down in the liver. Initially, we had showed that in, in the global knockout, but now in the liver specific, these transcription factors are down regulated. So you can now begin to, to wonder whether, you know, some of those uh, pathways that we saw that work through SREBP. Now, even the SREBP is already down, and of course, this is in the context uh, of uh, a high uh, uh, carbohydrate diet. So you are not going to turn on uh, those pathways. So maybe we, if we look at the rhythm, uh, rhythmic, uh, circadian rhythms uh, in these mice, we may be figuring out what happens to uh, SREBP. Now, one other thing that we, we discovered is that in the liver-specific uh, knockout mice, uh, a number of genes that are involved in ER stress, because I told you this enzyme resides in the ER. So, so, so the ER stress genes or ER stress was enhanced. So those genes were increased. 
And in addition to the ER uh, stress genes, genes for inflammation, the TNF alpha, for instance, we are, we, are, we are also increased. So here we have a situation. We have tweaked out SCD1. We have reduced the levels of oleic acid. But there, are, there, there, is, there, there is a synthesis of mainly, so the saturated fat, whatever is it, the saturated fat is present in the ER or in the liver is not being desaturated. So, so you induce liver ER stress and you also turn on inflammation. So that, that was kind of uh, puzzling. And, and actually, there was some indication of liver damage under those conditions. So we are basically switching uh, the, the, the ratio between the saturated and the monounsaturated fatty acids. So we wanted to do a little bit of some mechanistic work uh, just to figure out what, what it is that is responsible for, for turning on these uh, inflammatory genes or ER stress genes. And I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, this, this work basically showed us that uh, when we knock out SCD1 they, and then we feed the animals a high sucrose diet, there's mTOR activation. We heard about mTOR this morning. There's mTOR activation. There's also enhanced PGC1 alpha expression. So all of these transcription, uh, these, these molecules already you have heard about uh, in, lipid, in lipid metabolism. So we have, we have a model here, and we can, we can, I can show you that some of the genes that are involved in ER stress are actually downregulated when you add uh, oleate to the diet. So we, we think that a reduction in, in, in oleate will turn on, on this, uh, this uh, mTOR, and it will turn on uh, uh, PGC1 alpha, and then I will show you later on that you can turn on other uh, molecules that uh, act as heptokines. So, so why don't we have this uh, inflammation uh, in the liver? We also went ahead and tried to look at glucose homeostasis. So, so we, we always say that glucose intolerance, insulin resistance, is actually associated with inflammation. Now, what we found out in this particular mouse model is that the animals initially, although they are on a high carbohydrate diet, they are consuming the glucose and the fructose, uh, mainly glucose and fructose, they still become hypoglycemic. So their fasting glucose levels are reduced, as shown here in the green. And then when we perform the uh, glucose uh, tolerance tests, you can see, again, there is what would be similar to increased uh, uh, insulin sensitivity, just like we saw in the global knockout mouse. So this would tell us that there is some kind of decoupling between uh, inflammation and insulin resistance in this situation, in, in, in presence of this high carbohydrate diet. There is also a decoupling in the insulin signaling through mTOR, because mTOR activation would lead into uh, SIABP uh, activation and translocation. So, so that one also does not seem to be, to be happening. We have, we have, so there is, there is a point somewhere, as you move from activated mTOR to the activation of SIABP, that seems to require oleic acid. So, so we, we, we became even more interested in, in this uh, mouse model, particularly liver specific. So these animals are consuming high levels of glucose. And, and yet, they are hypoglycemic. And there's this increased insulin. So, so where is the glucose going? And it's, it's not being converted into fat. By the way, the other thing that I didn't tell you is that the, the glucose is not being stored into glycogen. So the glycogen synthesis is also inhibited. So glycogen synthesis is inhibited, fatty acid synthesis is inhibited. There is that blockage. But the glucose is coming into the liver. Question is, where is it going? And, and uh, when we, we, talk, we, they, we talked about the mTOR, maybe, it was maybe the glucose now is being converted into other macromolecules. So we decided to perform one quick uh, uh, experiment using this uh, PET, that is uh, uh, Pistron Emission uh, Tomography uh, Technique, to try and give, give us some uh, idea uh, using this uh, radioactive dioxide uh, glucose, where this glucose was going, because the animals were, confirmed, were consuming it. 
And then we discovered uh, in this experiment, and we had the experts that would interpret this, and I think this technique is widely used in cancer, uh, cancer uh, uh, research, and also cancer treatment, actually. We discovered that uh, there was a lot of, there was enhanced uptake of the glucose in the various tissues, uh, in, in the brain, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the liver itself. So the glucose was going into the liver, but it wasn't being converted into or stored as glycogen or converted into fat. So it was good, good going in, as, as you can see these, these, these arrows here. Uh, it was going into the spleen, and we also found out it was also going into the white adipose tissue and the brown adipose tissue, and also in the heart. So, so there was uh, this concept was how is this glucose being uh, taken up by these tissues? And we found using this inhibitor for uh, glucose transporter one, that in the tissues that uh, use glucose transporter one, when you put in the inhibitor, that glucose uptake is, is inhibited. But it wasn't inhibited in the, uh, in the brown adipose tissue or the white adipose tissue. Now, in addition to those observations, we also discovered, using some uh, proteomics, that the liver, under these conditions, uh, was producing some heptokines. So maybe under stress conditions, ER stress conditions, several heptokines were being uh, produced, secreted into the plasma. And one of those uh, heptokines is uh, FGF21. And, and you have heard about FGF21 for many years now, and its role in insulin signaling. Now, the other uh, uh, heptokine is uh, insulin growth factor binding protein one, was also secreted in the plasma. We could measure these initially using the, you know, the two PCR for the RNA, but we could also use the ELISA and show that these heptokines, and there are probably more heptokines that are being uh, secreted in the plasma. Uh, just like uh, Mitch uh, did uh, his uh, uh, discovery of those uh, uh, depokines. Uh, so the liver is acting as, as a, a, an endocrine organ here uh, under these dietary conditions. So, so we also found out that glucose transporter one, uh, the, the glucose transporter that enhances basal glucose uptake is upregulated. Now, when we, when we put the oleic acid back into the diet, or we supplement the high carbohydrate diet with, with oleic acid, then we can restore the glucose levels as shown here. So we have initially hypoglycemic, but we put oleate back in, and then when we feed it with tristyrene. So, so tristyrene, we, we, can, we can have a diet that is rich in saturated fat, and we give these animals uh, this, this tristyrene, which is mainly saturated, and they consume it. And when we look at the expression of the genes that I've been telling you about, they are still high or they are still low. Okay? So, so this whole effect is specific for 18.1, which is oleic acid. Now, oleic acid, as you know, is very abundant in our diets. But it may be the de novo synthesized oleic acid is, is sort of signaling slightly differently from that of the... Uh, of the diet. Now, so one other thing that I wanted to show you, to share with you, is that we saw enhanced glucose uptake in the white adipose tissue. You have to remember, I haven't, we haven't done anything with the SCD in the, in the adipose tissue, both brown and white. But we discovered that uh, there was enhanced glucose uptake, and there was also an increase in glucose transporter 4, which is, which is the one that, that is sensitive to insulin. So as, as you can sh see here, the levels of glucose transport are in the LOKOs, as we call them, the, the liver-specific knockouts. The messenger RNA is increased, both in the white adipose tissue and uh, in the brown adipose tissue. So we thought this was interesting. So what, what was it that is really turning on this glucose transporter for in the white adipose tissue? Now, the other uh, 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 molecule that we looked at in, in, the, in the white adipose tissue is adiponectin. And, and we found out that uh, the messenger RNA levels of adiponectin were uh, increased in the white adipose tissue, as shown here. And we also showed that adiponectin was increased in the plasma, plasma levels. 
So, so there was this uh, induction of these heptokines from the liver, but then affecting some of these adipokines that are usually made by, uh, by the white adipose tissue or the brown adipose tissue. So, so, so what we, we think is happening here is there is a, some kind of crosstalk through axis. So, so the, the mTOR, uh, the PGS1 alpha, the SRBP1, uh, I mean the FGF21, are all being induced. And this, so the, F, uh, the, the FGF21 is under mTOR, uh, PGS1 alpha uh, induction. So you have the ER stress, you have the inflammation here. And, and if you start thinking about these other conditions that are produced in the liver in response to inflammation, we are, we are beginning to detect some of those genes uh, involved in NASH. So, so here is uh, FGF21, we think, gets into the plasma and then it signals to the adipose tissue or even the brown adipose tissue. This is now being confirmed because we already generated a double knockouts of SCD1 and the PGC1 alpha uh, or SCD1 and the adiponectin. So we are, we are gonna figure out whether it is the, the FGF21 adiponectin axis that is causing this crosstalk between the liver and the, and the white adipose tissue. So, so basically, that is the, what uh, we think is, is really happening, and I just wanted to uh, indicate that there is this SCD1 is probably acting as a metabolic switch uh, between high levels of oleate and the low levels of oleate. So, so, so the, the high levels of oleate uh, as I indicated before, will in, induce increased uh, 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 lipogenic gene expression and will increase adiposity. But then there's this uh, uh, situation where we have the ratio of the saturated to the more than saturated being, being affected, and that will uh, sort of lead to maybe the changes in some of the genes uh, of inflammation. There's this saturated fat component in the ER that causes ER stress and also inflammation. And then when the levels of oleate are added on, so you sort of relieve that, that, that inflammation and ER, and then you correct the defect. So the double, the, what, I, what we think is that uh, uh, as, as we consume our diets, like the diets that I, I, I showed you, on a daily basis, and depending on where you are, you may be in Turkey, you may be in Asia, you may be in Latin America, or you may be in the West. Uh, you have uh, levels of high carbohydrate diets, uh, high fat diets, and you are going, uh, as I showed you, this enzyme is, or this gene is under the regulation of so many of these, uh, these factors present in the diet. You are gonna have high, very high levels of expression, very low levels of expression, and you are gonna get to these fluctuations. And I think when you have very high levels of SCD, uh, you, that will lead to increase the fat storage. Uh, you know, insulin resistance will come in, and this is in response to a lot of these uh, uh, factors in the diet. And then when you have these factors that uh, repress, then you are gonna enhance uh, fat burning, uh, and you know, the puffers in particular. But as you, as you know, you are not gonna have a, a, absolutely no oleate. There's gonna be some oleate in there. And so, so it is a question of balancing to get to uh, some kind of homeostasis. So this is what I would, I would uh, advise to, to happen, that uh, when you, depending on whether you are in the Mediterranean uh, area with the olive oils, whether you are in Africa, whether you are in Asia, whether you are in America, and, and you have these diets that have fluctuation in this particular fatty acid, which we think is really signaling to cause some of these uh, phenotypes that I've just described to you, you are gonna have uh, some issues. So, so if we take it in moderation, you may have no, no problem, but, but uh, over, over nutrition, as you know, it's gonna cause, uh, cause problems. So I would like to end up by uh, uh, just showing you uh, a group, the, most, well, the recent, most recent group, and there are others that, uh, you know, this work has been ongoing for more than, uh, uh, 25 years, and and most of the work that uh, you know the SRIBP and the MTOR, I mean on the FGF21 and the MTOR, 
was done by Hamed here, who is now uh, an ass assistant professor in, in Saudi Arabia. And I think Ahmed is, is here. He heard about this symposium and he came here. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, investigators. Some of them have left the lab and their assistant professors are, uh, elsewhere. Some of them have, have, have resorted to teaching. And one thing you have to notice in here is that this is a very diverse group. So when I set up my laboratory, I wanted to have a diverse group so that you could have experiences being shared from all continents. And, and to sort of to promote uh, uh, equity, uh, inclusion, and diversity in, uh, in, in, in research and in, in science. And as, as you heard at the beginning, I have also uh, decided to take some of this research that I've just described to you, to try and translate it to people in, in developing countries that may not even have access to the, to the papers that we are publishing. We publish this work in, in JBC or in, in PNS or in science and all that, but, uh, but people need to share some of the, ex the research experiences or in the basic science uh, uh, research. So uh, the work that I have shared with the people in, in Uganda has led to uh, uh, the, the setting up of this Rezamu uh, uh, Center for Community Health Initiatives. Uh, particularly in Uganda and East Africa, we want to try this model there. And basically talking to people about ways of using uh, nutritional interventions, lifestyle uh, to prevent. So, so because they don't have access to medications that are very expensive, we think um, a number of these non-communicable diseases that I, I told you about at the beginning are preventable. So you prevent and you, 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 you detect, if you detect some of these uh, uh, lipids uh, being accumulating in your system, you start to change your diets, uh, you change your lifestyle. And this has actually led to some good responses from those individuals. So this, uh, this center has a website that is shown here at the bottom. You can go and look at it and you are also welcome to come and, and join us in our effort to try and improve human health through translation of the basic science research that we are doing. So I, I really appreciate the, the invitation to come and talk here. And I really like to spread what we do in the laboratories to people uh, globally, if possible. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk and an inspirational ending. So we have time for a couple of questions. I see one hand there already. So James, that was a wonderful talk as, as always. Um, so I had actually two questions if I might. Um, first is, uh, I have to ask what the increased DNL and increased GLUT4 in the adipose tissues, have you had a chance to look for Barbara Kahn's uh, PAFA, PAFAs or PAFAs? Um, the, and uh, the second question is, I realize that, that SCD1 really leads to a mixed message in the liver because on the one hand you're activating mTOR which is a, an, an insulin on signal but you're also activating PGC1 yeah. which is an insulin off signal. Absolutely. And so I'm wondering if there's PGC1 resistance, what happens to fatty acid oxidation and ketone production? Yeah, so in the liver specific, the, the fatty acid oxidation was not dramatically increased, but in the global knockout it was. Right? And uh, the, the other thing that uh, we think uh, may be happening is that uh, in, the, in the liver, when you knock out a CD, it is, the, it is actually the levels of oleic acid that are causing all these various uh, defects. It depends, depends on what, whether it is too low or it is too high. And as I indicated to you, some of these rescues are more uh, obvious in female mice that actually tend to have increased expression of the SCD. They, they, they have more oleate being produced in the liver than the male mice. So, so it is just uh, levels of, uh, of oleic acid that I think are important in the signaling. Now, we haven't really looked at what Barbara Kahn has, has done, but if you look at the structures of the fatty acids that she has, maybe uh, some of them have uh, the saturated fat uh, uh, version, but some of them may also have the MUFAs or the monounsaturated fat. 
So I, I was actually going to check with her to see what, what are the, the, the ones that are very, you know, causing insulin uh, sensitivity. We have another question in the front row. Yeah. Um, Gyokano Jan. Yeah. Jim, thank you uh, very much. It's, it's, it's very nice. And I admire your patience uh, to solve this puzzle. Uh, just to add to that, I mean, I'm also puzzled with the source of uh, the novel lipogenesis and yes. its products. Yeah. For example, 16, 1, and 7, that is part of hepatic lipogenesis. Yeah. It doesn't suppress uh, or have a negative feedback on hepatic lipogenesis, but when it is the product of adipocyte de novo lipogenesis, yeah. it can suppress hepatic uh, de novo lipogenesis. So what's the difference between uh, 16, 1, and 7 produced yeah, from that is, liver uh, versus That product? is a very good question. So as I indicated before, so de novo synthesized the oleate is probably signaling differently from, let's say, uh, 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 dietary uh, oleate or even palmitoleate coming from another tissue getting into the liver. And it depends on uh, where it will get to the site of regulation. So, so the de novo synthesized oleate, for instance, is right there with, with all the other, the other enzymes and then the transcription factors that are, that, in, that are involved. So we want to figure out how does oleate affect SREBP? And how does it affect the CHREBP? Because these transcription factors are down. It is not like we have shown this just over the years, we cannot recover uh, SREBP1C unless we add oleic acid. Yeah. So, okay. Let's uh, thank James again. So I'll briefly introduce our next and the last speaker of the session, um, who's Erica Pierce from Johns Hopkins. So I was privileged actually to work to, together in Max Planck Institute for Immunobiology and Epigenetics in Freiburg for almost three years that we've overlapped, where she was recruited as a director, uh, which sadly Germany has lost her to Johns Hopkins. But um, I was, I still clearly remember the day she came to present her work, where I was really struck by the spectacular findings that bridges the immunology with metabolism, where um, she was showing that the metabolic shift in T cells is responsible for the cells to remember their identity. And with that teaser, I just leave the stage to Erika to hear more about this exciting research. Thank you. Well, first let me say thank you, Tiche, for that um, uh, introduction. It's nice to reconnect with you and to, and to be here. And of course, thank you, Gokhan, for this uh, invitation. It's my first time um, in Istanbul, first time in Turkey. Um, my grandmother was actually born in Turkey, and she left when she was very young. Um, so it's you know really you know great to be in this uh, part of the world and for my first visit here. Um, okay, so today I'm going to speak about. Um, regulated changes in lipid metabolism that impact T-cell function. So my lab is really interested in how uh, engagement of metabolic pathways influences cell function. That's for the most part in the immune system. Quite often we study that in T-cells, but we actually have a, a lot of work in the lab focusing on macrophages. But sometimes we also work on a slime mold called dictostelium, and Beth Kelly in my lab, who's here with me, is the one who pioneered that project. So if anybody wants to care about slime molds, you can you know, talk to Beth afterwards. Um, so, uh, for those of you who don't work on um, immunology or, or T cells in particular, I'm always really aware of the fact that immunologists can put people to sleep really quickly because we could start, you know, saying cell types and molecules and cytokines. So I like to make it as simple and as easy as possible. So today I'm going to talk about CD8 T cells, and all you need to know is that a naive T cell. That's the one that recognizes foreign antigen in the context of MHC molecules. That they will become activated and they will become effector T cells. And in a dish, that takes about three days in the body, maybe a little bit longer. You know, T cell responses peak at about a week. But um, the the bottom line is is that these cells here are the ones that are really important for controlling 
um, intracellular pathogens and cancers, and they can make effector molecules and cytokines that can, you know, even orchestrate immune responses and inflammation. So we're, we're interested in these cells because, of course, they're important for um, human health, but they also undergo an amazing metabolic change. I mean, you can see the picture, right? The cell grows, the blast gets really big, and then they proliferate like crazy and make all this stuff. So, um, you know, what's known about metabolism and um, T cell uh, signaling, this is just a, a, a review from Will, Will Bayless's lab, an image that we sort of uh, modified. Um, so I would argue that a lot more is known about polar metabolites. We can, you know, think and read a lot of papers about how things like glucose or maybe, you know, amino acids are going into cells and how that supports function. And I would say that a lot less is probably known about how lipids are doing that, just probably less in terms of, of the literature. But um, when I think back to activating a T cell or what happens downstream of T cell receptor, um, you can't forget about these molecules called PIPs. I certainly forgot about them until we got into this project. You know, I remember my beginning immunology. But of course, these PIPs are important for, for lots of um, cell signaling. And uh, just to remember that um, these PIPs will be, will be generated downstream of TCR co-stimulation growth factor, this sort of immune synapse and this strong t signal in the T cell. And what's important is that PIP2, I'm going to talk a lot about that today, that's generated, um, and I'll say this again and again just to, to make sure it's clear, that can be cleaved by phospholipase C to these downstream mediators, DAG and IP3. They're important because they're the ones that are going to actually modulate the effector response and help get the right effector program for the gene expression going in these cells. So those second messengers are critical. So um, as I said, lipids, you know, how they contribute to PIPs, you know, if they contribute to PIPs, or just what's going on with them in those early times of T cell activation, really wasn't a lot studied. So with that, um, I'll introduce just two women um, who uh, were in my lab. One, Joy Edward Six, she came to my lab about uh, five years ago. She's now in Cambridge, and she had real expertise in lipidomics. That was her, her uh, sort of bag, and then um, had never worked really with, you know, mice or immunology at all. And then Petya Pastelova is a hemato-oncologist who worked at the University of Freiburg, and she wanted to do a postdoc in my lab. So these two women got together, and it was one of those really great collaborations. There was nothing forced. They just sort of fell in with one another, and it's their project that I'm going to tell you about today. So uh, to, keep it, to keep it simple, um, start just talking about isolating mouse CD8 T cells from the spleen, activate them in a dish. You can use anti-CD3 you know, against the T cell receptor, cytokines. A couple days later, you make all these effector cells. You can extract and you can analyze the lipids. Um, and these data are several years old when we first uh, used these old methods here, but we could detect for this study more than 300 species from 18 subclasses. And one of the first things that Joy did was quantile normalize those lipids. Because remember, I just showed you that naive cell gets really big. And then if we just look at changes in lipids, it's like, wow, you're just measuring all this stuff because you have a big cell. But we can normalize for that. Um, and then with the idea of looking at lipids that still change, thinking that they might be important or have some kind of impact on the activation of the signaling in those cells. So when the data was looked in that way, what was really striking is that phosphoinositides, which I'll now call PIs, um, were clearly elevated in these cells. Um, and that um, actually, when you actually look at the peak areas, looks something like this. And to be um, very precise about it, there are 11 PI species that were specifically increased in effector T cells that are not present at all in a naive T cell. Um, if you look on the right here, this is uh, PI 384. I'll explain a little bit more about what that means in a moment. But this is the predominant PI that's um, in these T cells. It's certainly the predominant PI in mammalian cells. And just to get used to looking, I won't show any more of these you know, peak areas. It's way too much to look at. To simplify the data, when you see this increase in color here, this is unstimulated or stimulated cells, you can see this increase in saturation that's just going to be represented as orange. And of course, that's a decrease in the number of double bonds. But um, you don't need to worry about that. Just you know, more color there means more, more saturation. So what is PI? This is what uh, PI384 um, um, looks like. I think when I turn my head, my voice gives out. So I'll just keep it facing this way. Um, OK, so, so PIs, they all have an inositol head group. And that's what's phosphorylated to generate PIP. Right? And one thing that I find really fascinating, that there are 19 kinases and 29 phosphatases that modulate that phosphorylation of the head group. 
I'm not going to talk about really any of that today. I just think that's super cool and must be really important about how that's determining, that position is determining protein binding. So these PIs all have um, glycerol phosphate backbones, but they also have these fatty acyl chains. Um, and I think these have really been largely ignored in people who study these molecules. Um, and as I told you, uh, the dominant uh, PI mammalian cells is this PI384. And what that means, the, the number 38 is the sum of these acyl chains, and the four just denotes the number of double bonds. And this is what I will refer to as unsaturated. And the PIs that I'm gonna talk about that have zero, one, or maybe two double bonds, they're gonna be saturated. Of course, it's just more saturated or more unsaturated, but we'll just for, for you know, ease of explaining. And one of the things that I'd like to just mention early on here, so you can just keep this in the back of your mind, one of the things that we know that changes um, when, as these double bonds are introduced is the shape of these acyl chains. So something that's saturated is gonna be really straight, and something that has a lot of these double bonds is gonna start to kink. And um, this is gonna have bearing on what I'm gonna tell you about what these PI molecules are actually doing. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, PI can be phosphorylated to, to PIP, and then to PIP2, and to PIP3. I'm not gonna be talking about position of the, of the head group here, but when we look in the, on, uh, the, the naive or the unstimulated T cells in comparison to the stimulated ones, and we now focus in on PIP2 and PIP3, you can see there's an increase in acyl chain uh, composition of that saturation of those acyl chains, both for PIP2, PIP3, but it only results in the accumulation of the PIP2 pool, right? So this activation is leading to an increase in uh, the pool of PIP2, and that increase is all, those acyl chains are all saturated. So that was, so everything I showed you at that point was in vitro, and if any of you do work on immune cells, you'll say, well, what about in vivo? Because you're just showing these in vitro derived cells, so we can also look in vivo, and I'll just show you what some data look like. So if we take a mouse model, this one is where we give it a tumor, and we can isolate the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. These would be the activated CD8 T cells from the tumor in comparison to the cells in the spleen. We can see that significant increase in H-cell chain saturation because those cells are activated. We can also take these from people, um, healthy donors versus people that are um, acutely infected with Epstein-Barr virus, figuring that they have a lot of activated CD8 T cells in their PBMCs, and we can see that significant increase. And the, what I'm gonna get to in the end, the bottom line is gonna be that these saturated PIs are gonna correlate with better functioning, better surviving, and, and more productive T cells. And we also know that that would correlate with response to checkpoint blockade. So if we give immune checkpoint inhibitors to mice or to humans, we all hope for a better outcome and a better immune response. Um, and very clearly, when we do that in mouse um, here, you can see the significant increase in the PI from the CD8 T cells that are in the tumors, or even patients with melanoma after one treatment with checkpoint blockade, there's a significant increase in these saturated PIs in their CD8 T cells from their blood. And we actually know a year later that that actually correlates with response to therapy. But um, now I wanna get back more to mechanism and why these PIs are important. So we could ask the question, you know, is that de novo PI synthesis important for T cell function, right? And this is what de novo PI synthesis looks like here. You can imagine you need a glycerol phosphate, you need fatty acids, you need inositol. Um, they come together, an enzyme called c diff here is critical to make this PI. Um, and uh, cells uh, can also remodel their um, acyl chains with their PIs. Um, and that, that's shown here through this LPI to, to more, uh, more polyunsaturated, like this PI384. So we could just say, let's inhibit PI synthesis by inhibiting c diff and assess T cell function. Um, this inhibitor of, of c diff is called um, anastomycin, and same idea, just activate those mouse T cells, last 24 hours, with or without the inhibitor, and then look at the saturation levels of the PI. And you can see here that it specifically decreases the saturation level of the PI that, that's present. Um, and when you look here at PIP2, um, in your control cells, which are activated, they're making all this saturated PIP2, but in the presence of c dip all that saturated PIP2 generation stops. Importantly, though, they have plenty of unsaturated PIP2. There's plenty of 38-4 in these cells. 
And it's really going to be the distinct function of those two PI pools, those pit pools, um, that I'm going to, going to get at. Okay, so the next two data slides that I'm going to show you, you do not need to sweat the details here. Um, I'll just, just give it to you. One, I'm going to show you just the inhibitor, but I can tell you if we target this enzyme genetically using CRISPR, we see the same thing. So when we um, give this inhibitor and we block that de novo PI synthesis and the accumulation of those saturated PIP2, we see a decrease in survival, proliferation function, right? Messes up our T cells. They don't, they don't like it. There's lots of things I could do to mess up T cells, especially when you give them an inhibitor. So a gain of function in this setting could, could be more exciting. And to do that, we took advantage of, of PI from a soy plant. Because as I told you, mammalian PIs are all unsaturated. So we can't give back mammalian saturated PI to these cells, but we can give them um, saturated uh, soy PI. That's what it looks like when you look at the saturation level. And basically, when these cells are activated in the presence of the c dipped inhibitor, you significantly decrease acial chain saturation. You now give them the soy PI, you can increase that level of saturation in your PI, and you can significantly augment the level of interferon gamma, just as a functional readout for these T cells. So we can partially restore that. So we're pleased to see this, you know, uh, kind of modest, but nonetheless significant gain of function. And what these data really told us is that that's probably needed, this PI, for fully differentiated effector T cells for their fitness and function. So then, um, of course, these PIs, when we first think about them, or when I first learned about them, it's all at T cell activation. Not so much thinking about it in the fully differentiated effector, but in the naive T cell. Remember I showed you downstream of TCR, costim, and cytokine, you get this cleavage of PIP2 to downstream mediators, right? So we thought, well, what happens early after T cell activation? Do these cells need to make these PIPs de novo? Um, so the first thing we did is just look at what the PIs look like in the first six hours after T cell activation. Um, and that's just shown here, um, largely polyunsaturated. There really is no increase in saturation. And even though the PIP2 increases, it's not of the saturated type. It's polyunsaturated. And then um, to try to see if, if blocking C-dipped activity in these cells would somehow abrogate or you know, impede T cell activation. We use a, just showing the CRISPR approach here. And what we do now is take these cells and we can target C-dipped, CRISPR that out, or we can CRISPR out ZAP70. ZAP70 we know is really critical for T cell activation. Without that, you're not gonna get an activated T cell. So then we can compare, right? Does a C-dip knockout look more like a ZAP70 knockout? And what I'm gonna show you here are just activation markers. Or does it look more like a control cell? And um, it's probably easier just to look at the bar chart here. And when you get rid of C-dipped, it looks much more like a control than it does a ZAP70. So they appear to be getting activated just fine. Um, and then we could also try to do like a gain of function with them, these earlier like cells, and, and give them the soy PI. And when you expose the naive T cells in the early time of activation to the soy PI, they really take it up. So you really can make all of their PI saturated. But when you activate them, this really doesn't do anything to their level of activation markers or their function. So what these data tell us is that saturated PI is dispensable for naive T cell activation. And that would probably fit with the kinetics, right? Because they're not making it at this early time point. And what I'll show you later is that all that saturated PI is being made 48 to 72 hours after activation. OK, so just summing up what I said. De novo synthesis of the saturated PI is required for fully differentiated effector cells for their fitness and function. And it's the hydrolysis of the polyunsaturated PIPs that are, of course, sitting in the membrane at that time of T cell activation as a consequence of that strong signal and immune synapse. That's sufficient for naive T cell activation and early after T cell stimulation. So when we got these data, we realized, hey, these are two distinct pools of PIP2. And maybe not two distinct pools of PIP2 in the way people had traditionally thought about it, but there's certainly a pool that's saturated and then another pool that's unsaturated. Um, and when we looked back at the literature, this idea of distinct PIP pools was, was you know, discussed a lot 15, 20 years ago. Um, and from this review here, you can read, how can a, how can a single lipid species, this be PIP2, regulate multiple physiological processes in a cell, apparently with spatial resolution, right? Because these PIP, PIP molecules do a lot to enact programs within cells. 
And in an attempt to solve this enigma, it's been widely hypothesized that spatially confined PIP2 pools exist in the plasma membrane. And from what I could glean from reading the, uh, the literature, it seems that most of these experiments were done with approaches like fixed cells and PIP2 antibodies, um, using pH domains fused to GFP, and then they could look at PIP2 concentrations in, in the cell, or FRAP in photobleaching and measuring PIP2 diffusion. And with these methods, um, there was never like a lot of evidence that this was actually occurring, these distinct pools of PIP2. Um, but I think because we were coming at it from a completely different approach, just looking at acyl chain saturation, there's an argument to be made that these are distinct pools. I'm not gonna show you that they're residing in distinct places, but, but if you just you know, keep, keep that in mind. Um, so the first thing that we then thought, you know, important to answer, you know, why would saturated PIP2 be specifically required to sustain late effector signaling but why don't the naive T cells need it? You know, what's this about? Um, and of course, this is the schematic here. Again, PIP2 cleave to IP3 and DAG, important for the downstream cascades which drive effector expression. And this PIP2 is continuously hydrolyzed by phospholipase C, and that's needed to maintain that cascade. But one of the things that we thought about was, could it be that that phospholipase C activity wanes late after T cell receptor stimulation? And for anybody who's worked on CD8 T cells, which of course I'm showing you here, once they become activated and they engage that program and they go, um, and then you use something like an MHC tetramer to stain the TCR, you can see that the staining sort of begins to fall off. Whether they internalize it, start to express less, there's a highly proliferating population, and they're not expressing that same level. So one might imagine that that immune synapse that was there during the triggering of the T cell isn't maintained you know, days later. But those effector cells definitely need to maintain PIP2 signals because they really need DAG and IP3 to continue to drive effector um, expression. So again, now think about the folding of those chains. What we're going to think about now is that the, the saturated PIs are going to sit closely in the membrane and that when they are um, unsaturated, those chains are going to kink and push perhaps the substrate further apart in the, in the plasma membrane. So with that in the back of our mind, first thing we could do then was just um, do a Western blot, right? Lots of people have done Western blots looking at phospholipase C activation, but we were looking late in comparison that look people that actually studied T cell receptor signaling. That's all done like in the first 5, 15 minutes, an hour. This is days later. So we looked at 24 hours after activation where you have that you know, population of proliferating cells and 72 hours later. And what was really clear is that phospholipase C activity, at least by phosphorylation, decreases. But yet, none of the downstream signaling from the, um, the kinase pathway is decreased. That's maintained. So we're like, OK, maybe phospholipase C is the, the trigger from the TCR is not maintained. But the downstream consequences of that are DAG and IP3, because we're still you know, getting the downstream program. So then we could say, all right, now we can go back to using that inhibitor C-dip and, and, and look at phospholipase C activity. So now we block de novo PI synthesis. What does that do to uh, uh, phospholipase C? Really absolutely nothing, right? The level of phosphorylation is the same, and we put in an enzyme activity assay, exactly the same. But however, downstream DAG is now decreased, right? So what that was suggesting to us is the possibility that the enzyme, while it's still working, maybe it's not as efficient in accessing its substrate anymore. And if you look at the downstream pathway, you can see when you block de novo synthesis, the uh, phosphorylation of ERK and everything drops. Um, interestingly, um, I'm just showing the, this blot for AKT here because, of course, uh, PI3 kinase also uses PIP2 as its substrate to make PIP3, which will drive AKT signaling. And from these data here, it would appear that PI3 kinase does not care at all if the PIP2 is saturated or unsaturated. This is something specific about phospholipase C. So there may be access to substrate. Um, you know, we're, we're not sure, but um, that's a really clear result that we have. So one of the next questions we could ask were, you know, what are the concentrations of PI and PIP2 in specific cellular compartments? Because people had thought about that compart compartment specific thing before, and we wondered, well, maybe we'll see all the saturated PIP2 in one specific spot and not anywhere else. And um, 
So what we could do is fractionate the cells in all these different compartments and then run lipidomics in those distinct fractions. And you can see that PI comes up in all these different fractions. Um, but really, the enrichment of the saturated, even though what we do see is strong enrichment in these higher order domains, lipid rafts, these, we'll just call them higher order domains, um, it's not like that's the only place that the saturated PIP2 is showing up, right? It's, it seems to be equally there as a percentage in all those compartments, just really enriched in these higher order domains. So then we could ask a direct question, right? And really what we want to get at, what is the efficiency of the phospholipase C recruitment to these distinct PIP2 pools? And uh, to do this experiment, we collaborated with um, Hannes Meib, and uh, this is a paper where he published this technique. And what he and Joy did was uh, take these uh, beads and coat them in lipid masks. And in particular, these, these green beads here with this fluorophore have a uh, saturated PIP, a PI4P, um, and the blue beads here have a polyunsaturated PI4P, polyunsaturated PIP. And then um, what you need to do is you need to add PIP5 kinase, because that's the enzyme that will turn the PIP to PIP2. And then an RFP phospholipase C with a pH domain. So then we could look at how that phospholipase C is going to, the, to, these, uh, to its substrate, PIP2, on these beads. Um, and from this assay, you can't really determine is it the conversion of the uh, PIP to PIP2 that's happening faster, or the recruitment, or both. But needless to say, there's a much faster kinetic with the uh, phospholipase C appearing um, when the uh, PIP is uh, saturated. So we'll interpret that to mean that the PLC recruitment to the saturated PIP2 is much more efficient than to the polyunsaturated counterparts. Um, and now, just as I come to the, to, to the end, to the last two pieces of data here, um, uh, we could ask the question, you know, what metabolic events um, are driving that saturated PI synthesis? Um, I'm not going to show you all the details with this, but um, what I think is really clear with the timing here is that this saturated PI synthesis doesn't occur until 48 to 72 hours after T cell activation, um, and that's shown here. You don't even see them appearing until later. And for those of you who do think about T cells and their function and how they work in settings like tumors and things, right, those are the exact cells. It's that timing where you want the highly functional T cell, right? Um, not, not back at the naive, right? These are the cells that are going to be moving into these other sites. So when we look at what substrate um, actually uh, contributes to this, I'll show you in a moment, it's, it's glucose. And the, the production of these saturated PIs exactly mirrors the incorporation and uptake of glucose, and this is, of course, lactate export um, in these cells. Um, then what we could do is we could actually feed them heavy-label glucose, and these data I'm just showing to you what happens um, with, like a, with a six-hour label incorporation after they are been activated for, for 48 hours. And one of the things that's striking is that the de novo synthesis now of these saturated PIs in PIP2 as well occurs much faster than their polyunsaturated uh, counterparts. So there's a real um, you know, preference for that. And I should say that this, this need for glucose in vitro is absolutely unequivocal. If you drop down glucose concentrations, they drop down saturated PI and then they become less activated. So we think that will have some bearing in vivo, but of course things could, could change, and maybe T cells could use other diverse substrates to make these in vivo. We have no evidence of that in vitro, though. Um, so to sum up what I've showed you here, um, we now can say that acyl chain saturation um, defines these two distinct PIP2 pools that are required, one for early activation and one for late effector cell signaling. So what the naive T cells actually do is use this interconversion, and they use the polyunsaturated PIP2 that's sitting in the membrane. And we imagine, because it has those kinked acyl chains, perhaps it's uh, more diffuse. Um, we don't have direct evidence of that, but I think that's very reasonable when you, when you read the literature and people who do, who do work on that. We know for sure that after uh, T cell activation and this immune synapse, it's a very strong signal. And when this happens, you get a lot of active phospholipase C, right? Like we could say that maybe like all of it becomes phosphorylated, very active, and because you have such a high concentration of that enzyme activity, we think it's fine for them to be able to use these polyunsaturated PIPs that may be scattered throughout that domain. 
And this works to generate um, DAG and IP3 for downstream activation. Um, what we think happens later um, is that we, we then know that T cells uh, actually need to make these PIs de novo, and they make them all saturated, and maybe this is so they can be more tightly ordered in a domain, because what these cells 48, 72 hours later ha don't have is, is that really strong signal coming in anymore. They're sort of off onto their effector program, they're dividing, but yet they need to maintain um, IP3 and DAC to maintain um, activation. So we think that they then make these um, PIPs uh, de novo, make these more efficient uh, molecules to generate the, the downstream uh, mediators. And obviously if you influence anything in this pathway by blocking glucose or, or um, c dipped activity, you'll really abrogate um, effector cell function. Um, this paper just came out about six weeks ago. And just to tell you, we're heading in this direction because now when we moved to Hopkins, we got new instrumentation and derived some new methods. And now we can d detect more than 600 lipids from 23 subclasses in these T cells. Um, and we see significant enrichment in certain classes. I'm not gonna bother to tell you what they are because we have no idea what any of it means yet. But hopefully the next couple of years, that's what we'll be able to focus on, getting more on what these functional changes, whether it's structural or other changes, uh, but there's definite increases in some lipids um, and you know, without that increase in others. And I think I acknowledged uh, Pecha and Joy, who did the work. These are the people who are in my lab now. Everybody works together. They all have a hand in, in these things together. Uh, these are the people who worked on this project who have since uh, moved on. And uh, thanks to collaborators, both that were in Freiburg and now at Hopkins, uh, where we're located. Thank you. Thank you for this incredibly mechanistic talk and also this last bit of teaser for what is to expect in the next coming years. Any questions for Erika? One hand over there. Thanks a lot for this very nice uh, presentation. I was wondering whether what you show here is specific for cytotoxic T cells or whether T helper cells or even maybe B cells yeah. may have a similar thing? Yeah, great question. Um, and it's something that I, I actually would really like to look at, at T cells and autoimmunity, like certain CD4 subsets that are you know, con, you know, active too much. And we've done nothing in any of those, so I can't answer you, but we, we really need to. <laughs> um, yeah, so we just have not looked. Maybe a very small addition. Uh, how about the effector function? I mean, is it really the effector T cells? Or how about the regulatory T cells? Or yeah, regulatory re cells? really about the effector T cells. Okay. Really, yeah, yep, absolutely. I, I, but again, it, it could have a role in many other, uh, you know, T cell types and other uh, types. I, I imagine probably cells that are fast proliferating may have a mechanism uh, like this. Um, and but maybe a very little thing. So the last thing: is it only glucose dependent, or maybe other uh, things can also? I can, I can tell you, in, in vitro, in a dish, it is 100% glucose dependent. In vivo, that could change, right? If we actually looked in vivo, it could be that T cells could use diverse substrates or maybe even use um, interconversion, uh, which they do not do in this, in this setting. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. So next question, someone in the second row, then to the first row, please. So there, the second row, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so while listening to your talk, I really appreciated how you, you know, simplify things down and really try to give the general idea. So I, I really appreciate that. Thanks, thanks. My question was about, um, so these PIP2 molecules and how uh, the acyl groups get saturated, it, it affects how the PCL interacts with them. I was wondering what you think the you know, biochemical reasons behind that would be. Why would um, the saturations in the acyl groups affect how they are, you know, metabolized by the PCL and, you know, affect things downstream? Yeah, I think, I think, and again, um, I would have no data uh, to, to prove this, but I think it has to do with the, the shape of the acyl chains, with the, because they're more saturated, and if you read other people who've worked on lipids for, for a long time, not, not like me, um, that, that kinking you know, can really uh, you know, 
maybe, maybe change access to substrate. Maybe it creates a domain that phospholipase C you know, prefers to be in. Um, those are some of the things that we've, we've thought about, um, and that's what we're linking, but I don't have a concrete answer on that. Thank you. First Matt. Great, so, so Erica, that was interesting as always. So to what extent do you think it's the, because of course arachidonic acid is essential, right? So you can't make it. Is it just that the T cells are blasting so fast that they have to keep up with PIs to maintain PI levels? They yeah. now switch to this, and maybe you could test it by giving excess yeah. just arachidonic acid. We did that. That's great. Yeah, and we gave we gave excess like linoleic acid, um, and I think we also did arachidonic acid because we because we also had that that question, and that does uh, nothing to influence the fact that they're making these de novo uh, PIs. One, but again, these are the things that we're doing in a dish. I could imagine that in vivo, when they're in a sort of different setting, there could be some interplay between, between those. Um, but yeah. Uh, thanks for the great talk. So I'm here. <laughs> oh, what? So I have two questions. Where is it? So oh, oh, hi, OK. <laughs> so fatty acids, they are desaturated and elongated before they are incorporated into more complex lipids, such as phosphoenoacetides. So do you see? similar pattern of saturation in other classes of phospholipids, such as phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylethanolamine yep, uh, in question. activated T cells. So do you see the same pattern of saturation in all of them? No, we do not. That's so they a are great the more saturated ones, they are selectively incorporated into PIPs, you say? Uh, well, in, in this study, in the way we've looked at it here, I can tell you that when we, when we look at the, the untargeted and we look to see, like, in, in like even in this latest thing, we were doing this just last week, looking to see if these other classes that increase, mm -hmm. do we see any significance in, in, in saturation? We have not seen that so far, like in, in um, PEs, and I'm pretty sure PCs. Okay, so, so. it's selective, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Uh, my other question is, do you see any difference in elongation activity? So did you look at fatty acid compositions greater than 38 carbons? Hmm. I can't, I can't answer that. We may have that data in the set. Uh, it, it may be there, but nothing is coming to mind of looking at, um, I'd, I'd have to check into that. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Sorry, James. Oh, yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Very nice talk. So my question is, uh, whether the, the cells are confined to arachidonic acid or you can also have PUFAs like a DHA. And the other question is, what is the origin of this uh, arachidonate? Is it, is it being made through the... Through the PI, through yes, the yes. So the, for, for the de novo PI synthesis to occur, we know that it depends on SCD. So they, that desaturase has to, has to be active. So we'd imagine that the fatty acids are being uh, made, made for, for that. Um, and that is depending on, on glucose in this uh, setting. Okay. In the absence of any further questions, we can conclude. But I'd like to also thank Erika for perfectly staying on time. So that allowed <laughs> more discussion in the end. And thanks a lot again for the talk. That brings us to the end of the scientific part of this meeting, but I would invite um, Yokan Ojam on stage for concluding remarks. Well, first of all, I must congratulate you for staying here until the end. And uh, of course, uh, a, a meeting really is nothing without its speakers. So I, I really would like to express my deepest gratitude to the speakers. And I know we took you away from your families and work. So please, when you go back, first extend our apologies to your family and then express our gratitude for allowing us to enjoy your company uh, for a brief period of time. Of course, this means a lot, for, especially for our uh, young generation and inspiring scientists. And uh, I am most grateful for you to be here. And I will repeat, uh, as I did in the beginning, the contributions of the Sabri Care Foundation and all of its, its members 
to uh, constantly support us in our good days and bad days, and uh, the family and the community uh, for their assistance. And I want to thank uh, Sondan Hoca uh, for really hosting us in this most wonderful uh, venue. So, uh, Sondan Hoca, may I present you a small gift uh, from Harvard? You know, since uh, Harvard thinks so highly of itself, and uh, when a tree falls in its yard, uh, there is a mourning process for it. Since we are so uh, conscious about the, the environment and all of our actions, and once such a tree falls, it is transported to the uh, Harvard Museum, in which it's processed into small pieces to produce souvenirs so that Harvard can sell them back to their faculty. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, with this small explanation, I would like to give you a bowl uh, made from a tree, fallen tree uh, at Harvard Yard. May I? to have you here on our campus. I hope you enjoy your stay and the symposium was great. And when I had the time, I become part of the symposium. Again, let's make this a you know, tradition. Your symposium here at Cadiras. Thank you. So uh, now I'd like to invite all of the speakers, please, to have a, a, a photo together. All the speakers, please. <laughs>